engagement. I would like to end by saying that there is that hope, and I want to thank Joyce Williams, who is here, for a strong partnership and lead in this whole uh, network. I also want to thank Audrey Biney for very hard work, Etonam, <laughs> Sarah Anku, Dr. Abena Entry, who is also here, and all these pioneers who have supported in various ways the Women of Africa Network. I want to wish you a successful forum. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luis Yao Apo. You left your phone, please. Another round of applause for you. Thank you very much. We'll now invite. Yes, choir. Let's welcome her with a round of applause. Let's keep doing that. Thank you. Thank you and welcome everybody. And I will stand on the protocol um, observed by Luis. And so it's really a great privilege and honor to really be part and welcome you to the maiden edition of specifically discussing trade uh, to empower women of our esteemed speakers and panelists, as well as our pitch contest that we'll host this afternoon. Thank you. Invaders. AFCCA. We are going to make the AFCCA a success as a regional integration and regional trade, then women must take part and take an active role. The contributions of women in the economies of our continent is well documented. You just do a quick Google search and you will see where women in Africa stand in terms of trade. However, one very important factor is worth stating that the trade potential may not be realized if we are not actively engaged, specifically looking at the non-tariff barriers that are heavily on activities of women in trade and women-owned enterprises. The part of the AFCC, AFCCA is part of the African, agenda, uh, African Union's Agenda 2063, which is for an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa. So integrated means that women need to be able to be part of the formal sector as well as the informal sector. The AFCC agreement and their company on trading goods, the protocols on trading services, trade uh, protocols on rules of origin and on the free movement of people offer a variety of economic opportunities to women entrepreneurs. So the protocol on rules of origin, for instance, permit access to cheaper raw materials and then value addition in line with the preferential trade regime of AFTA. This will heavily increase the profit margin of women in AFCCA. We take, for example, the North, um, North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and research has shown that under NAFTA, Wages for women increase, as well as the profit margin for women entrepreneurship. So we are looking forward to seeing the same for women under the AFCCA. The stakeholders within the AFCCA ecosystem, as we are deliberating and even as different opportunities are being discussed, need to understand that there is a 42 billion financing gap when it comes to uh, women businesses across the continent, specifically 15.6 billion 
in women in agro-business. And we need to close those gaps, and we need to close them very quickly. So this conference, we look to be one of the avenues to discuss and implement solutions to fix the access to finance challenges, to be able to work together with all women on the continent, from the women on the street, uh, those in the villages, wherever any woman is on the continent, we want to be able to have that wide reach and be able to reach women across the continent. We're looking forward to mobilizing resources and we don't intend to stay in Accra. We, uh, the three women that I've had the opportunity to work with so far, Etanam and Audrey, have shown me that they don't mind getting their hands dirty. So we are ready and we are looking forward to mobilizing all the women and going beyond the cities and going I remember uh, January 1st, 2020, we got in a car to go to Asankagwa. And we were stuck at Takwa in the middle of the night and we couldn't even find a hotel because it's the new year. And not one complained and she's looking forward to going again. And these are the kind of women that we are looking forward to working with to really reach all the women on the continent because until all of us are successful, none of us are successful. So please make yourself at home, enjoy the event. This is for you, this is for me. And so let's come together and put all our baskets, our eggs in one basket. You know, they say don't do that, but in this case, let's do that so we can protect it. We are vested in it and let's grow Africa together. Thank you all and enjoy the program. Until all of us are successful, none of us is successful. And another round of applause for Joyce. Joyce Williams Esquire is the Executive Director of the Women of Africa Network, the host of this conference today. Thank you so much, Joyce. She's very resilient and focused, and I'm glad to be working with you. So we'll go straight into it, and we'll invite our speakers one after the other to tell us uh, why it's important for us to look at the entrepreneurial capacity of women in Africa. Our very first speaker got here before 8 a.m. Tells you how passionate she is about women and trade. She is a health economist and a human rights advocate. She's a lecturer at the University of Professional Studies, Accra. I'm the managing director for the Africa Environmental Sanitation Consult. She has worked with uh, women and juveniles for over a decade. She has won both local and international awards in this state, including the Commonwealth Points of Lights Award by Her Majesty the Queen of England and a recognition by the French President Emmanuel Macron. She is most passionate about development challenges in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker, Dr. Abna Enchi. A round of applause for her, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. More to the ladies. And then welcome to our guests, the men. It's a privilege to be given the, this platform to share my views on the AFTA and also the involvement of women. This morning, I wish to speak to you on an aspect of this special area of trade in, in the light of the Africa continental free trade area with a rather self-serving interest in entrepreneurship training. Congratulations to the African Union on this ambitious, long overdue, but absolutely necessary policy. As I teach eager young students the entrepreneurship course, I see the desire of many to transition almost immediately from theory to practice without a care in the world. I noticed that for many of the young females, 
that I teach, they often have existing enterprises that either support them financially or have been nursing ideas for years, even at young ages. For the latter, I often marvel at the repository of en enthusiasm expressed through interactions on the desire to start out their enterprises, sometimes often, sometimes beyond the shores of Ghana. And I ask myself, why not? The world is theirs to conquer. But the road to entrepreneurship in Ghana and the rest of Africa is not without its own challenges. In spite of women's decades-long participation in trade and the crucial contribution made to Af the African um, economy, they face numerous obstacles which limit them to commercial exchanges at the individual, household, and community levels. Scaling up from these levels have been challenging for the most part. In my opinion, if the after, which covers a market, an estimated market uh, of 1.2 billion people with a gross domestic product of $2.5 trillion has any chance to succeed in the long term, it would be imperative to talk about the volumes of trade interactions and partnerships riding on the backs of not only multinationals, but the women entrepreneurs who form an appreciable number on the continent. While we, speak to consolidate, while we seek to consolidate the efforts of all Africans in this revolution, um, revolution policy implementation, I wish to say that much has, been, much has to be done in educating women on their participation. It is a cliche that entrepreneurship, particularly trading, does not require training, but due to the changed landscape, this cliche must be challenged. The after and its implementation seems quite high level for many, but successful implementation lies at the doorstep of households and individuals. The role of education generally promises to involve the active participation of the next generation in first the design of the services and goods which serve as the basis of the policy. Second, both formal and informal entrepreneurship training promises to promote better partners among enterprises on the continent. I would like us to juxtapose the projected pop population of the continent of 2.5 billion by 2050 and the GDP forecast of 16, 16 trillion dollars by 2060. What does this policy mean to the 36 state parties and the majority of women who reside in them? How are the women traders to know about the numerous protocols related to trade in goods, services, dispute settlement and others? How would they know about the standards required for their goods to be accepted for inclusion in this policy implementation? A lot of work has to be done. At the level of engaging women entrepreneurs in Ghana alone, there seems to be a lack of knowledge of the policy itself and a poor appreciation for the additional effort required for full participation. To many, even those who have heard about the policy, it seems as if it is something that's been done on one side whilst trading goes on on another side. With many women venturing into the spaces of working intellectually together among different countries, for instance, what does this mean for intellectual property rights? The fact that no specific provisions or protocols have been made for women under the AFTA, I believe, cannot be a deterrent to our participation. While the opportunities to leverage provisions in the agreement do not overtly exist for the benefits of women, there must be exposure of the available spaces for sustained uptake. For instance, the application of rules of origin under the agreement, pro agreement provisions promises to ensure that participant entrepreneurs use significant African content in their products so as to qualify as originating products with eligibility under the after preferential trade regime regarding raw materials and value addition. As I engage with young entrepreneurs, first in my lecture halls and second in other spaces of interaction, the realization that this formidable African revolution is happening on the blind side of a significant constituency, women and young people. And this is not lost on me, and I hope it won't be lost on all of us in our deliberations today. We must also understand that there is also opportunity under the after Article 4 of the Protocol in Trade and Services, which gives states the right to regulate in accordance with their national policy objectives. I believe 
With many opportunities being availed for women in diverse forms on the continent, member states may use this leeway to implement at the country level this, this policy with gender parity in mind. There is freedom to modify to suit the implementation in country. I wish to conclude that there should be deliberate effort to include women, and I mean women in different sectors and strata of society. In the entire value chain of implementation from policymakers, professionals in different fields, example lawyers, marketers, investment analysts, construction, IT professionals, those in academia, farmers, and others. This is critical to support a deliberate upgrade of their areas of specialization to meet the explosive demands of the after. There is additional need to undertake a value chain mapping exercise to congregate all such participants in charting the path to achieving the goal to greater benefit women on the continent. Finally, there is a need to place the discussion of the after in many little and not so little spaces for education, and I mean formal and informal for access, and this includes young female entrepreneur, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurship students in my lecture halls and those in other academic institutions to ensure that an appreciation of benefits is fully registered with the next generation. I want to say thank you and I wish, all, I wish us all best in our deliberations today. Thank you. There must be deliberate efforts at including women at all levels. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for Dr. Mrs. Abna Enchi. Our second speaker has over 15 years worth of experience from the telecommunications industry, having worked in consumer and business to business segments across Europe and Africa. With a track, a great track record in launching new products from concept to full commercial launch and also credited with successfully managing cross-functional teams to deliver an array of products and services. She has held various leadership roles in various global companies, including Bati Etel Nigeria Networks, British Telecoms Global Services, seconded to MTN, Virgin Media UK, News Optimum Limited UK, Carphone Warehouse Limited, and Saturn International Business Consulting Group. She's a chartered marketer and holds a master's in business administration from the University of Westminster, London, and a Bachelor of Science in Mass Communication from the University of Lagos in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, Tawa Bularin, Director of Vodafone Business and Wholesale, is our next speaker. A round of applause for her. She's taking off her face mask, so please let's do it for her as she comes. Yes, 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 yes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to Joyce for hosting us today. Um, I'm excited to be here today uh, to join the discussion that is aimed at projecting the African continental free trade area with a special focus on women entrepreneurs. So uh, at Vodafone, it's about how women entrepreneurs can leverage technology to create new opportunities. As an, organiz as an organization, we're particularly excited about this initiative for two key reasons. The first is that female entrepreneurs form 35% of the 10,000 SMEs we engage through our various activities across the country. Secondly, Vodafone is very passionate about diversity and inclusion. I think we all know this. And continues to drive gender equality in every aspect of our operations. Our priority is to prepare women entrepreneurs to compete on a global scale and to be a shining example of how to use digital tools and platforms to thrive in their businesses. Women participation in entrepreneurship globally has been proven to correlate better with economic performance. They've shown a more rounded understanding of relationship, stakeholder engagement, and risk controls. Women are proven to be innovative, innovative, up to the task, and full of stamina when given the opportunity. 
According to McKinsey, the female economy is the world's largest emerging market with the potential to add 12 trillion to global GDP by 2025. Investing in digital skills and entrepreneurship training for African women is investing in economic growth and social impact at the community, country, and continental level. Africa leads the world in terms of the women, of the number of women business owners. In fact, women in Africa are more likely than men to be entrepreneurs. According to MasterCard Index of Women Entrepreneurship, Ghana is producing more female entrepreneurs in, than any other country with 46% of businesses being owned by women. I think that deserves a round of applause. There's some challenges, especially in the digital space. According to UNESCO, despite the high rates of entrepreneurship across the continent, there are two challenges that still persist. The first, obviously, as everybody knows, is lack of financial investment. The second is lack of digital literacy, which impedes women entrepreneurs from fully reaping the benefits of the digital transformation on the way across Africa and in the world. At Vodafone Business, we've made a commitment to enable women entrepreneurs to gain the necessary resources and technology to overcome the challenges that confront them. And I'll list some of the projects that we've been working on and continue to work on. Partnership with UNDP is one of them. This also enables trained disadvantaged women engaged in trade and financial skills and inclusion. These are women engaged in all sorts of activities on smaller scales, but who are crucial to their households and their communities. We have so far been able to deliver benefits, benefits to 10,000 indirect beneficiaries whilst touching the lives of 1,250 households. This again is testament to the indirect contribution of women in empowering households and Ghana's overall economy. We have also trained over 200 macular market traders and business owners in key business management topics at Northford University College. The training is designed to empower participants with skills that will prepare them for the digital future and expose them to capital management and effective inventory management. Last year, our foundation, the Vodafone Foundation, executed a financial inclu inclusion project in Northern Ghana, training women in how to organize their financial portfolios to Vodafone cash platforms and to in integrate the same thing with their bank accounts. Previously, these women kept their monies in boxes. More recently, at Vodafone, we've taken a commitment a step further by partnering with Invest in Africa, another SME-focused organization to enhance the digital capabilities, capabilities and accelerate growth for small businesses. Some of the ICT solutions through this partnership include Red, Tra Tra Red Trader, which is a mobile application designed for traders to manage their inventory, to track and receive payments, and to monitor their sales. Another one is Your Business Online, which is designed for SMEs to increase their market reach through website presence, e-commerce integration, and social media marketing, amongst others. In a very short while, we'll be launching an exclusive campaign dedicated to women entrepreneurs in order to further build on our purpose and brand new position. Together we can. I promise being that Vodafone business stands by every woman, woman entrepreneur, sorry, every woman, uh, woman entrepreneur enabling her to embrace technology and to go her business. So I will conclude. Women will continue to act as the primary agent of change across the globe. The industrious nature is the bedrock of many homes social settings, and nations building. I wish to affirm a promise to continue to provide the needed technological solutions and support for women entrepreneurs, and I look forward to unveiling our Women in Business campaign very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you once again. And once again, Joyce, thank you for hosting us. Thank you so much, Director of from Business and Wholesale, Bullerin, Tawa Bullerin. I'm super excited about our next speaker because we only met yesterday and I think I'm very much in love with her because she's determined to inspire people internationally. She's focused on developing leaders who leave a mark on people, organizations, and the world. With 30 plus years of well-honed expertise in leadership, development, and business acumen, she is often described by her clients as a pragmatic strategist 
innovative problem solver, and a keen executive coach. Name the leadership challenge, whether it's helping empower women in rural African villages or helping young executives to enhance the overall leadership effectiveness. She is an innovative solution. Currently, she is the CEO of Infinity Global Connections. Her 23 years at the Coca-Cola Company were recognized by progressive promotions among the executive ranks. Today, she is credited with developing an entrepreneurial empowerment program for women in Monrovia, Liberia, that was included in the Coca-Cola Company 5x20 Global Program. Now, here's the catch. In 2016, she developed and launched the Woya Bra Program in Accra, Ghana. Woya Bra is an entrepreneur initiative that provides young women with sewing machines, sewing tools, fabric, startup funds, and a network of professional seamstresses to make washable sanitary parts. I'm particularly uh, interested in this because I have an NGO. We support young girls in public schools with sanitary towels. And just two weeks ago, we went to Dodo, a class of schools, supported over 2,000 girls who use newspapers as substitute for sanitary pads. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, Dr. Adrienne Johnson. A round of applause, please. Let's do it better for Dr. Adrienne Johnson. She's coming up. Thank you very much, slowly but surely. Good morning. Thank you, Joyce, for this wonderful invitation. My sisters and brothers, I greet you with the utmost love and respect. It is, truly feels good to be home. I am re reunited with my business partner and friend, Ellen Aduba. In fact, Ellen Aduba is a Ghanaian businesswoman and she's the wife of Seth Aduba um, that I will talk about a little later. She is like my daughter and when we travel throughout Africa together, I am Naomi and she is my Ruth. <laughs> Also today, I have my sponsors here with me from Zeta Phi Beta Sorority, um, and I'm grateful for them to be here. And so, and all over um, other wonderful friends that I've met through Ghana, I'm here to tell you nothing can separ separate me from the love of Ghana, not oceans or a pandemic. You see, I've found the place my spirit has been longing for all my life. When I was growing up a little girl in Prospect, Kentucky, and you'll hear the Southern dialect, this is the place I dreamed of. People who look like me, we are all the same. We want the same things. We want love, respect, productive work, and a better life for our children and families. Women of African descent are still the backbones of our family. We still have to make a way out of no way. We still have to stretch a dollar like it's rubber, but we make it work because that's how God created us. Beautiful, strong, passionate, resilient, and relentless. I often tell my coaching clients back in the States when they are faced with obstacles and challenges, the question is not who is going to allow us, but rather who is going to stop us. You see, you can't stop a motivated, creative, resourceful African woman. You do so at your own risk. And so I am honored to talk with you today about my love of Africa since my first trip to Durban, South Africa in 2001. I experienced the magical feeling of coming home. I immediately felt the love and kinship. These were my brothers and sisters and they treated me with love and warmth. We were immediately family. There is nothing more loving and comforting than African love. In fact, I created a program in South Africa for women entrepreneurs and my Zulu sisters, I still work with them today. But the most important thing that I discovered on my visit to Africa was that we are all the same. We are one. We all want the same things, love, life, health, and opportunities for our family. See, I knew deep in my spirit that this was where I belong. These were my people. I discovered that in spite of the pain of our shared history, that no ocean, 
no colonial rule, no political ideology, no foreign policy, no misinformation can separate us. We only separate ourselves. I've heard it said that I am African, not because I was born in Africa, but because Africa was born in me. The African-American historian John Henry Clark said it this way, Africa is the center of gravity. Our cultural and spiritual mother and father are beating heart no matter where we live on the face of the earth. Wherever I've traveled on the continent, whether it was Nairobi, Kenya, Monrovia, Liberia, Kigali, Rwanda, Freetown, Sierra Leone, or my current home away from home, Accra, Ghana. Whether I've been in five-star hotels or the most rural villages, I have felt the love. Most importantly, I have felt the love of African women. See, you see, African women are a force. They are more than 600 million women in Africa. African women are in charge of a majority of households. They are key food producers and represent more than 43% of the agricultural workforce. In Africa globally, it is clear that when women are able to exercise their rights to access education, skills, and jobs, there is a surge in prosperity, positive health outcomes, and greater freedom and well-being, not only of women, but the whole society. But let me be honest. I didn't travel thousands of miles just to be a tourist. I did what I always do. I followed Luke 12, chapter 48th verse, to whom much is given, much is required. I went out in the streets and met with people. I learned about the lives and their hardships. And in the midst of those revelations and conversations, I saw clearly how a Southern girl from Kentucky could connect with my sisters in Ghana. I set about using my skills, education, and training to make a difference. And as a result, here are three things that you could do to advance the cause of women in Ghana and to make a difference in the lives of families and communities. Number one, find your passion and you'll find your purpose. Passion is that thing that drives your spirit and your soul. It's that thing that you cannot do it. There, if you cannot do it, there will be an emptiness in your spirit. You have one passion and your job is to find it. Passion is not a plan, it's a feeling. It's that fire that ignites inside of us. My passion is helping women become entrepreneurs. My husband, attorney Joe Johnson and I, we're black philanthropists. And so in Monrovia, we started in Liberia, we met with Ellen's husband, Seth Aduba, who was the president of Coca-Cola in Liberia. And my husband and I paid for 30, we started with 30 women and put them in business selling Coca-Cola products. We thought they were gonna sell three to five cases a week. No, they sold 75 to 100 cases a week. They became micro distributors. If you give an African woman, or you give any woman of African descent an opportunity, she will take advantage of it. Uh, so find your passion and you'll find your purpose. Number two, perfect your product. If you believe your product or service can fulfill a true need, it's your moral obligation to sell it. But it must be the best. Sometimes things start small, it can grow into a massive success. Facebook, Apple, Microsoft all started small and grew exponentially because they met a need and they supplied that need with excellence. Sometimes the tendency is to speed a product to market, but sometimes it takes time to perfect a product. Resist the belief that I'm just a small business woman in Africa. How can I serve a global economy? The truth of the matter is that most of the new, innovative, creative, technological advances are coming from the African continent. Don't give up, don't give in, and persevere. Uh, just as we started with 30 women in, in Monrovia, Liberia, the Coca-Cola company came in over top, and we paid for 50, we paid for 100, my husband and I, Coca-Cola company came in, adopted the program, it became part of the Coca-Cola 5 by 20 program, and they paid for 3,500. So see, God wants you to start, just start, and he'll take it from there. But you must perfect your product. And the third and final thing you must do is promote your network. It's been said that your network is your net worth. In other words, you only are as good as your network. 
the people, the resources, the technologies, the associations, as I said, Zeta Phi Beta sorority, what would I do without them? Information are all part of your network. You should be growing your network every day. And as you know, 2019 was the year of the return. It's been 400 years since our people, our ancestors, were unceremoniously shipped around the world as human cargo. The year of the return wasn't just an empty ceremony. It had tremendous meaning for me. Wouldn't it be amazing, a magical, a powerful statement to the world if African Americans returned triumphant, successful doctors, lawyers, engineers, educators, business people? We will be saying that we may, you may move us, but you can never remove us. We are resilient and triumphant. The DNA of kings and queens run in our veins, and we will prevail. You see, Africa needs us, but we need Africa too. Our history and destiny are forever a part of this continent. Let's build a collective network such that the world has never seen, and let's combine American education, technology, resource to create powerful collaborations that change the world. So I want to encourage you to look everywhere for partner resources and collaboratives to accelerate innovation and product development. You see, there is more that connects us than divides us. And don't allow the world to keep us separated any longer. Our Woe Bra story, as you mentioned, we started in 2016. And Ellen and I, we started, and to date, we have over 200 women who make and sell reusable sanitary pads. And on Saturday, see, I think it's a shame to put women in business that aren't business women. So on Saturday, we're having a business review. And I fly in two and three times a year just to teach them marketing and sales that I learned at the Coca-Cola company, transferable skills. Also, financial management. I'm sitting beside a banker. I can't wait to finish talking to my banker friend. They need to have bank accounts and understand about cost analysis and risk analysis. So I'm teaching them on Saturday. And then guess what? In October 2022, our Zeta Phi Beta sorority is coming back to have a conference for Woji Bra women here in Ghana. In fact, the Zeta Phi Beta chapter women, they're here. Can y'all raise your hand for the Ghana Zeta Phi Beta? So in closing, I just want to say, everywhere I have gone on this continent, I have tried to live my passion and my purpose of empowering women. Whether it was women artisans in Durban, South Africa, Coca-Cola vendors in Monrovia, Liberia, or the Woyi Bra women of Ghana. I'm investing my power and greatness of Af in African women. I'm putting my time, I'm putting my money, I'm putting my effort into the greatest resource on this planet, African women. When you feed and invest in African women, the world eats. When you educate, love, and support African women, the continent is a better place. I believe in the greatness of African women. One of my childhood heroes was a track star, Olympian, Wilma Rudolph, and she said it this way, Never underestimate the power of dreams and the influence of the human spirit. You see, we are all the same in this notion. The potential for greatness lives within each of us. And the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence kicks in. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never have otherwise occurred. Unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance, which no woman could have dreamed would have come her way. Jeremiah 29, 11 says it best. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and to not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. My brothers and sisters, for the Woe Bra women and my African sisters, the question is not who will let us, the question is who will stop us. Thank you very much. It's really exciting listening to Dr. Adrian Johnson. Another round of applause. I love your jacket, by the way. It's interesting the way she pronounces the Woyebra, Woyebra. 
Thank you so much. My takeaway from what she says, find your passion and you will find your purpose. Perfect your product. Don't give up. Don't give in. Just start. Promote your network. And finally, you may move us, but you will not remove us. Thank you once again, Dr. Adrian Johnson. Our very last speaker will join us online. Uh, so we are, while we are getting ready for the director, Nixon Integrative Nutrition, uh, Madam Beatrice Pinwan Makoha, while we get ready for her, I'd like to uh, let you know that we have beautiful exhibitors just behind this wall. Uh, what I'm wearing is Wear Ghana. Is it beautiful? Very affordable, pure made in Ghana products. I mean, I'm passionate about made in Ghana products because we get to show up the value of the Ghana city so we don't have to import. So please, go there and grab this. We have a lot of uh, beautiful made in Ghana products. At the behind here, you find coconut, shea butter in coconut shells. Very, very, very innovative. You should get one and you should get all the products we have on sale here uh, on exhibition. So please, we'll be breaking for coffee uh, shortly while we get ready uh, for our very final speaker. If we don't have a speaker yet, I'd want to, we have a, okay. All right, so then let's welcome Madam Beatrice Pinwan Makoha. She's the director, Nixon Integrative Nutrition. A round of applause, please.
Oh, I think we lost her. A round of applause anyways. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Beatrice Pewang Makoha. Hopefully we get her during the panel discussion, which will be just after coffee break. We meant to go for coffee at 10.30, so we are just six minutes behind, so we are still within time. Uh, when we come back from the coffee break, we'll have a panel discussion. We are talking about entrepreneurship. We are talking about the challenges women face and also under the AFCFTA. Lots of questions I've asked people, ask me, is uh, what the FDA will say in terms of uh, um, regulations. So if I'm not a Ghanaian company and I want to do business under the AFCFTA, do I need different regulations? Madam Dillis, Mimi Darko, I'm sure we'll be looking at that, so we'll be very grateful. Uh, thankfully, we have the FDA boss here. And so that will be during the panel discussion. You don't want to miss out. Immediately after coffee break, we'll do that. But I want to invite the executives of the Women of Africa Network, uh, Joyce Williams and Audrey Biney here. We want to show appreciation to all our speakers and our panel members who will be joining us during and after the coffee break. A round of applause here coming. Just to show some appreciation for, yes. So we know that time is really precious and for all our very busy women who accepted our invitation to join us here this morning, we just want to show a bit of appreciation. Uh, they say diamonds are girls' best friend. We haven't gotten to diamonds yet, so we couldn't get you diamonds. But we did get you custom-made chocolate. We selected the flavors carefully and we hope that you enjoy them. And then, of course, we need to look pretty and shine. And shea butter is one of the uh, products made in Ghana that really works from head to toe. You can't go wrong with it. And this is nicely packaged in coconut shells. I've never seen it before. And so we have these uh, for our women. And so we'll invite Mrs. Mimi Dako to please come. And we'll invite Mr. Keith Clinton to help us um, giving out the gift. So, Ms. Mrs. Mimi Dako. And we do have a certificate because we want to remember this day. So, this is something for your wall in your office. That is our sister from the FDA, and she has been with us from the beginning. From the after secretariat, we have Mrs. Beatrice Chater. Please come up. And we'll be hearing from Mrs. Chater this afternoon after our coffee break as she walks us through what the secretariat has in store for women under the AFCTA, so thank you so much. And we have Professor Abna Enchi. Doctor. We need to use all the titles. We earned it. So, Dr. <laughs> Professor, Mrs. <laughs> Abner Enchi, please come up. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
no, they can't. And we have Mrs. Audrey Abeka from APSA Bank. I'm very excited to hear about what APSA is doing. Um, we got notes from Mrs. Um, Abeka and I was like, wow, that's very intense. So I hope you brought your notebooks because you have to take notes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And next, we have my sister, my mom, my friend, Dr. Johnson. And we have next, Right Reverend Mrs. Sapo. And Reverend Patricia just arrived from Canada. She hasn't even had the time to rest and she's with us. Thank you so much. With a new grandchild, congratulations. <laughs> and we have Miss Krobo Eduse, a very well seasoned entrepreneur. And I can't wait to hear about her experiences navigating um, eating tree. Yes. And next, we do have Mrs. Sarah Anku, my fellow lawyer. If you want to protect your rights, intellectual property, she's your go-to lady. I've been learning so much from her. Let's appreciate her. And we will also invite our sister from Vodafone, Ms. Tara Borarin. We had some mix up with the certificate, so we'll give her her bag. Thank you so much, and we look forward to the partnership with Waterphone. And I want to invite our two sisters from the Zeta. We want to appreciate you for your support, so please come up. We have some small bags for you. Very well dressed together, representing the palace of Zader. 
Um, can I please invite Mr. Biney up to help me for a few seconds? Mr. Biney is the gentleman coming up there. So, I also want to appreciate Etunam and Audrey. And Mr. Biney is also known as Audrey's husband. And I want to... I want him to help me appreciate um, Audrey and Etunam because working across different time zones, the number of times that they had to be up in the later stage because it's early in the US and the time differences, um, going over so many different things, phone calls, um, children, having uh, Mr. Biney had to step in for her while we captured all of her time but I do appreciate the work that both of them did and it made it so easy for us to be here today and to have this conference. So while they were not expected, I also made the certificates for them. So this is for Etonam. Um, please give her back. <laughs> you know, both of them are very busy professionals. Etonam, I'm sure if you, uh, turn on your TV, you've seen the face many times. And Audrey, a property developer, so really, really busy. And then I will invite Mr. Biney to help me with Audrey. So thank you all. I think it's time for coffee break, yes? Yes, okay. yes. I'm allowed to. Yes. So please, at the back, we have some refreshments. Uh, grab a piece, uh, cup of coffee, pastry? Yes. And then be back in 15 minutes and be ready for our panelists. I'll, I'll re really recommend go for coffee because you want to be awake for the panelists. <laughs> thank you all. Please join coffee. Remember to visit the stands behind us. Beautiful made in Ghana products. I see Vika Juice Plus. They make local juice really good. So they're available to exchange contacts for any occasion. They'll be there to support you. So please, let's buy made in Ghana. APSA as a banking group is APSA as a banking group is one that is committed to working with our clients and customers to bring their possibilities to life. We provide a full range of solutions from unsecured or unsecured lending facilities to so these are loans that we do not take collateral for and we do not take financials for up to 500,000 Ghana seeds. Beyond that as well, we have a solution for startups. You know, so if you are even just starting your business, we provide free banking services, we lighten the load, we provide also mentorship and training opportunities to help the startups also to grow. We have an objective. Our aim really is to see SMEs become transgenerational 
and also grow into multinational companies. We collaborate with various entities to provide funding and other solutions that can help change the narrative for MSMEs in the economy. So in, so in that quest, we also came across the MasterCard Foundation Young Africa Works Initiative, which resonated with our mission and our purpose. Hence, our setting out to partner with the MasterCard Foundation. And this partnership seeks, over the next five years, to provide $100 million worth of funding into SMEs. And we are targeting that we will impact 5,000 SMEs with our capacity building services. These 5,000 SMEs will in turn, based on the capacity building we provide them and the business development services that we provide them, will enable them to access bank funding, which will also allow them to expand their businesses and create a minimum of 10 jobs each. So 5,000 SMEs impacted over the five year period, each creating a minimum of 10 new jobs leads to a total of 50,000 jobs that will be created in this economy over the next five-year period. Micro, small and medium enterprises remain the bedrock of Ghana's economy, contributing significantly Hi, to love. My name is Nunya. Welcome to our employment for young people. Players in the sector, especially women, face challenges, including inadequate funding, and access to markets to scale their operations. In response to this, the MasterCard Foundation is partnering with APSA Ghana to build capacity of players in the sector and provide access to unsecured lending and market access to MSMEs in Ghana, especially those in the agricultural value chain and those owned and led by women and young people. The benefits to our SMEs is that you get world-class training that prepares you to compete with any SME on any continent across the globe. Beyond that as well is the exposure and the additional market that this opportunity provides for you. And as we grow along the journey, there are several other collaborations that we will be able to see to further support MSMEs. Our aim is to sector and create sustainable work opportunities for thousands of young Ghanaians over the next five years. My name is Florence Amahawo. My company's name is Flora Ama Enterprise. I go with my husband and wife, like we keep going on the backside of our
you recognize that a lot more needs to be done. It is our hope that this intervention will enable other players to come on board to support women and youth led businesses to scale and thrive. So the Absa Bank Ghana Mastercard Foundation collaboration is one that is geared towards changing the narrative for SMEs in Ghana. And the reason is that, yes, we will be providing you with funding to the tune of $100 million equivalent in CDs over the five-year period. But more importantly, to build sustainable SMEs, we'll be providing you with capacity building solutions we will also provide business development consultants who will work with you to build the structures that will allow you to scale your business. And the reason why we need you to scale your business is so that you can grow and take advantage of the Africa continental food trade area and also even compete with global competitors from all over the world and still show up strong. Our dream and our vision is to see Ghanaian SMEs grow sustainable businesses, businesses that are transgenerational and businesses that are multinational. At Absa Bank Ghana, we believe in you, so we bring your possibilities to life. That is Africanacity. Hi loves, my name is Nunya. Welcome to Afro King Saloon. Welcome to Nunya Natural's range of products. We have four wonderful regimen for you. We have products for locks. We have products for normal hair. We have products for uh, men. And then we have products for our little children. Now, starting with the locks. We have our repair shampoo, which does great cleansing. Now, it has honey and it repairs damaged and thirsty locks. We also have the Blossom Conditioner. Now, with experience, we have realized that most locks come thirsty, dry, and most locks that are come in colored break off and then it thins off at the tips. The conditioner helps you dry and thirsty locks give you the bright, moisturized lock retention that is needed. It is also wonderful for low porosity 4C hair type, meaning that it helps you retain as much as moisture that is needed. We also have, as part of the range, the Locks and Temple Balm. This does wonderful job. Now, we have realized that most locks have gaps in them, in that the locks are not full, is dry, is not attractive. The locks balm does a wonderful job, and it has a good smell. It is soft and has a minty feel. Now, we also have the hair splash. And this hair splash does a wonderful splash job and is good for all protective hairstyles, being it in braids, being it for locks, being it for you know any hair type of protective hairstyle. We also have the restore oil, and this has tea tree extract, it has a uh, castor oil, and the main um, objective is for hair growth. We want your hair to be fuller. We want your hair to be um, moisturized. We want a silky sheen. And these are original hair restore oil.
we also have as part of the range the Lux and Temple Balm. This does wonderful job. Now we have realized that most locks have gaps in them, in that the locks are not full, is dry, is not attractive. The Lux Balm does wonderful job, and it has a good smell. It is soft and has a minty feel. Now, we also have the hair splash. And this hair splash does a wonderful splash job and is good for all protective hairstyles, being it in braids, being it for locks, being it for, you know, any hair type of protective hairstyle. We also have the Restore Oil, and this has tea tree extract, it has a uh, castor oil, and the main um, objective is for hair growth. We want your hair to be fuller, we want your hair to be um, moisturized, we want a silky sheen, and these are original hair restore oil. B5's journey from its inception in 2002 till today, when it has become the leader in the steel manufacturing and import in all of West Africa, is not only unbelievably impressive for the world, but also a memorable one for Ghana. B5 Plus is successful, I think we are a passionate driven company. We believe in delivering the quality material at the doorstep with giving the best services possible. With the European awards that we have won, we are making Ghana stand stronger on the world map and we consider these awards as milestones to achieve the B5's vision to become the steel industry benchmark for the world. The small countries from where we used to import from our dear neighbors to other countries in West Africa, today we have become a net exporter to all these West African countries. B5 Steel is a global steel giant in the making with services in 15 countries and market leader in all of West Africa. We are this strong only because we are a home to passionate, driven, talented and hardworking persons. Our people have the grit and determination to conquer obstacles and bring about a revolution in the steel industry. We are strong because of our innovative approach. We are strong because of our values, our strong relationships and our strong people. We are B5 Plus Steel. B5 Plus, be strong. B5's journey from its inception in 2002 till today, when it has become the leader in the steel manufacturing and import in all of West Africa, is not only unbelievably impressive for the world, but also a memorable one for Ghana. B5 Plus is successful, I think we are a passionate driven company. We believe in delivering the quality material at the doorstep with giving the best services possible. With the European awards that we have won, we are making Ghana stand stronger on the world map and we consider these awards as milestones to achieve the B5's vision to become the steel industry benchmark for the world. The small countries from where we used to import from our dear neighbors to other countries in West Africa, today we have become a net exporter to all these West African countries. B5 Steel is a global steel giant in the making with services in 15 countries and market leader in all of West Africa. We are this strong only because we are a home to passionate, driven, talented and hardworking persons. Our people have the grit and determination to conquer obstacles and bring about a revolution in the steel industry. We are strong because of our innovative approach. We are strong because of our values, our strong relationships and our strong people. We... 13, 14. Oh, you did follow us.
Welcome back, ladies and a few gentlemen. Please settle down so we can kickstart the next round of the program. Thank you all very much. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Balfour Bempong Kwachi, Ajini Mwenene, Fantiakwa Akim Ebuakwa. I hope I didn't murder the name. Balfour Kojo Sasraku Okotobrija, Domena Sehene Fantiakwa Akim Ebuakwa, Achim Ebuakwa, and then Ochiami Owusu Biribi, Chief Linguist. Fantia Kwa Palace, Brego. You're welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for being part of our program today. So we are starting to go down. Just so you know, we still have products on sale at the back. So when you have some time, pass by. I see Afro Kings. They are very good with natural hair, so you would want to visit them, those who want to keep their hair natural, and get yourself hooked. Our next point is uh, we are having a panel discussion, and that will be spearheaded by Mrs. Audrey Bainu, the Deputy Executive Director of the Women of Africa Network. Please, let's welcome her so she can invite her panel to join her. We have five beautiful women who will be part of the discussion this morning. So let's welcome Mrs. Audrey Baini, Deputy Executive of the Women of Africa Network. I think I'm too tall for this mic. <laughs> Hope you all enjoyed your coffee break. It's good to see you back here and seated, thank you. Um, I think this is probably the most important session of the three-day conference. Thank you. By far the most important of the three-day conference is today because we're talking about women. And women are crucial to the success of the African continental free trade area and to the economy, really, of the continent. And when I talk about women, I'm not just talking about African women, I'm talking about women from the diaspora as well. So I'm going to be moderating this session. We have, Etanam said five, we actually have six um, esteemed speakers. They are um, experts in their field. We've had a lot of um, talk over the last two days, today and today, about the role that women actually play when it comes to the success of the African continental free trade area. We know that they play a significant role in trade. We've had mentioned already that 70% um, of the informal sector, um, so 70% of trade is in the informal sector, and we know the majority of that is women. Women, and we're talking about cross-border traders, we're talking about um, your small farmers, we're talking about um, entrepreneurs, SMEs, they play a crucial part. And when we look at agriculture, agriculture is um, really, it's key to the success of AFTA. We have in, over the continent, we have over 65% of arable land when we look across the whole world, it's actually in Africa. So we cannot afford to ignore the role that agriculture plays and also the role that women play. Women are um, responsible for 65% of the outputs of agriculture. That's hugely significant. And if we talk about the fact that um, agriculture is essential to the success of AFTA and the role that women play, then we cannot if, um, afford to ignore them. So the conversation of AFTA cannot take place unless we consider women. And in spite of the um, importance of women, we still manage to face um, challenges and we have obstacles which are not, um, what's the right word to use? We have an imbalance when it comes to gender and the kind of obstacles that women face. Some of these are to do with education, 
Um, a lot of them are to do with things like um, corruption, to do with issues that we have at the um, cross-border and so many other the areas. The, for the next hour and a half, we're going to tackle some of the issues that women um, face and how we actually handle them. We know that um, a lot of women in SMEs are actually in the informal trade and we need to move them to a more formalized type of trade to take full advantage of the AFTA. We know that the African continental free trade area means that we now have access to one single market of 1.2 billion population. We're aware of that. We've heard that repeated um, over and over again. We know there's a potential of 3.4 trillion US dollars when it comes to potential of, of AFTA. But are we, are we prepared? Because it's not automatic that women will benefit from AFTA. We need to be deliberate. We need to know where we're going to ensure that we take full advantage of the um, agreement that has come along. And so today we're going to have a discussion along those lines. And I esteem um, speakers have come from different fields. We're looking at an expert in agribusiness. We're looking at um, the finance aspects of things, which is always a challenge. We're looking at um, IPs, because we know that innovation also plays a key part when it comes to success of, of, of AFTA. We're also looking at standards, because there's one thing saying that we want to be able to trade, we want to increase, increase um, intra-African trade, but do we have products that meet the standard. Because if I can buy something of a better quality from elsewhere, why would I buy Made in Africa just because it's made in Africa? Maybe I'm patriotic enough to do that, but we need to meet the standards. And it's not to say that all our products are of a low standard, but we're going to address some of the issues that we face and, and issues that come up in regards to that. So much, without further ado, and you don't want to listen to me talking for the next hour and a half, which I could do. So I'm going to um, introduce our speakers. So I'll just give you a short bio of each of them. And as they come up on stage, um, as, I, as I mentioned them, please give them a huge round of applause. They deserve it. OK, so I'm going to start with um, Mrs. Brutus Chater, who is um, senior trade and expert. And she's based at the Secretariat. I'll just tell you a little bit about um, Beatrice Chater. She's an international trade lawyer. She's currently a senior expert in trade and services in the AFTA Secretariat based here in Accra. She's just moved over um, within the last month. She works on negotiations for the establishment of the AFTA. And prior to her position in the AUC, she ran her own corporate law firm in Freetown, Sierra Leone, providing legal services to local, regional, and international clients. She previously served as Director of Policy in the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Sierra Leone. And from 1995 to 2003, she was the Program Director for the Foundation for International Environmental Law and Development, based in London. So let's introduce to the stage Mrs. Beatrice Chater. A huge round of applause for her, please. Let's keep appreciating her, please, as she comes up on stage. Okay, so next on my list, I have Mrs. Delise Mimi Dauko. She is the CEO of the Food and Drugs Authority based here in Ghana. Um, by background with over 30 years of experience in food and medical products regulation. She was instrumental in the NIPAD and the MARH process that designated the FDA a regional center of regulatory excellence for clinical trials, drug registration, and pharmacovigilance. She also led the FDA through the rigorous evaluation of the WHO GBT to attain a maturity level three. She chairs the steering committee of the WHO African Vaccines Regulatory Forum, and she serves on several international and local advisory committees and bodies. She's won several awards, including the 2019 United Nations Interagency Task Force Award and the 2019 Ghana Business Standards Award for the Female Business Leader of the Year. She's a devout Christian, and she's married of two children. Let's please welcome Mrs. Delise Mimi Dalkin.
next on my list is the Right Reverend Patricia Supple. She's the president of the Chartered Institute of Bankers. So Right Reverend Mrs. Patricia Supple is the first female and the current president of the Chartered Institute of Ghana. So it's Chartered Institute of Bankers in Ghana in the 40 year history of the Institute. And she's a member of the board of directors of the Ghana Deposit Protection Corporation. She retired from Ecobank in 2018 as assistant vice president of Ecobank Ghana and regional head, corporate communications, Ecobank Foundation, Anglophone West African Ghana. She was also in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Gambia, and the Guinea. She has over 33 years of banking experience and 22 years in Ecobank in various roles and capacities. She initiated several activities and programs in Ecobank Ghana and the Ecobank Group in the area of customer service and other areas of the bank, positioning Ecobank Ghana as a customer amongst others. She has a book to her name, The Christian Woman, Secrets to Enjoying Your Marriage, and she's won several awards, including the Most Outstanding Professional Woman of the Year. This is in 2016 by the Business Executive Magazine under the Feminine Achievement Award. So let's please welcome <laughs> Reverend, Right Reverend Patricia Sapo. <laughs> so next on my list is Mrs. Sarah Anko. She's a legal practitioner, intellectual property consultant and advocate, and she's a lecturer at KNUST. She's a senior partner at Anku.Anku at Law in Ghana and Nigeria, and she's a and patent assist, sorry. She's a director and a founding president of IP Network Ghana, and she's the advisor and associate partner of the AFTA Policy Network and she's a former state attorney. Let's please welcome a big round of applause, Mrs. Sarah Anku. Okay, next on my list is Mrs. Audrey Abaka, my namesake. So um, she's the head of SMEs in AFSA Ghana and she has a rich experience in the financial services industry with over 16 years working relationship with Barclays Bank, now APSA, and she currently is the head of SME banking. Prior to this role, she served as the head of service excellence and was a member of the bank's country management team. She's the board chair of Rehoboth Foundation, which is a cutting edge leadership development organization. She's the commercial director and co-founder of the Institute of Business Transformation. And she's also the chairperson of the Women Network Forum, which is a diversity and inclusion initiative of APSA. Let's please welcome Mrs. Audrey APSA. Okay. So last but not least, let's please welcome Ms. Catherine Krobo Doucet. So Ms. Catherine Krobo Disse is the CEO of Eden Tree um, Limited. I'm sure many of us are aware of Eden Tree. Um, it's on many of our um, supermarket shelves and in our homes. So she's an entrepreneur and the founder and the managing director of Eden Tree Limited. Eden Tree is into the distribution of fresh herbs, fruits, and vegetables to supermarkets, hotels, and catering firms in Ghana. She's been in the agribusiness for over 24 years. She's nationally recognized as a strong promoter of women in business and has received and did receive the 2012 National Awards from the Chartered Institute of Marketing in Ghana for outstanding contribution towards nation building. Just to mention a few. In partnership with some stakeholders, she's created jobs for urban farmers, providing them with training and education to enable them earn income to support their families. She stands for doing the right thing always, and she applies all aspects of her life when it comes to this. She believes in honesty, hard work, and involving prayer in everything that she does. Let's please welcome <laughs> Miss Catherine Kovodusse. Okay, 
on that note, I'll, I'll join you and then we can start our discussion. Okay, so we've talked about the importance of agribusiness and um, we're going to speak to Catherine to start with. She's an expert in this field. Um, we mentioned before that she's, she's the CEO of Eden Free Limited. So we're going to ask her to please share your experience with us. What's the history behind um, Eden Tree, and why did you specifically go into agribusiness? Um, what started in it was, um, I had uh, my two children, they were very close in age. So I decided to come back home because childcare was uh, very expensive in the UK. So when I came home, I needed something to do. Um, I was in banking when I was in the UK. Pray. I actually agree with. I. I have a. The back. Tree. I prayed. Up and then, eating tree came up. Passion. Dr. John. Um, when I was in London, I had a garden that was that had nothing in it. And when I came to Ghana and I started eating tree, I discovered a hidden passion. I realized that I'm not into flowers, you know, but some people have passion for flowers. So my garden was atrocious in London. But the first day I nursed seeds, I couldn't sleep. I woke up very early just to check every day, just to monitor the germination of the seeds. And that's because the hidden passion was for food, was for growing food. So, uh, Lord and behold, so that was the beginning of eating tree. I just followed my passion. Uh, that I discovered, prayed about it, and there was one supermarket, only one in town then, this was 1997, um, which is Koala now, but then it was called Quatsons. And when I took my first tray of products there, the guy looked at me and said, what is this? And I said, oh, these are you know, herbs for cooking. He shrugged his shoulders and said, okay, I'll display these. If it sells, I, I'll pay you. If it doesn't sell, come and collect everything back. So we shook hands. I said, we have a deal. The next day I went, everything was gone. So then I began to ask questions. So who were those that were buying these products? And I was told it was the embassy because you know, everyone, they were waiting for it. Uh, in the UK, people cook with herbs a lot, fresh herbs, mm -hmm. not the dried stuff that's dead on the shelves. Um, so they were waiting for it. So funny enough, it all went. And that was a sign for me that, yes, this is where I should be. And that's how it is. I like that. Thank you. So passion. Um, the agribusiness, historically, was never really attractive. You, you thought of a particular type of person when you were looking at farming. But suddenly, it's become, not suddenly, I mean necessarily, it's become something that we all need to go into. If we have 66% um, of arable land in the world in Africa, and if this is the success of um, the economic sector, then it's something that we should all take an interest in. Um, what would you say were the main challenges that you faced when you started the business? Okay, the, uh, the challenges, I'll talk about three. Mm -hmm. One is financial, one is uh, personal, 
through the human resource, and then the last one is regulatory. When it comes to financial, financial, I'm not even going to go far back. I'm just going to talk about now. What is happening now? Um, I have investment come into Eden Tree, so we have in investors within Eden Tree. So here we are, the building, the facility and the machinery and everything is up, uh, worth about 8 million Ghana CDs. And then we have an overdraft of 200,000 CDs and uh, 200,000 CDs for import facility, making 400,000 CDs. So, and we've had this facility for four years. We have not de defaulted in paying, not once. So then I went back to the bank and said, okay, can you increase the import facility by 100,000, which is 300,000. And then they have a fixed deposit for 200,000. That is just there, that's locked up. And then the response that I got was that, oh, your turnover is the same as last year. So therefore, we cannot give you that 100,000 CDs increase. And I'm saying to myself, those who are making those decisions, are they aware that pandemic has hit the world? Are you expecting the same thing? I mean, I just don't get it. So I went back and I responded and told them that if our turnover is the same, then I think we've done very well because I We have, we are along the value chain. We need packaging materials. We need raw materials. We need all sorts of things. And some of these guys are not willing for us to withhold. So therefore, if I need this packaging material, and I tell you that GRA wants me to withhold, and then you tell me, no, I'm not doing it. So if uh, you are insisting, then go find your packaging material elsewhere. And trust me, we don't have many companies who are doing packaging materials, or we don't have, uh, for all the things that we do in the value chain, we don't have a lot of com companies doing them. So therefore, we have to deal with the supplier. He's not willing for me to withhold, okay? Now, I have priced my products according to the cost of my material. And then three years, four years down the line, an auditor from GRA will come. Okay, all these companies that you got your materials from, you did not withhold. So we are going to slap it on you. You are going to pay the withholding. And I've already done my costing. I've already done everything. So it means that I have not, uh, uh, you are taking away from, my profit, you're taking away from my margins. 
Not only that, so if I pay for another company's withholding taxes, it means that I have not withheld, so I don't have certificates to give to that company. So it means that company is not even going to get that. They are going to tax that company as well. So this is a double taxation. Meanwhile, you are telling us, SMEs, we are the what? We are the engine of growth. How can we grow? We are struggling with this. We are struggling with all the other regulatory. Everyone wants something, okay? I mean, seriously, energy is so expensive. Mm -hmm. How do we do it? These are the real challenges that we go through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you've hit the... Hello? I think you've... Can you hear me? No. Thank you very much for that. You've highlighted three main areas which are a challenge for many startups and SMEs, and we will address those with, with some of our panelists as well. In fact, let's go over to Audrey from the finance um, point of view, because the challenge that Catherine faced with borrowing is the same, is the challenge that many SMEs face at the moment. And if, especially if we're talking about moving to, if we're talking about value addition, if we're talking about expanding, if we're talking about um, collaborations with, with different groups so that we're bigger and we can compete on the continent, then we need to be able to access things like finance. F finance, I think, has been um, something that's clipped a lot of SMEs um, wanting to start the business. So the question really is, what are you at the bank doing to help startups? And what are the options that are open to them? Thank you very much, Audrey. And I really empathize your first question uh, because last year, you know, during the COVID season, uh, some sectors were heavily impacted. And that actually informed, you know, banks to revise some of their credit framework because I think the default rate was going up. But the good news is that uh, now the economy is picking up and some of the decisions that were taken, you know, have been relaxed. So currently, uh, I believe that if we should go back now, the story may be the, uh, different, but I empathize with, with your situation. Now, so uh, you asked if, you know, we have a support for these startups, yes. Last year, we launched a startup proposition because uh, we believe in these young and emerging entrepreneurs that are coming up and it is a known uh, reality that most new businesses do not grow beyond five years. So our focus on the startup uh, entrepreneurs is to help strengthen their businesses so that you know when they are three years we can now introduce them to debt funding. Because when it comes to startups, uh, in accessing credit, there are a couple of things that we look at. And one key component is capacity to borrow and capacity to pay. And most startups do not have the capacity to borrow because they haven't gotten to an established level of business where they are able to generate the right revenues consistently to be able to finance their debt. So what we do is to rather focus on their technical capability building. And as I speak, we have mentoring program for our startups. We also have introduced them to the enterprise Empretech uh, training workshop. Recently we've trained over 170 small and medium enterprises and majority of them are startups and women. And we also have aligned them to business development support consultant. So what these consultants are doing is to go into their establishment and do what we call diagnosis, business diagnosis. This will throw out all the 
uh, gaps that are needed to be, uh, you know, that are needed several interventions to address. So financially, you know, what we do is that even when you are two years and you have been disciplined enough to build a good, consistent uh, financial historical record, we look at your funding request exceptionally and then we support you. In terms of options that are available, funding options, I guess that is what you meant, outside the banking uh, sector. Outside the banking sector. Okay, you come to that. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you whether you, th because we're specifically interested in women today, I was going to ask you, would you say there is a financing gap between male and female entrepreneurs? Yes, Audrey, the unfortunate reality is that there is. There is. And the World Bank, you know, puts the figure around $1.7 trillion. And African Development Bank report also put it at $42 billion on the sub-Saharan Africa. In APSA, amongst my borrowing clients, over 65% are men. So what this, is, this means is that the funds that are available to support businesses within the, uh, the continent and within this country, men are taking advantage of these funds. You know, and sometimes it's important to unpack the reasons why there is this imbalance. And if you would permit me, I may touch on you know, one or two of them. The first one is the fear of borrowing. And if you are a woman entrepreneur and you are listening to me, please, don't be afraid to leverage the financial system to scale your business. A lot of women are afraid to borrow. And, you know, I personally have to do a lot of engagement, a lot of education to convince women to leverage the support that is available. And let me tell you, there was this woman who had done so well, had built her business out of her internal generated funds and never borrowed before. I had to convince her over and over again, and when she began, she started with our unsecured of 500,000, she paid, and then as I speak, this year, we supported or we invested over 12 million into her business, and she's going on all over. You know, she's on to an, ex, you know, an expansive project that gives me so much fulfillment. Beyond the fear of borrowing, there is also the sensitivity to pricing. And, you know, when you come to APSA, if you are a woman, we offer you some discount and price concessionary just to encourage the women to come and open accounts for us. If you take a loan, we give you about 300 basis point discount so that you can be encouraged to borrow. And then the next one is the collateral constraint. A lot of men own properties and they leverage that for uh, lending. A lot of women don't have, and those that have, they haven't registered. So when it comes to borrowing at a certain level that requires security, it's a constraint. But let me encourage women who are listening to me here. Yes, we need security. But now banks are now flexible. They are revising their framework. APSA, for example, is able to give you up to 500,000 without collateral and without three years audited account. Beyond that, we are also able to give you one million without collateral, but that one, you need to provide three years audited account. And outside the landed property, there are other forms of collateral. Madam talked about the fixed deposit that is in an investment. You can leverage that to borrow. There is also the stock, the inventory that we can look at as a debenture to help you access some funds. So please do not be afraid be courageous, be bold, and take that step, and come and let's have conversation. Thank you very much. So really, the main reason that there is that gap, some of it is to do with women ourselves, is what you're saying. We, we have that fear, and we don't quite meet what the criteria are. We'll come to you later on, because we'll talk a little bit more about what you would look for when it comes to um, financing, because it's really important that we equip ourselves to be able to expand so that we can um, compete on the continent, so to speak. So thank you for that. I'll come back but to you. Audrey, if I can just add a little. See, apart from the funding, there is also some banks that are offering free capacity and technical uh, development programs. Women must open up to that. A lot of women, you offer them the free uh, capacity building program, they turn it down. 
And as I speak, we have aligned consultants, like I said, and some of them are not taking advantage of that. But it's not just about funding. You must be educated. You must understand some financial credit and uh, analysis, in analysis and stuff like that to position you to even take that first step. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. So from your perspective, you're really talking a lot about traditional banking. Okay. So I'm going to go to Right Reverend Patricia and really ask you a little bit more about the, the non-traditional banking um, opportunities or options that there are for, for um, financing one's business as well. Because we talked about, we know that there, have, there are many challenges that SMEs face. Some of them, perhaps with women, it could just be the fear of going to, uh, you know, to, to borrow. It could just be that they don't feel they have the right um, bank. A lot of them, especially if you look at women in rural areas and the, and the smaller communities, maybe they don't have the right um, even bank accounts or the, the, the documentation that's needed to make the banks feel that there is no risk when they're lending to these individuals. So th they um, feel as though there's nothing out there for them, and so they remain small. But w we can't remain small anymore. We need to expand. We need to come together and grow the businesses, maybe even pharma groups coming together to form a larger cooperatives so that we can compete on, on the, the, the um, sorry, across the continent. So what would you say are the, some of the non-traditional ones? Thank you, Thank you mm. so much, Okay. I was very touched by what um, my sister said, um, Lady Catherine, about the um, difficulty in having access in his facility, increasing his facility. But I think that by and large, um, what I would say initially is that getting finances from the bank is, is important. But first of all, um, as entrepreneurs, we need to find out whether we really, really, really need those facilities. Because at the end of the day, you are also going to pay interest, and this interest will also erode you know, part of your profits. So you, we, we really need to look at that very well. It is also very important for us also to plan. Most of the time, what I've realized is that um, um, unexpectedly, we just have to jump to the banks and looking for funding for our businesses. But once we plan, um, we can anticipate some of the needs that the financial needs we have, and then we find ways to mitigate some of um, these needs. And I just want to quote a scripture in Luke 14, 28, which says that which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down to see whether you have all the resources you know, to build before you go on. So I will encourage that as much as possible, we, we, we put in a lot of effort of planning into the businesses we are engaged with. That notwithstanding, um, we are all aware of the challenges that SMEs have in getting access to financing from the banks. And most of the banks are putting a lot of um, products in place, you know, to meet some of these needs. Beyond that, I would say that there are quite a good number of options available out there for SMEs. And I have engaged a lot of women in entrepreneurship. And you see a lot of them even having a lot of stock. You know, you have a huge pack of stock of about, let's say, 200,000, 300,000 stock of items. And you go into the bank, you know, to um, get more loan, to buy more stock, while the stock is there. So we will encourage people as much as possible to make sure that your stock turnover, you know, is reduced so that you have a lot more money. And then also to one other encouragement or other products or other ways of getting funding is what I call the supplier credit. You may have a supplier in a country or even within Ghana. You don't need to pay the supplier upfront. So you can also get the credit from the supplier for the supplier to give you, let's say, a 30-day or a 60-day credit. So instead of going to the bank to borrow to pay the supplier upfront, why don't you rather get the supplier 
to give you room to sell the goods before you pay the supplier. Also, too, another option is also to get your buyers to pay you a certain percentage of what they intend to buy upfront. So that would also increase and improve on your cash flow. So you are making, um, um, getting some leverage from your supplier and then also getting a leverage from also your buyer. So this will also increase your cash flow. Other means of also getting um, funding, other than the traditional funding, is what I call the crowdfunding. You know, where you can get a lot of people coming together, you know, and then also they contributing into a pool. And you know, when you are in business, as much as possible, there are two ways. You are looking at minimizing your cost and also increasing your revenue. So as much as possible, you want cheap funds as much as possible. But if you have this crowdfunding, you will not pay as much interest as you are paying. The banking sector is good. Financing your businesses is extremely good. But that is when there is really a need for it. But if there's a way of managing, you know, what you have to increase your profitability, I mean, it's good to go on that trajectory. So you can also um, look at crowdfunding. One other, ways, one other way also is factoring. If you look on the books, and my sister was talking about why um, the banks are not giving facilities, which I believe that uh, my sister will talk about. But if you look on, on the books of, of, of most of the clients, you will see a lot of, a huge amount of debtors on their books. You have so many people owing you a lot of debtors, and you're going to the bank to borrow. So you are borrowing to pay interest when people are owing you. There are a lot of companies out there that they can discount, you know, the, the um, amounts that people are owing you, and then you can get money also to um, promote your business. Also to, I think also that the um, microfinance institutions are very friendly to SMEs. The challenge is, of course, the rate is very high, and therefore um, the interest rate tends to be much higher than the traditional banks. But the, S the microfinance companies who are there that will also make funding available to um, our SMEs. One other option that I think is available that I will encourage most um, entrepreneurs to leverage on more so when we are talking about after, is, is, is the butter system, where um, you, you, you form alliances, strategic alliances with companies even that you deal with where you supply goods to them, they also supply goods to you. And therefore, they don't pay you, you also don't pay them. But the two of you are leveraging on the products that you are both exchanging and selling, and then also making profit out of it. Beyond this, we have other government-sponsored facilities that are also in the banks, that are also available to um, SMEs. And one other thing that I just want to conclude with as, as part of the thing is, as women, um, we, 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 we spend a lot of money on jewelry, et cetera. And I, have, um, I had an encounter with a lady who had a lot of jewelry in gold. She was in business, she needed money. What she did was that she just went, picked all her jewelry, and then went and sold the jewelry and invested the money into her business. So it is also one of the ways, you know, of getting money. If you have items that you can sell, that you can also invest in your business, and after trading with the money, you make a lot more money, and then you can go back and also, you know, just um, um, buy whatever you want to buy. You also have family and friends, and you can go to family and friends also for them to support your business in one way or the other. Additionally to, we have venture capital funds all across, and also in Ghana, we have quite a few of venture capital um, funds. 
that are also willing and ready to support um, private businesses, small businesses. So if you have an idea or you have a business that is also very young and also you also want to expand, um, venture capitals are also there and I believe that they will also be willing to support. But by and large, I just want to encourage um, our women that they have a lot of potential and there are a lot of opportunities. The banking sector is there, but there are also options that they can rely on if it is not critically necessary for them to go to the banks. They should just take advantage of some of the things I've spoken about and explore, and I believe that that will work for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are talking about options of crowdfunding. You're talking about options of um, working with microfinancing institutes to, to bring down interest rates. Um, you talked about a barter system. It's a good one. And different government sponsors facilities as well. And looking at venture capitalists. Thank you. Those are good options to the traditional forms of, of banking as well. I just want to move away very slightly from the finance side of things. And now look at um, intellectual property. And the reason being that um, innovation is also extremely important for the success of AFTA. And there are many um, young people, many women who have innovations that um, perhaps are not quite doing the right things to ensure that those in, um, innovations will take off and reach where they will reach and not be copied, for instance. I would, th the question really is, what's the importance of early registration of trademarks or products, even for a small business. Because I'm thinking now of, of that small business who perhaps thinks, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll wait till I'm big and, and do something when it comes to trademarks. Thank you, Audrey. It is tried knowledge that entrepreneurs are innovators. They create and they leverage on their creativity. They take the risk to move from their creative works to products of value on the market. Now, if you create something and you put it out there on the market, most often these entrepreneurs do not have the capital to meet the demand that may follow. Madame started little and it escalated. So assuming that when you started, some giant company on the market in the, in, the, in the country or some other place decided to pick your, your innovative ideas, you would have been pushed off the market and there was nothing you could do about it. So intellectual property comes in, states realize the weaknesses in this, um, the vulnerability of these innovators, these entrepreneurs. So the state says that if you have this idea, if you have this product, this service that is new, that is, is unique on its own, we could give you some form of protection. You tell us what it is. We give you some kind of monopoly for you to leverage on. It could even be um, your only source of asset to begin with and give you some time a limited period, maybe seven years, 10 years, 20 years, within which no competitor can compete with you on the market. So you alone can you know, sell your products, you establish yourself very well, and then maybe after the 10 years, some competitors can now come in, by which time you would have recouped your investment, you would have made some profit, you would have established yourself on the market. So as a small business, you have started off, you have only this asset, this idea, this, I saw this coconut thing with the sherbet and thing, very beautiful. That's the only thing you have. So it is very important at that stage to take advantage of the intellectual property system. Intellectual property rewards creativity. Unfortunately, for there are two aspects of it, the industrial property and then the copyright uh, and related rights. For the industrial properties, which most businesses really need, you need to take steps to register before you are given that protection. So if you fail to register, we call what we call the public domain. It goes into the public domain and everyone can compete with you. 
So that is the essence of it. And if you, one other thing, so is that if you don't file, you don't file for registration and somebody else files first, we have a first to file system. Somebody goes to file for registration, the grant of that particular right will be given to that other person. Most of the time when you come up with these innovative ideas, you have one or two people who are aware of these ideas. You can't tell, somebody can take the first step to go register it and you'll have to go through the hurdle of trying to get your rights back. Another thing too is that when you form the idea, you can't tell who else has a similar idea. If you don't take steps to register it and the person does, the person will be given the right and the person can use that to push you off the market. Having registered it gives your product or service some added value. You could even leverage that in looking for your funding because if you have that particular product or, or service and you have that monopolistic right, monopoly for that particular product or service, you can actually leverage on that and maybe your investors may be interested in investing in your work. So it is very important for a small business. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And that's really worth remembering for anyone who has uh, an innovation. Doesn't matter how small it is, register it. Until it so, yeah, for the trademark. Okay, um, just in as, just exactly two minutes, if you please tell us. You mentioned before that that individual perhaps doesn't even have capital. So how expensive is it to register? Because maybe that's what's putting people off registering. Um, how long would it take them? How much would it cost? And what's the cost of not doing it? Two minutes, please. I would not say that it's maybe the main reason why people don't register. Most people are not aware of it in the first place. Okay. Registration of products, as in the patents, your industrial designs, the coconut butter, the chef, and all that. Um, registration of industrial designs could be about, um, let's say, about 50 or to $90 US dollars. It, we, it's quite expensive because currently Ghana doesn't have a legislative instrument for the registration of industrial design. So we have to registra register through our regional office and that makes it a bit expensive. For trademarks, um, application fee is also $200 and uh, your certificate fee will be about um, $200. But we have, as agents or attorneys, IP attorneys, we do advise our clients on the best means or the most strategic way of registering so that it reduces your cost. Because if you tell me, for instance, that you are interested in Ghana, Nigeria, Mali, you need the number of countries or markets you are interested in, I could give you the cheapest route to get in there, to get your... Um, your, your right, but if you choose to go country by country, sometimes they tend to be more expensive. Okay, we'll come back to that, thank you very much. Um, we, when I was introducing earlier, I spoke about um, standards, about the quality of product, because we want to use made in Africa goods. We want, we want to encourage intra-African trade. We want to add value to our raw materials so that we're changing the narrative at the moment, which is that we export our raw materials and receive back finished goods at expensive prices. We want to add value. We want to join regional value chains. We want to be able to trade within ourselves and have good quality products. What would you say, sorry, this question is for um, Mimi, please. How are the FDA working under AFTA to ensure that women specifically, um, entrepreneurs benefit from it? And if you could just um, sum that up in about three, four minutes, it's unfair to put a time on you, but <laughs> I'm looking at the time in generally, so okay. please, thank, thank you. you. very much, Audrey. Um, the FDA, as you know, is the regulatory authority, mm -hmm. and our mandate is to ensure quality, safety, and efficacy. Mm -hmm. And when it has to do with food, we say wholesomeness. Um, the FDA currently has what we call an industrial support department. Um, we do not, it is not just restricted to local industry, but at the moment our support is mainly for uh, micro, small and medium scale enterprises, even cottage industries. So if you manufacture something in your home, for example, and you came to us, 
We would actually help you to put all your systems in place. We actually offer training. Um, we are what we call a nurturing but very firm regulator because at the end of the day, the most important thing in anybody's product, and especially if you export it, is to ensure that it's of the right quality. Now, we've had instances where products have been exported and sent back to Ghana, and they were mostly products that we did not know about. So basically, if you have the regulator's support and you have the regulator's backing and you have a product that is registered, it is very unlikely that if you, you cannot compete even not even within Africa, even internationally, mm. because we our standards are the same no matter where the product is made. So if it is being used in Ghana, we expect the same quality standards as if it is being used in the United States, South Africa, UK, anywhere else. So we would help you, with, I mean, that is why we put in this um, uh, department, because at the end of the day, the regulator's work is made easier if the, the, the industry understands what it's supposed to do. So we put in this um, department to ensure that everything that is, um, whether it's coming in for registration, and before you even bring it in, if it is imported, it still has to be registered. So we will still work with you to ensure that you have the product that is right for Ghana and that is right for anywhere. So that is how the regulator currently works. You would not find this in many regulatory agencies um, across the continent, but we have it here and would ask everybody to take um, advantage of, of this um, initiative or this department that we have to help grow your business. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have um, programs specifically for women? Are you women focused or are you entrepreneur focused? <laughs> Okay, so I've been asked this question uh, several times, but um, I would say that maybe we do, okay. because as a regulator, quality does not make any difference whether it is being made by a giant company or whether it's being made by a cottage industry. Neither does safety. However, at the moment, we must be doing something right because of the food products that are actually licensed for use in Ghana, 95% are from women entrepreneurs. And of the cosmetics, roughly about 70% are from women ent entrepreneurs. So maybe it's because I'm there, but we, we are doing something right. And um, we, we, we um, quietly encourage women businesses. Okay. So most of the time when we organize training, I mean, recently we did um, um, a donation with the help of the World Food Program and the Ghana Enterprises Agency. We worked with 30 cereal growers, cereal processors, and um, we had been working with them right from when they started packaging their products in Olunka bags to now where we have helped them to make labels, packaging materials and labels for their products. And out of the 30 that came, 27 were women and only three men. The men felt very left out. We had to encourage them. But basically now they can, and we've also worked with um, the, the supermarkets, et cetera, to ensure that whatever the regulator has put their stamp of approval on, the supermarket is, is uh, in quotes obliged to take it. Sometimes people have called me to tell me, well, I took my product to um, uh, MaxMart and they didn't take it. And then I made that small call to MaxMart saying that, well, if you don't take it, we're in trouble. <laughs> but that is on the side. But um, we, we, we do make that extra effort quietly to encourage women, female businesses. And they are coming. So you can tell from the, the, com the, the percentage of women, I mean, female-owned, businesses that have come to us, that we are doing something right. Unfortunately, we can't particularly put on there that that is what we do, but quietly we are supporting Absolutely. them, and it shows in the numbers that are there. Okay, that's wonderful, and that's worth remembering that you will support programs, you will support them through to the stage where they can get that product on the shelf yes. and even twist some arms to ensure that. Yes, I mean, we, we have this um, company that is now exporting to Dubai and to India. Thank and I remember when they first started, their products, that is about five years, six years ago, their products were not even that exciting to look at. But then they came back to us. We had people normally think that, um, and sometimes it's true, the regulator seems a bit um, tough. <laughs> but the end, at the end of the day, I mean, you, your products are only as good as the strength of your regulator. If you have a weak regulator, it is likely that a lot of things will, will slide. And when they go out there, um, that is the, the problem that you have. And the same thing for products coming in. If we close a blind eye or we turn a blind eye on some of the products coming from the other parts of, of Africa, then we would not have done a lot of, would have done them a great injustice. In so the person said, look, I, I sent my products to Dubai 
and I am very grateful for the support that you gave me. It was tough, but at the end of the day, 80% of the work had been done. So just to encourage you that um, we may sound a bit difficult sometimes. It may take a bit of a time, a lot of a, a bit of a time. But if you work with us right from the beginning, and right from the beginning means that as soon as you dream of anything, come and let us know. What do you want to put on the label? We will tell you whether internationally it is acceptable or not. Even if you want to import a product into the country from anywhere in Africa, we have our guidelines on the website, and we have a, a, a fantastic client services that will tell you whether what you're doing is right or is wrong. So we are not as scary as uh, we, the perception that we, we used to have. We're actually much better than, than okay, before. Okay, that's wonderful. So that's, um, that trademark means that you can trade across the, you can do intra-African trade without yes. having challenges. So I can take that trademark. I can take my product to Egypt. So, yes, so at the moment, what we are working on is the um, um, African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization. Mm -hmm. It started with medicines at the moment, mm -hmm. but because of COVID, now are, they are looking at um, uh, medical devices like the masks, they are looking at um, um, uh, chemicals like um, sanitizers. Mm -hmm. So within that framework, we are, we are trying to harmonize our standards for all products. Okay. So that the standard that Ghana requires is the same as Nigeria requires, is the same as South Africa requires. So that is being worked on. And it will get to a point where you can actually say you are, you are registering a product centrally. So okay. once it's registered in Ghana, it is acceptable everywhere. We're working on That's that as brilliant. regulators. Yes. How, how close are we to that? Uh, we. <laughs> We are close. I mean, you, you start with one product. Uh, when, when this started, the most in, um, critical products we're looking at were medicines, right? Mm -hmm. But we have all resolved that under that umbrella, and we had to all sign that we are looking at the African Medicines Agency, and uh, we needed 15 uh, countries to rat ratify the treaty, and we have got the 15 countries now. Brilliant. So hopefully by the sometime next year, that should be established. And because most of us regulators in Africa regulate both food and medicines, we hope to now push the medicine mm -hmm. and uh, the food and other products under that same umbrella so that we can work in that way. Yes. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Beatrice, sorry, I've ignored you for a long time. <laughs> okay. So, um, so Beatrice mainly works with policies. And so in view of the commitments that have been made by the different member states um, and after, by joining the AFTA, commitments or schedules, et cetera, et cetera, laws and policies at national level are in place to assist SMEs, particularly women entrepreneurs? Mm. Well, um, actually you've hit the nail on the head because um, of course the AFCFTA, the agreement itself, is a framework and it really depends on how it is implemented at the national level by state parties. Um, that's where it will have its impact. Mm. So I think the first thing to say is that the AFCFTA will open greater economic opportunities across the board for businesses, whether they're SMEs or uh, larger corporations. And the market environment that will be created through the AFCFTA will promote certainty, predictability, and transparency. And that's very important, mm. especially for SMEs, so that yes. the level, the, the playing field is leveled for them. I think the second point to say is that um, because of the wider economic space that will be created, more opportunities will be available for SMEs to link in mm -hmm. through supply chains or uh, value chains um, to others. So you'll have economies of scale in production. You'll have better opportunities for networking, for complementarity. You'll have enhanced collaboration um, and that will ensure that people can um, move into the, into the value chain. So um, it all depends, of course, on the way the agreement is implemented at the national level. So what can we expect? Because just to let you know, negotiations are still going on in terms of putting the meat on the bones of the skeleton of the AFCFTA in the form of tariff schedules and then under services um, specific um, commitments. So the first thing is that because tariffs will come down, of course, on a, on a large number of products, SMEs will be able to trade in those um, things. Then um, it's, it's not just tariffs. Non-tariff barriers have been particularly um, you know, egregious for, for SMEs. 
So all those overly burdensome customs procedures, the excessive paperwork, now there is a monitoring mechanism um, to enable SMEs to report uh, any NTBs that they face, and then those uh, will gradually be uh, eliminated. Then because of that, there will be, um, there's a, there are different annexes to the protocol on uh, trading goods. One of them is on customs cooperation, mm -hmm. and that will ensure that customs administrations across the board will be able to um, collaborate with each other, cooperate with each other, find out you know, how product standards and regulations are being implemented at various border posts um, to make it easier for, for goods to flow um, between uh, African borders. And then in my area, the progressive elimination, the progressive liberalization of services will happen. Transport, financial services, um, ICT, um, all of these will be um, available for uh, entry into the various markets by service suppliers at um, the, the terminology is on terms no less favorable than the domestic uh, uh, suppliers have access to. So already there is quite, um, quite a lot there. Then in terms of um, licensing or um, uh, uh, e equivalence from um, and harmonization of uh, experience, mutual recognition of uh, qualifications, mutual recognition of licensing and standards will also be done under the AFCFT, under services, for instance, professional services. So lawyers, doctors, engineers, architects, um, who, many of whom have small businesses. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned when, I w when you were talking about my bio, I operated a small and I knew about red tape, I knew about the withholding tax, I, I immediately, immediately resonated with me. Um, so these are all um, things, the whole package of the AFCFTA is designed to bring costs down. When you bring trade costs down, it quickly um, leverages and uh, catalyzes the available economic space for small business to operate. That small business is headed by a woman, or is predominantly women. Then they um, they can take advantage of these. Thank you, and, and that's a very very key point because at the moment, cost of production means that small businesses are not competitive. And if we've opened up this huge space, we've got this huge um, market of of 1.2 billion, and we can't be competitive, and then. We are open up space for um, Chinese products. We're all opening up space for cheaper products, not cheaper products, but products that can afford to have um, a, a cheaper price because our cost of production is too high. So all these policies are really, really crucial to help those um, SMEs and those entrepreneurs. So thank you. And also, um, one of the main challenges for informal traders, of course, are cross-border challenges. So those policies in place to overcome those impediments that women are facing as unnecessarily uh, are really, really crucial to the success as well. So yeah. thank you for that. Can any one of our panel members address the issue that Catherine brought up with regards to um, withholding tax. Um, I was looking at right where from Patricia. I don't know whether you can you can take that one, or or maybe even Beatrice yourself. Yeah. You can talk about the issue of withholding yeah. tax. We yeah. Well, I would like to just say, um, if you look at a country like Rwanda, mm -hmm. Rwanda understood that in order to trade, in order to do better mm -hmm. in terms of competitiveness they had to look at the overall business environment. So they addressed that, addressed issues to do with, um, you know, um, bus business incorporation, business taxes, filing. So things like the general business environment is mm -hmm. really important mm -hmm. for, you know, across the board. Mm -hmm. So business permits, how long does it take? How much paper paperwork is there? Are the fees too high? Are they out of the reach of, of SMEs? Um, improvement in structures, mm. um, just the general um, uh, utility uh, situation, access to water, access to electricity, access to the internet, how, how wide is the bandwidth? Does it enable um, you know, people to be able to do uh, um, you know, e-commerce, uh, pay cash payments, uh, online payments, that kind of thing? You need 
strong internet infrastructure, you need access to um, electricity for all of this. So generally, even before you start talking about capacity building for women, uh, making sure that they can reach certain technical standards, enabling them to um, take advantage of opportunities, look at the general business environment and tackle that. Make sure across the board, because that also helps to level the playing field. So that you know, you're not co um, constantly um, saying, oh, I need to then invest in a generator to run my business. So things like that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I have a number of questions, but I'm also conscious of time because I wanted to give the audience an opportunity as well to ask questions. So I have a number of questions that I would have liked you to have answered, but I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking maybe at this stage, if anyone has any questions from the audience um, for our panelists, then we can um, take those. And then if we have time, we'll come back to look at some other issues surrounding um, the entrepreneur capacity of, of women of Africa. So... Any questions from the audience, from anyone? Please, my name is Solis Juliana Aja. Um, I want to direct my question to the FDA. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, about four years ago, I registered my products and uh, it took them about a year before they were able to give me my certificate. And then uh, I was doing renewal. This year, January, I made a renewal again. And then as I speak now, I haven't gotten the certificate. I don't know what is holding them back. But I made a comparison in terms of uh, during the COVID era, a lot of businesses have been established and then registered. Within a month or two, they were given their certificates. I could speak from a friend's perspective. So I don't know what has been holding them back for so long. I don't know whether the second round of uh, uh, renewal was also taking one year because we are in October now. So please, what is the challenge over there? Thank you. So we'll take one more, okay. Thank you very much. My name is Ishaq Abubakar Ziko. Um, I'm a farmer. I farm on, uh, let's say, a two-acre land. I actually want to um, expand our farm such that we'll be able to export vegetables um, outside Ghana after we've been able to feed um, the whole of Ghana. So um, FDA, what do you think I could do to make sure that I'm producing the right um, vegetables for um, our consumers. And uh, with APSA Bank, what do you think, um, we, where do you think we can get the business support consultancy from? Is it just that we can just walk into your offices and then um, request for that? Or I would definitely need to bank with you in order to um, have uh, some consultancy skills. Thank you very much. My name is Jennifer Moffat, and I'm also a small business owner. Um, my first question goes to um, the AFCFTA. So um, two years ago, I had the opportunity to send um, some products to Gambia. And that's because my friends from Yali, um, when they came, they saw some of the things I do. Most of the things I do is about branding and putting things on wood and all that. And after they placed the order and I processed it, getting the thing out of, the product out of Ghana was like a very big headache. I had to go through a whole lot of things. And later, comparing the cost of the product and then the cost of it using DHL or any other traditional um, international um, transport system wasn't really feasible. In the end, they had to now book for a flight, and then the, someone from the Gan Gambian embassy had to pick it up and take it to Gambia. As we, we talk now, they, 
people there want the product, but comparing it to what they get from China, it's better to order from China and it is easier to come to their country than starting from here. So what is the policy around moving products from one African country to the other? Are we looking at railways? Are we looking at, even if you are going by air, how is it going? Because we are suffering and we have things that we, we can even through our African countries send. But we can't go again and I've lost that door that was opening to me. So my second one goes to trademark. I want to find out what is the exact procedure in going through trademark. If I want to do trademark or I want to patent, what is the steps, st one step by step, where I have to go and what I have to do? Thank you very much. Okay, so FDA, after Secretariat, and APSA. Um, thank you very much. I'll be very interested in knowing which product um, you submitted. So maybe after the program, I'll find out. Now, within the last two years, we have what we call the progressive licensing scheme. And it is actually taking people maximum 14 days if I maybe say maximum 20 days to register a product with the FDA. I can understand maybe a year ago. Now the difference is that a year, four years ago, if you expected to meet the ultimate um, um, regulatory standards, there was no in between. Now since June last year, this progressive licensing scheme allows us to give you three types of licenses. So we have the pink license, we have the yellow license, and then we have the green license before you go to the, pay, the colorless license which is what you would have got four years ago. Um, we do not compromise on safety. So whatever product it is, once you meet the standards of safety, such that you are not going to injure anybody by them either using or, or, or consuming your product, we will then give you what we call the pink license. So you can be manufacturing in your kitchen, right? You could have started manufacturing, say, plantain chips in your kitchen. And so far as there's no cross-contamination with anything else, um, we will give you a pink license. So in, the, in about 15 days maximum, you will get a pink license. Then we work with you within those three years to upgrade you from a pink to a yellow, and then from a yellow to a green. And then from green, I mean, you can just then go to a full license. So that is what would have taken you much longer four years ago. So we're actually a listening regulatory agency, and I'm promoting us very much, uh, you can notice. But I'd like, like to know what exactly it is. Sometimes what manufacturers don't realize is that any change in a product label constitutes a totally new uh, um, application. So if you register a product and then you go out there, maybe the product was in a, a, a PET bottle, and then suddenly you decide to put it in Tetra Pak, it constitutes a different product. And when they are evaluating that product, they will evaluate it differently. So we always tell you that if you change anything in your packaging material or even on your label, please let us know, because otherwise when you come back, and, and, and this information is available also on our website, if you come back, it then has to go through an entirely new process. So please, the slightest change you make to your product, let us know. Um, and uh, please apply when you apply, apply to um, um, be evaluated through the progressive licensing scheme, and I can assure you it will take you much, uh, much shorter. Client services is, is informed now, and they will even ask you whether you want to go through that scheme, and then you can, you can benefit from it. It's very cheap. It costs you something like 50 CDs a year to um, register your facility, and maximum 150 CDs um, for three years to register your product. So please take um, um, advantage of that. To, uh, talking about the export of um, uh, vegetables out of the country, when, when I talked about um, harmonization, I know that the Ghana Standards Authority is looking at the Africa, I mean, working with the Africa Standards uh, Agency or um, Society to ensure that standards are harmonized across the continent. Now, we are regulators and we work with standards that have been um, um, developed or approved by, by our standards agency. So, if Ghana Standards Authority says that this is the standard for vegetables, we have to um, regulate with those standards. If Rwanda has a, their standard, then a standard in Ghana may not be the same as a standard in Rwanda. So the standards authority I know, and we work very closely with them, are looking at harmonizing standards across the continent, which means that I will know what standard South Africa wants, South Africa will know our standards, Nigeria will know Ghana's, and we will all have the same common standards. That way, the regulator can also use the, 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 the appropriate guidelines, harmonized guidelines with all these countries. 
But before you export anything out of this country, please make sure you have a certificate of manufacture and free sale from us. That way, that, that certificate is recognized by the other regulator or the regulator in the, in the receiving country. Once you have that, you should not have a problem because we will also find out by which standards they want um, um, uh, their vegetables to come in, in with. But it all has to do with the harmonized standards within the region. And I know that the AFCFTA is working to do that, um, uh, it's, it's meant, Beatrice mentioned it. So that is what it is, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question about um, uh, sending products to, to Gambia from, from Ghana. Um, before I talk about the AFCFTA, let me just say a little bit about the ECOWAS, because both Ghana and Gambia are ECOWAS countries. And I'm pretty sure that um, both of them are implementing in some way or, or form the ECOWAS trade liberalization scheme. In theory, that, that should be operating in all West African countries, but I know that um, in some countries there are some uh, you know, issues with customs and recognition, etc. So if your product has been certified or it is under the list of those uh, products that are uh, ET under the ETLS scheme, then um, in theory you should be able to um, export your product at a, prevent, at a preferential rate to, um, uh, to Gambia. You mentioned logistics, and um, yes, transport and logistics is absolutely key uh, for, for trade. Um, I don't actually know what the, what the freight costs are. Traditionally, ECOWAS countries, um, the costs for, for freight have been really, really high. Apparently, you know, just getting a, um, a container from one country to another is, uh, you know, costs like almost three times more or, or four times more than, than it is to, to kind of like send a container to China or to, or to Europe where, or wherever. So the good news is that under the AFCFTA, transport and logistics are one of the priority sectors in the first round of negotiations. I talked about the meat on the bones of the skeleton. Right now we have the protocol on trade in services, which just broadly sets out the framework for liberalization of services intra-Africa uh, to all the state parties of the AFCFTA. Uh, however, um, to, to kind of make it commercially meaningful, you then have to have these um, schedules of specific commitments. They're kind of like annexes that go to, to support what um, each what the obligation of each country in terms of, for instance, transport. So in um, air transport, they will liberalize in a certain way. In road transport, they will liberalize in a certain way. If there is rail, they will cert uh, you know, uh, uh, certify and um, uh, have an obligation and make commitments in a certain way. So this is an, um, an opportunity for you as a small business talk to your chamber of commerce or talk to your business support organization and uh, find out what Ghana, as part of ECOWAS, will commit to in terms of transport and logistics under the AFCFTA. What are Ghana's own commitments under the AFCFTA for transport? What are their commitments for other forms of, of, of logistics like distribution, etc. Because this is really critically important. What Ghana will commit to will impact the business environment. Um, and so this is, a, this is a critical issue for, for, for you as a, as a small business operator. Um, but again, I, I'll be happy to, um, to talk to you bilaterally and to see, but just to say that this is coming. What you have talked about is the status quo. And it is precisely because of these types of issues and problems that we have the AFCFTA to, to really catalyze and, and encourage and promote intra-Africa trade so that it's cheaper to send to Gambia than it is to send to the UK. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that question. The Business Development Support Services is a program 
and uh, APSA MasterCard Foundation Young African Works Program. And the program seeks to financially support 5,000 SMEs in the next five years and also provide that BDS uh, services for 5,000 SMEs for five years. We are able to support you from 20,000 up to uh, 500,000 Ghana cities without collateral and also without audited financials. You can also take up to 1 million, but you would have to provide audited financials, but without collateral. Now, to benefit from the BDS consultancy services, obviously you would have to have some level of partnership or relationship with the bank. You have to open an account with us. And because we are investing in you for free, we would want to also gauge your commitment. For that reason, we observe your account for three months to be sure that you will not come in the next minute you are jumping to the other bank. You know, so we want to gauge that level of commitment and loyalty. And honestly, you are the right person I'm looking for because the project is skewed towards women-led business owners, the youth uh, entrepreneurs, and also agri-businesses. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, since you have the mic, I'll ask you a quick question. This is a two-minute question, please. Um, how do individuals, posi SMEs, position themselves to ensure that you will give them the finance? What are you looking for as a financial institution to ensure that, so that the individual can ensure that they actually get that, that loan? Because I think that really is, is um, a hurdle that many have to, to jump over and, and a hindrance to actually expanding business. So just two minutes on that one, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So number one, you must have a legally registered business because we are heavily regulated. Uh, we go through a process of recruiting or onboarding clients and uh, business registration is a core component of our onboarding process. Number two, you should also have an account with a bank and you should have operated that account for a minimum of six months. And one of the things that I have observed you know, about SMEs is that uh, because they are, some of them are desperate for funding, they hear that, oh, Bank A is offering this, and then they go and open an account. And, you know, small SME has about five accounts. And sometimes you ask yourself, you know, how much are you making that you have spread your wings so wide? And for that reason, most of them are not able to build a strong credit turnover and average turnovers. And for APSA, you know, for unsecured lending, our major consideration is your credit turnovers and your average turnovers. So if you don't send your funds to the bank to build a consistent credit turnover and average turnover, it will be very difficult to support you. And then also, you have to keep proper financial records. I know that at a point in your business, sometimes you struggle. But if your business has been established for at least three years, it is expected that you should be able to you know, keep proper records of your business operations, especially your financial records. Because at a certain level, if you want to go beyond the 500,000, which is unsecured, you may have to provide three years audited account and then management account for the bank to be able to assess your financial position and health. It's very important. And then also you need to use the loans that we give you for the right purpose. If you do that, we'll be very happy with you. You'll be our friend and anytime you come, we would open up and support you. Don't divert the money into ventures that you yourself, you don't even have the know-how to actually operate it. We've had such challenges and it has impacted the business and also the bank as well. Finally, let me say that your loyalty to the bank, it is partnership. You need to be very loyal and keep your business with us. And when, we, when you do that, it's so easy for us to support you. I know it's because of time, so let me just put it here. If you want more information, meet me outside after, after this session, and I'll give you more information and then expand your knowledge in the financial sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just a, our time is fast spent, unfortunately, but just a quick one. Is there a lady called Pearl Hansen in, in the audience? Is Pearl around? Okay, so Pearl had set up a business, and I just wanted her to share her experience very quickly, but I think she's not around. That's fine. Um, oh, she is around. Oh, Pearl is around.
So I beg I there was another question on trademarks which we haven't answered. So I'll just give the hand over to Sarah just for a quick minute. Thank you. So to quickly answer that, um, IPRs are um, territorial in nature. So it depends on where and where you want the protection. If you want the protection in Ghana, um, the right office is the Ghana Industrial Property Office under the Registrar General's Department. And to, regist to register, you need to fill the appropriate form. Uh, you must have your, your trademark and you pay the prescribed fees. If you want to register a patent for your product or your process, you need to first of all have the specifications drafted. You may, need, you may need a professional to draft the specifications for you. With the specifications, you need to file, you need to fill the appropriate form and pay the requisite uh, fees, uh, which for an individual is 100 Ghana cities, and for a, a company, it's 300 Ghana cities. But along the line of the registration process, there's a, a publication stage where you have to uh, publish at the um, assembly press, and it's about 450 Ghana cities or so. And then at the end of it, all, um, the grant fee is about 250. I, I'm not too sure of that. But if you want to go outside Ghana because you are trading under the AFCFTA, in Africa, we have two regional bodies. We have the OAPI for the Francophone countries, and then we have ARIPO. So these are administrative bodies that you can send applications to, and then you can get coverage in those areas. Those, uh, those countries that are not members of these two bodies, you can go individually to those countries and have the registration done there. We also have the World Intellectual Property Organization, the International Bureau of, that, uh, of, the, of WIPO. Uh, they also facilitate these registrations, so you can file through them, and then you can reach as many countries as you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Pearl, if you just share your story just in about two, three minutes, because okay. our time is, is sure. up. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Audrey. Um, ladies and gentlemen, so Pearl Hanson. I'm from a company called AA Food and Beverages. I moved to Ghana from the UK in 2016. I wanted to get into premium spirits. So I have one here called Sahara Solid. First of all, um, you have to register the company, and that wasn't too difficult, luckily. And then FDA, I have to say, before I came, uh, I was kind of scared because the general perception was like, oh, they're very difficult. But I have to say, I had a really good experience. They were very helpful in the sense that, yes, um, they do want you to succeed. So, um, yes, there was a bit of back and forth, but then that was because they wanted us to get the product and the labeling absolutely correct. And we did, we did that. Um, financing has been so difficult. Um, luckily, I had a few, I've got two business partners, and it's all been, um, we've generated the income ourselves, but we wanted to um, increase production, upscale, and all that. And I just feel that um, the banks in Ghana do not help businesses, honestly. Like, because, um, yes, we're not quite there to the standard that they want, so perhaps we need um, longer term financing. It's not just about giving me the money, I need more experience. Because for me, to be able to come up with this product just from passion, because I did chemistry, but I would like somebody to tell me, you know, hold my hand, access to market. You know, there's so much going on there. But if you don't know, you don't know. Luckily, I joined a couple of women, um, AGI, and that's how I got um, some lectures, you know, some things that I didn't know. Because in general, it's like you're walking to a zoo, you don't know how the system works. I would like to export. Even trying to get um, freight, getting, like it's just, you don't know exactly where to go. Um, this year, because last year was about surviving. Obviously there was no money in the system, so I understand if banks didn't want to give money last year. So this year I tried crowdfunding and um, I got a few friends and family. They supported, because I needed, we needed money for production. But then the thing is, with the Ghanaian um, mindset, people would rather donate money for say funerals rather than perhaps supporting a business. So it's our own mindset. We're saying promote made in Ghana, but we ourselves as Ghanaians are not prepared to um, use our own product. So how do we expect other people, now that we want to join AFTA, how do we expect other people to believe in the products that we are making here in Ghana? And I also feel I've been trying to get into ShopRite for over a year now. A lot of emails back and forth, do this, do this, I do it, and still nothing. So it's like, 
in Ghana doing a business, if you don't um, force yourself, encourage yourself every day, I would have given up a long time ago because um, it's frustrating. It's really, really, the system just doesn't allow us to succeed. I come to GRE. Um, listen, I'm a small, it, we're a very small startup, very small startup. And um, yes, we don't, we've made some mistakes here and there. But it's like um, some of these things we didn't know. And um, I tell you, the, like the perception that you have made of a product, and when I'm telling you my numbers, you don't believe it because you don't think, it's like you have your own idea. So it's like in Ghana, when you want to do things right, the system makes it hard for you. So you end up trying to, you know, lie. That's not what we, we need to be doing. We need to encourage people so that they can come out, be honest, and just, you know, you pay the right taxes. So all in all, I'm actually glad to be here today so that I can share my experiences. Because the lady over there mentioned some points which I really agree with. Because doing business in Ghana is so, so, so hard. Oh, my goodness. So I applaud you ladies. You are my mentors. I really don't know how you survived it. But hopefully I'll take a lot from what you have learned. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Pearl. Thank you for that. Okay, I'll take one last question and then we'll round up with a question each for the panelists, please. So one last question, please. I think, was, did Juliet want to ask a question? I think she asked a question earlier. Is she still around? The lady Juliet? No, okay. No, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Juliet, as she's already mentioned, and I just wanted um, to share a little bit of my experience in um, running a small business. Um, I actually work with a network of um, small farmers and retailers of agri inputs. And um, I, I remember there was a time when a lot of um, the people we're working with were struggling to meet the requirements of the banks that we had introduced them to. And then um, we had this crazy idea. Um, we got a, a big supporter, a sponsor, who was willing to give some funding so they could continue with their businesses. So right from the start, we said, you know, we won't be able to work with our farmers because when it comes to records keeping and the rest, um, the books were not very good, we knew. But with the traders, those who were retailing agri inputs, we thought were quite um, business minded and they would want to, they would be able to get some support. So we, we came together, worked with them and got we got, actually got the donor to give us some kind of leverage in the form of um, a credit guarantee so we can <laughs> help them get more support from the banks. Together with my business partner, we walked through almost every bank I know of in Ghana for a whole year. We had money which we wanted to put down for the farmers, for the input dealers, as, so that they would, the banks wouldn't disturb them on collateral. And we couldn't even get a bank to take what we had. It wasn't much, but it was quite substantial. And thinking that we had raised this amount locally. Finally, we got a bank that was willing to, to take the money as guarantee and then go on and lend to our, our input dealers. But we got, I mean, they, we, we got the wrong deal at the end of the day. <laughs> we even ended up losing the guarantee that we had put there for the input dealers. This was a very terrible experience. I mean, we put 500,000 US dollars down and we were just look for a bank that would take that and not bother them about collateral and give them some support. And the way their businesses were, it was mainly, you know, just buy, buying inputs, agri inputs, selling to the farmers and bringing the money back. Having said that, um, after that, it really put a lot of fear in me. I have my own small business and I've never ever gone to the bank. My, my bankers are always chasing me. 
I know there's potential, I know I can expand my business, but I've stayed in my small corner for over 15 years, done my own thing in my own small way, and I see the years passing by just because I'm so scared of <laughs> going to uh, do business with Ailey Bank. And year in and year out, I have my bankers, my relationship managers chasing me, asking me, do you want support? Why don't you come for funding? But that one experience really threw me off completely. So I, I've, I've really listened to a lot, and I thank you, Audrey. Um, you really encouraged me today. I think I'll go back a new person. <laughs> and hopefully, mo moving on, um, I'll do things better. I'm saying this because, um, apart from the fact that I am an entrepreneur, I'm also a business coach, and it's like I, I tell people all these things, but at the end of the day, I'm like, I, I don't want to even put into practice what I'm telling you. But <laughs> today, at least, um, I've, I've heard some very encouraging things, and I think um, there's still um, a bright future out there for small businesses, particularly those of us in agribusiness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliet. That's very honest of you. Thank you. And I think many others probably have had a similar experience which puts them off. So we still have a way to go to encourage um, our SMEs to actually take that step, that bold step to expand and to come to you and to get those products. So I think maybe we need to do more sessions like this where we can explore this further. We need to do more workshops. Um, you know, there's a danger that we, we, we talk and talk and talk about things, but the action part is not there. So I think we probably need to readdress this at a later stage, maybe, you know, regroup and, and look at some action points as well. Um, our time is fast, spent, and I know that you're probably all really hungry thinking, when is she going to finish? <laughs> so if you're promising me that you just, uh, if I ask you the question, you answer it in just two minutes, then I'll say, if you weren't asking two minutes, please tell me, then I'll skip you over. So... <laughs> So just very quickly, um, okay, so very, very quickly, Catherine, um, what advice would you give to that young person or that woman entrepreneur who's contemplating going into agribusiness, having heard what everyone has said, knowing your own experience, just in one and a half to two minutes, please, what advice would you give them? Okay, um, one advice that I'd give is that um, agribusiness is possible. It's difficult, but it is possible. So... Just be diligent, um, just be focused, and you will get through. That's the advice that I'll give. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Be diligent, be focused, and you get through. Thank you. Beatrice, since the mic has come to you, yeah. i just ask you very quickly, in view of all the national policies, um, what would you say is the biggest window of opportunity for women to move into regional value chains? I know that's probably a I huge question, but... If you can no, just no. sum it. I, I would say, you, you see what the pandemic taught us, mm -hmm. um, the opportunities that are out there. So I would say the fourth industrial revolution, and I know people will say, how can you talk about the fourth industrial revolution when people don't have access to electricity across the board or whatever? But the way, the dynamics, the way in which, um, you know, manufacturing is shifting um, from uh, you know uh, the, the sort of mechanical to more uh, um, you know software um, use of cloud com uh, cloud software cloud computing 3D printing all this kind of stuff has changed the game and there's an opportunity there for women to hook into these value chains and move from lower skilled to more um, you know higher skilled uh, um, parts of the of the regional value chain so things like automotives textiles, uh, leather, all of these, um, you know, even um, services value chains, the cultural and the, and the recreational sports um, facilities. Now there's e-sports. Um, there's, um, there's the, all, you know, most of the Nollywood films can now be found on Iroko TV, which is one of the largest streaming uh, services on the continent. So, these, these are opportunities that, um, that women can, can seize on and take advantage of to move up the, the, value, chain. the value chain. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and then I'll move to you, please, Mimi. And what would you say to that entrepreneur who's petrified of coming to you because <laughs> they think that they're either going to get rejected or that the product won't go anywhere or will take forever? What, what would be your advice to them in, in a minute and a half, please? 
Um, our first thing I would say is that before you start any business, please familiarize yourself with the regulations that surround that business. It's the, one of the most important things to do. Um, secondly, work from the start with your regulator. Before you put a block of your, you know, your plan, even when you develop your factory plans, what you want your, your factory or your um, facility to look like, we have an industrial support. We are the ones who will make sure that whatever you are building is right before you decide, when you conceptualize your label. Your label may look good to you in your mind, but it is probably not the right label to use by way of marketing your product or by way of ensuring your product is safe. So I would say that work with your regulator right from the beginning. And actually, if you do that, you realize that the time from the time you're actually done and start putting your product on the market to the time that you get the license will not be more than one week. We are not as difficult as we seem. And as someone said, and I was very, very happy, is that if we seem to frustrate you, it is only because we want you to get it right. And if you start without us, then it is likely that you have to go back and start again. We want to make sure that products that we put out on the market or that are exported to other markets or that come in are of the right quality, they are safe, and then they are efficacious, so you don't run into problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right, Reverend Patricia, um, looking at the vast benefits that AFTA has to offer, do you think that women are positioned to handle the opportunities that um, it presents? And what advice would you give them to take full advantage of these opportunities? I know that, again, that's a big question, but if you could just sum it up in two minutes, we'd appreciate yes. it. <laughs> Certainly, women are, are poised for that. They have all the capacities. They are very creative. They are very innovative. And therefore, I just want to encourage women that to have all that it takes to explore all the opportunities on the continent. And I believe that with prayer, with a lot of business planning, et cetera, God will help you to um, break the glass ceiling, if there is. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Um, sorry, just a very quick question. Um, so that um, innovator, someone who has that product, who wants to, um, so, so they've, they have the IP with yourselves here in Ghana, and they want that product in, for instance, Kenya, or um, um, where, where can I think of? Anywhere in Africa, really. We know that IPs are territorial in nature, and we know that, there's a, that, that the harmonized IPs are probably coming in the future. What would you advise that individual? Because the danger is that they will fear that they have to register this, they have to get an IP in every different ju jurisdiction that they go to. What advice would you give to, to that individual? They will definitely have to get the they IP in every that. jurisdiction wow. that they want to go okay. to. But the strategy, the approach to the registration is what matters. So if you have all these 54 countries, how do you attack each registration process? So you could start from Ghana, you are in Ghana, you can start from any other country, and probably, as I mentioned earlier on in answer to a friend from, you know, the one who asked about the Gambia question, you can take the regional approach, you can take the International Bureau of WIPO okay. uh, approach, and, but there are some countries that are not members to any of these international bodies, so you may have to go the uh, directly to apply, for instance, in Nigeria. If you want a trademark in Nigeria, you will have to go to Nigeria to get it done because they are not part of Aripo, they are not part of the Madrid system, so you have to apply to Nigeria directly. So it depends on the strategy and uh, that you take in applying for, but you need protection in each and every one of them. Probably with the AFCFT protocol, maybe there could be some form of harmonization there could be a universal uh, registration administrative body. I don't know what is going to come out of the uh, IP protocol, but we wait to see. But for now, you need to take steps to get protection in all the jurisdictions or the markets of interest. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just very finally, Audrey, what's your word, your final word of advice to that entrepreneur who wants to... Um, who needs that, that funding? I mean, we, we've heard all the different stories. We've heard all the pitfalls. We heard the story from Pearl. We heard um, Zico. We heard Juliet. What's that final word of advice that you'd give to that SME in okay. two minutes? And I'm timing you. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. I'll do it less than two minutes. Oh, good. Yes. Yeah, so what I would say to the entrepreneurs, the female entrepreneurs, is that, you know, voices are speaking on your behalf. 
globally, continentally, and locally. And we are speaking. And these voices are shaping decisions of stakeholders who are able to change your business destiny. And the financial institution is one such uh, stakeholder. Years back, we didn't have women banking proposition. Today, we have women banking proposition, and it's not just APSA. There are other finance, financial institutions that have women banking propositions, all to encourage women to be financially included so that you can leverage the financial system to scale your business. I encourage you, don't be afraid. Be bold, be courageous, step forward. Go and make all the inquiries that you need to make and allow the information that you get to inform your lending decisions. And as Madame said, you must have a need for the, uh, for the funds before you go in for it. Opportunities are open for you, go for it and you would get. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so on that note, um, as she said, let's be bold. Um, I think the main thing is, 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 is the case that w we need knowledge. SMEs need knowledge. And that's probably where the gap is at the moment. I think a wealth of knowledge has come from the, the, um, from the panelists this, this morning, this afternoon, this afternoon. And we're really appreciative of what you've shared with us. Um, I think you probably, would you all be around at lunchtime just in case someone wants to approach you for a question? You will. Okay, wonderful. So we, we can do that. I think there are huge opportunities for entrepreneurs um, to boost intra-African trade, to, to build our businesses, to move from the informal to the more formal, um, to, to succeed and to be, um, and to produce at, at a level that will compete uh, across the globe. But there, there's still work to be done. And um, there's knowledge that we need to continue sharing. And as I said earlier, we will carry on with this, this type of um, engagement to help all the entrepreneurs because there is a huge opportunity out there. There's an opportunity to 1.2 billion um, in, in the continent and also not forgetting the diaspora as well who play a huge part when we come to AFTA. So at this point, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our panelists. So thank you to um, Ms. Catherine Crovedouce. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you to Mrs. Beatrice Chater, a round of applause. Thank you very much for Mrs. Mimi Delise Darko. Thank you very much, Right Reverend Patricia Sapo. Thank you very much, Mrs. Sarah Anku. And last but not least, thank you very much, my namesake, Mrs. Audrey Abaka. Thank you. And thank you all very much too. Thank you. So I think... Um, Okay, I think we're going to take a group photo, um, but it's time for, sorry. Okay, so if the speakers can please join us on stage as well, we're going to take a group photo. And for all of us, it's time for lunch. I think Etanam will probably tell us what they're going to Okay, so we'll be going for lunch after the group photo, but how about winning $1,000? That's $1,000 here right now. It's cash. It's not in your mind. $1,000, $1,000, and this is sponsored by Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Phi Pi Omega Chapter. So it's a pitch. You're going to be pitching ideas. And I mean, how I wish the women of Africa we can pitch. Audrey, you have any ideas? So after lunch, there'll be a pitch contest. And so you don't want to miss out on that. We want to know who will be winning the $1,000 today is right here. So I want to say thank you to Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and the Phi Pi Omega Chapter for sponsoring this. This is the second edition of the annual business pitch contest to provide financial aid to women entrepreneurs in Ghana to help pivot and transform their businesses. So right after lunch, we'll get on to that. Are you ready for the pitch contest? Thank you. So please don't go away after lunch right here so we'll take the photos now we want our speakers to join us on on stage
lunch. All right, so we are going for lunch. Please, let's all go through the, uh, the exhibition stands before we go for lunch. Ensure that you go through the exhibition stands and please buy something. Buy some cards, take their cards, contact them afterwards so that we can stay in business. This beautiful dress is where Ghana. So you want to grab some for yourself. I'm interested in who will be winning the $1,000. Please, if you win the $1,000, I'm your friend. I'm your friend. $1,000. After the, uh, the, the lunch break, we come back here for the pitch contest. So please, bon appetit.
Just me, my thoughts, and my pillow again. Loneliness, such a day way one day would drive me insane. Me who say me a mudi muda, now my heart is in pain. No amount of champagne will fix all this pain. Me taking whiskey, twelve shots, making wishes to my thoughts, crying and thinking and wishing I go forget this pain. I mean, forget his name. Kissing on my finger, wishing I am wearing his ring. If he no be glamour with some character, my character go fit accept anything, even if he be copper chef. I need a man, make a show him I be proper chef. Even if he be copper chef, I need a man. Make a show him I be proper chef. Text. Keeper of the gates of wisdom, please let me in. Oh. Mm -hmm. Keeper of the gates of wisdom, please let me in. Nya me di na nusu so nungwani mi jen. Come, come, no, be me, 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 Just 
yeah. Obasi sa enam ni na re enam shi shano. And I say me dare in swash yeah. Or this one you know be go me chi ya na me shi shano. With a text message on the phone, yeah. I just wanna wake up with the lips to kiss and the hands to hold me close. And that's why I need someone I can call my own, my own. I want someone I can call my own, my own. I need someone I can call my.
You say hurt me so much. I shame it so much. Shame me more that much. And Chana ni pa mu aflo ni pa. I know they bother too much, but men so me what feelings be. And see we are my dear, I'm at the limit. So me be say me dey wo mu e bufu be shame me mu. Treat me like your brother, eh? And treat me like your sister, eh? And make me one of your own. This world and its caliber of people, and they will wow watch now we be pump pump. It's in love one another, eh? 'Cause nobody knows tomorrow, and your mommy by pencil and wunia. I could be one of yours. Treat me like your brother, eh? And treat me like your sister, eh? And make me one of your own. Treat me like your sister, eh, eh, eh. Please make me one of your own. Oh. Treat me like your sister, eh, eh, eh. Now treat me like I'm one of yours. Mommy, so we need every limit. Tell you I'm a fool, I'm a fool. Cause many bad intentions against you, tell me fool, I correct me. You are cool, I'm gonna pour me. Don't turn your back on me, no one me enemy. Why do me like I do to you? Treat me the way you want me to treat you. 'Cause I could be one of yours, yeah. Treat me like your brother, eh? Yeah. And treat me like your sister, eh? Yeah. And make me one of your own.
king, king promise. Me need me dog for a shed to my mama. Me who said the impossible. Son of the impossible. The temple more he think, more he think, more he dream. I'm on my own side, the impossible. Son of the impossible. Love being in your company. Here with you is where I'd rather be. Give you the best of me like it's supposed to be. Na, 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 na. And girl, I love it in your company. Here with you is where I'd rather be. Give you the best of me like it's supposed to be. Na, 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 na. I know they won't make you go. Won't make you stay. Stay in bed watching your pretty face. Baby girl, I'll be selfish with you. Girl, I'll be selfish with you. No, know they won't make you go. Won't make you stay. Stay in bed watching your pretty face. Baby girl, I'll be selfish with you. Your pretty face, baby girl, I'll be selfish with you. Girl, I'll be selfish with you. No, they won't make you go, won't make you stay. Fall in love watching your pretty face, baby girl, I'll be selfish with you. Me need me dog for a shed to my mama. Me who said the impossible, son of the impossible. The temple more he think, come on, he think, come on, he dream your home. I'm my who said the impossible. Sana dem poasa, we be my dream come true. Oh. We know be perfect too, oh. but as she there with me, we I there for you. We gon' make come true. We oh. be my dream come true. Yeah. We know be perfect too, oh. but as she there with me, we I there for you. We gon' make come true. Oh. I know they won't make you go, won't make you stay, stay in bed watching the. Wow. 
amarelos. Vamos bom, meu rosa. Baby, you know that you the one. Welcome to Jesui Lab. We are here today to show you how we produce our body lotion. In the previous episodes, we demonstrated the various virgin oils we use in the production of the body lotion. And so here we are again with the ingredients ranging from the virgin oils we have the perfume that we use we have our shea butter as for shea butter i don't joke with it at all because of its properties shea butter is rich in vitamin a and it improves skin blemishes wrinkles enzyma and it's also good in moisturizing the skin so when it's added to my essential oil I know my lotion is complete. We have our flakes and other ingredients here. Then also we have our measuring cups. We have various sizes. have our heat gun that we use to check the temperature of the lotion 
and then we have our bow behind here then also we have our cleaning machine here that we use in the production of the lotion so as we continue we will see how the various ingredients will be combined to give you rich body lotion and cream our essential oils into our body lotion so we we'll measure the quantities that are needed so that is one and so we shall add the various oils we have to give us the best of our version. Launch just something to admire Cause you shine something like a mirror oh, 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 oh. See truth somewhere in your eyes. Ooh, I can't ever change without you. You reflect me, I love that about you. And if I could, I would look at us all the time. Whoa. Cause with your hand in my hand and a pocket full of soap, I could tell you there's no place we couldn't go. Just put your hand on the glass, I'll be trying to pull you through. Tomorrow 
Cause all of me loves all of you Love your curves and all your edges All your perfect imperfections Give your Give your all to me Give my all to you You're my end and my beginning Even when I lose, I'm winning Cause I give you all of me And you give me all I give you all of me And you give me all of you
It's been a long day without you, my friend. And I'll tell it's been 24 hours. I need more hours with you. You spent the weekend getting even. Ooh. We spent the late nights making things right between us. Now it's all good, babe. What I back would they let me close? Cause girls like you roll around with guys like me to sundown when I come through. I need a girl like you, yeah, yeah. Girls like you love fun and yeah, me do what I want when I come through. I need a girl like you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need a girl. Maybe I'm barely alive. Maybe you've taken my shit for the last time. Yeah. Maybe I know that I'm drunk. Maybe I know you're the one. Maybe I'm thinking it's better if you drive. Oh, cause girls like you run around with guys like me to sundown when I come through. I need a girl like you, yeah. Not too long ago, I was dancing for dollars. No, it's really rude if I let you meet my mama. You don't want a girl like me, I'm too crazy. But every other girl you meet is too gazy. I'm sure them other girls were nice enough. But you need someone to spice it up. So who you gonna call? Cardi, Cardi. Come and rev it up like a Harley, Harley. Why is the best food always forbidden? I'm coming to you now doing 20 over the limit. The red light, red light stops. I don't play when it comes to my heart. Let's get it though. I don't really want a white horse in a carriage. I'm thinking more white horses and carriage. I need you right here, cause every time you fall, I play with this kitty like you.
Cause most of it is true But it was all before I fell for you So please wait So please don't judge me And I won't judge you Cause it could get ugly Before it gets beautiful Please don't judge me And I won't judge you And if you love me let it be beautiful 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 Everything I say right now Is gonna be used in another fight And I've been through this so many times Can we change the subject? You're gonna start asking me questions like was she attractive? Was she an actress? Maybe the fact is You're hearing rumors about me I saw some pictures online Saying they got you so in Making you wish you were blind Before we start talking crazy Saying some things we'll regret Can we just slow it down and press we say service for my country and my planet. And that means saving the people I love and I care about. And that's what I do.
blush when somebody says your name In my stomach there's a pain See you walk in my direction, I go the other way I start to stutter when I speak Try to stand but my knees go weak What's happening to me? In the dark, can you tell me what it means? I lay my head on my pillow Staring out the window Wish I'm a star for a sign Hello everyone, let's settle down, we are starting in about a minute, the pitch contest, so let's settle down, let's see who is winning the $1,000 this afternoon, because we have another program, uh, the film festival taking place after the pitch contest, so please settle down, let's start the pitch contest. I think we have all our contestants seated, five. So we'll get down to it shortly.
change what they feel from what's been You may have put your whole life into a man Loving what you thought it could have been No rules when you change and you don't feel as good as you used to before And everything you used to say, everything you used to do Came right out the door Ooh, no more Hello everyone. So we are ready for the pitch contest. So please get seated because we are starting right about now. Remember I told you that this pitch contest is a second edition and is sponsored by Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Phi Pi Omega chapter. And it's giving away, they're giving away $1,000 to whoever emerges winner of today's contest now this is the criteria for presenting what your product or service is i'm sure the contestants are already familiar all women entrepreneurs must live in ghana all businesses must operate in ghana focus on the topic how will i use the money to pivot transform Were you 
Okay, she's right here. Thank you. And then our last contestant is Helena. Learn how to sew. So we have... Okay, she's joining us online. Helena is joining us online. So we'll hear from her shortly. So you have three minutes to present your ideas. And don't forget all that has been stated. You have to mention our sponsors so that we know who is giving what. On my list is Fafape. Fafape is starting, and she says she will need an aid to put to do her presentation. She need a table or a chair, so we'll just give her one chair. I wish you all the best, and may the best person win. So your three minutes starts now, Fafape. And, and our timekeeper is Jennifer. Jennifer, give us a wave. Good. And we have our judges as well. Okay. Right. All the best. Good afternoon, panel of judges. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fafafa Foy. I'm an accountant and the CEO of E90 Ghana Limited, a leading producer of mushrooms here in Ghana, hence the name The Mushroom Coin. I am pitching today to win the grand prize of 1,000 US dollars to help 20 underprivileged women that we have trained among 100 women as part of our corporate social responsibility. Mushrooms are superfoods that contain essential minerals, vitamins, and antioxidants such as selenium that help reduce diabetes, hypertension, and of course, cancer. Helping these women to establish their businesses will not only empower them, but will give us the opportunity to reduce environmental pollution since we use waste, which is sawdust, to produce mushrooms. Helping these women with a minimum return of 45% on um, the mushroom substrate will help empower them, empower their families, and empower the nation. Remember, a healthy nation is a wealthy nation. Thank you. So a round of applause for Fafafe, and I wish you all the best. All right, so let me now welcome Abigail Ewa, Abby's wand. It's okay. A round of applause for her as well. You have three minutes. Hey, hello, everyone, and good afternoon, the panel of judges. Um, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. This is a saying by one Frederick Douglass. My name is Abigail Bafo, the CEO of Abyss One Limited, a business dedicated to highlighting the beauty in women through makeup application and to empower through beauty education and coaching on grooming and appearance. I'm currently an HR practitioner with the BRC in Obwasi. Growing up, we are all expected to exit positive social skills, good grooming, great manners, as parents, as adults, as leaders. However, through interactions and interviews, I realized that not much intentional training have been given to our children to gain such skills. So this is where the Wonder Club comes in. The Wonder Club is an initiative, an upcoming initiative, that is targeting children from five to 15 years so that they will be able to exhibit positive social skills, good character traits, and the necessary soft skills to help them to be more responsible, productive, and also operate in their highest capacity. We are targeting parents and educational institutions who are interested in something more than 
academic excellence for the awards and students. With a monthly subscription of 50 CDs, we are looking at 2,000 CDs revenue per month and looking at the expenses we'll put in, which is rent and learning materials, communication and advertisements. We are projecting about 400 CDs. We are projecting about 400 CDs profit. Our team members include myself, Nanefia Bochichikata, who is an entrepreneur and owner of Bacnoff Schools, and Ebenezer Ferminsa, who is also an IT and a knowledge management personnel. What makes Wonder Club's focus group, which is, from, which is female and male children between 5 and 15 years, and we are keen on using repetitive and practical style of teaching and involving parents and teachers so that this won't be a one-off session but a lifestyle for these children. With $1,000, I'll be able to secure a larger meeting space, props and learning materials, and also enroll in a coaching program that will help me strategize as an entrepreneur and also navigate these youngsters into a brighter and more fulfilling future. This coaching advice I specifically took from a three-part webinar series organized by the Alpha Sorority Incorporated and the Five Pi Omega Chapter. Thank you. All the best, Abigail. Just know that if you exceed the three minutes, it will be deducted from your marks. So you will not be disqualified, but you will lose marks. Okay, so let's now uh, welcome, another round of applause for Abigail, by the way. Let's now welcome Dr. Juanita Luis. It's okay. It's okay. Let's welcome Dr. Juanita Luis. It's fine. Let's welcome her. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Juanita Lewis, and I am the CEO and founder of Crescendo Foods. It is Ghana's first culinary incubator based in Accra, Ghana. Um, so first, I'd like to say thank you to the Phi Pi Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated um, for giving me the opportunity to pitch my business. So Crescendo Foods is a culinary incubator where we are uh, supporting uh, food entrepreneurs at all stages. And the biggest thing to our organization is that we, are, um, give, we actually have shared commercial kitchen space so that if you're an entrepreneur, if you're trying to scale up, instead of paying the money and taking that risk, which usually costs you 100,000 USD, instead you can come to our organization where you can rent this commercial kitchen space and also be able to um, increase your productivity. As well as that, we provide business development, such as how to manage your business, um, also learning food side, where you're learning food safety, recipe development, as well as facilitating distribution to global markets. Why is this important? Because here in Ghana, as, long, as well as across the continent, um, these businesses do not have the opportunity to scale up because of access to finance and the ability to be able to um, afford this com commercial kitchen space. So with the Phi Pi Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, we can use this money to be able to build on our brand, which is one of the tips that they've stated in their videos. So part of our brand development is that we can use this money to be able to get a physical space here in Accra and to be able to offer entrepreneurs that share a commercial kitchen space so that they can enter global markets, be a part of AFTA, as well as be um, able to increase their productivity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for Dr. Luis Juanita Luis. Let's, let's now welcome uh, Madame Awawayi Mawenyega. She's not here. Okay, she's joining us via Zoom. Okay, so then let's welcome Helena Yebua. Helena is also not here. She'll be joining us. Okay. All right, so let me welcome you then. Please come. Introduce yourself. Okay, so in case I missed your name on the list. Please, my name is Solis Juliana Aja, CEO of Jesui Enterprise, located in Cape Coast, Ghana, and also a comment in the Volta region. The firm was registered in September 2015. And I'm here to pitch for 
body cream on the 26th October 2021 about the Jesui body cream. Producers of Jesui body cream is located in Adisada, Cape Coast, and Akome, Volta region as the annex. About the products, the body cream is a skin pomade which has been made to nourish and to moisturize the skin with vitamins to prevent wrinkling, aging, and skin diseases. The product has been on the market since 2020. I ventured into this body cream production looking at the weather conditions in Ghana and how some foreign products are bleaching the skin of some Ghanaians. However, just with body cream does not contain hydroquine. The product is of quality, affordable, portable, attractively packaged in containers and in two different fragrances and colors. It gives customers value for money. Active ingredients. We have settled alcohol, essential oils, fragrance, vitamin E, and shea butter. We have two varieties with sweet fragrance and cocoa fragrance. Target group. My target groups are children, adults, and those with sensitive skin. I'm here to supply in large quantities to the bigger markets. Financial status. My initial capital was 2,000 cities, which I used to buy equipment and raw materials in small quantities. The financial aid. I will be glad if I can get this 1,000 Ghana cities to enable me buy raw materials in bulk and purchase bigger cribbing machine and containers to expand the business. It's a sole proprietorship. Currently, I have one worker under me. Conclusion. The firm will augment the government efforts by creating jobs to a larger unemployed youth and enhance patronizing made in Ghana products. This is the way I produce and package it onto the market. And the video is what we are watching up there. Thank you very much. Okay, so our fifth contestant is not online. Helena was supposed to have joined us online. She is not. So we'll just go ahead. Our judges will put together the scores, and then we'll see who gets what. Okay, so all the best. So for those who are wondering, this project is by Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Phi Pi Omega Chapter. Uh, we are looking at a global women business pitch contest. We opened it for, uh, bid for people to put in their uh, videos on the 20th of sub September. So it was from 20th September to October 15. Uh, out of the lots, we were able to get five finalists you're seeing uh, so this is the second edition and this contest is to provide financial aid to women entrepreneurs in Ghana to help pivot and transform their businesses 
And also, the contest is partnered by Women of Africa Network, of course, Woya Bra Program, Amo Williams PALC, and Asankegua Unity Development. We'd like to say thank you to Dr. Adrienne Johnson, who is championing this round of applause for Dr. Adrienne Johnson. God bless you so much for your kind heart. And hopefully this $1,000 will change the lives of one of our lucky winners this afternoon. Fafafe is smiling. <laughs>
we do have a winner for our first important um, pitch. And the judges, um, three judges scoring over 50 for each um, candidate. And you have to take score. Okay. I wanted to go through. Um, so anyway, um, for each um, candidate, you were scored based on the concept, their creativity, and then uh, the business strategy that you presented. So our winner for this year's pitch contest is Miss Wainida um, for the Entrepreneur Kitchen. So. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for hanging with us today. It's been a very productive day. Um, we've gone from being inspired and also learning about the different aspect of enabling and capturing the entrepreneurial capacity of African women. We've heard from experts, we've heard from um, entrepreneurs, they've shared their experiences. So even as we live here today, we hope that it's not the end um, of the program. We have a WhatsApp page. If you are not on it, you need to see um, Audrey Viney, the one in that black, yellow, beautiful dress. Please see her so we can add you on the page. We're really looking forward um, to continue the conversation with all the speakers, with all the partners that we have. We are sincerely thankful, um, first to my colleagues, Etonam and Audrey, again, for their wonderful work done. We are, I'm so, so happy and privileged to have such wonderful women. I'm also very thankful for the um, Weyibra program, the Zetas, the Alpha Kappa sorority. And we're thankful also for our sponsors, including APSA Bank, um, we have been engaging with Mrs. Ak um, Abaka, and she has clearly shown and indicated that APSA is ready not to be um, just a bank in the region, but they are ready to move forward and join in the global championing of women entrepreneurs. And today she shared some ideas with us. So if I have a business here in Ghana and I'm not banking, APSA is where I'm going to. So I hope that those who are not banked yet, or even consider your relationship with the existing bank and join our um, APSA. We are also thankful for Sarah, um, who is always readily available to share her expertise with us. Um, I know when people see lawyers, they think they need to pay a lot of money. Um, please approach her. 
and get the knowledge. You don't want your invention to uh, something that could easily be taken away. Uh, Mrs. Beatrice Chater, thank you so much from the AFTA Secretariat. I know that you all at the Secretariat are very busy um, trying to get things moving. So thank you for spending the whole day with us. And our regards to all your colleagues um, and the work that you are doing. And then, hmm, the thing about giving thanks is you forget somebody and then it's a problem. So if I forgot you, it's not intentional really. Um, all the travelers who came to pitch, especially Solid, who traveled all the way from Cape Coast, it's really a pleasure to meet you and we hope that you will stay in touch with us. And for my colleagues from Amo Williams who traveled from the United States with me as well, I'm thankful and grateful to um, share practice with you all. All of you, thank you for coming. Um, Mr. Clinton from the back as well who has been hanging with us, um, also coming from the US, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, continue to follow us on our social media and then join our WhatsApp pages. And we look forward to the next edition of the Women in Trade Forum. And we are hoping that during that time, it will be one success story after another, after another. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. So, um, we also want to say thank you to Joyce for being an amazing leader. I mean, from day one, from Audrey and us and all of us, we want to say thank you to you. Do you need a hug right now because you're shaking? <laughs> So thank you, Joyce. She's resilient, and she's been talking about support for women from day one since the Women of Africa Network was formed. We are a year old. I want to say thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce, for God bless you. You know, even in the U.S., you keep in touch, and you keep, you're, you're, you're ensuring that everything was going to, yeah, yeah, 4 a.m., and she's up. Audrey, continue. No, I'd just like to echo that because Joyce has been fantastic. She said 4 a.m. Um, and she laughed, but it's true. I have called her at 4 a.m. in the morning before and she's always up. She's always willing. She puts in the time. She's supportive. She has passion for what she does. So, um, and she's been instrumental in making this a success as well. So please join us in thanking her from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. God bless you. And thank you all so much as well. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a film festival right about now. So please don't leave. Uh, don't forget that this is buy Ghana, wear Ghana, watch Ghana. We are patronizing Made in Ghana. So it's the film festival. It's starting right now. It says 3 p.m. So you're just 21 minutes behind time. That was because they were waiting for us. So please don't go away. Let's all be part of the film festival. And thank you once again. God bless you all. Bye-bye.
constant friend that fills my cell. Oh, that woman. With a smile and a style, she'll protect you like a child. That's a woman. One, two, one, two. All right. Uh, good evening. All the presidential pitch series um, candidates, if we can have you up here and seated in front here, if you're part of the 25 finalists for the presidential film pitch series, let's see you here. You take a seat right in front with us here. So you're closer to the stage. Thank you. All presidential pitch series participants up here. There are seats right next to me on the left, so you can be seated. Uh, all those here for the NFA showcase, there are seats in front. Feel free to take a seat, please. There are empty seats around as well. Just grab one and have a seat. We'll begin in the next five minutes.
right, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for staying with us and being here today. I think this is going to be the funnest part of, you know, the whole conference that you've been having. Um, we at the National Film Authority really believe that the one and surest way of, you know, projecting unity and promoting trade amongst countries in Africa is through the beauty of arts. And smack in the middle of arts, you have film. And that's where the National Film Authority comes in. The National Film Authority is an agency mandated by the government to regulate, help develop, and push the film ecosystem here in Ghana. So the next few hours are dedicated to showing uh, you delegates who are here and all the other participants reasons why our film can be a pivotal part of what we seek to achieve with AFTA. Uh, my name is Antoine Mensa. I'm going to be uh, one of your coordinators and MCs here. I'll be aided by Godwin, who will join me here in a bit. Uh, but before we kick off, I'd like to call on one of my colleagues, Mr. Daniel Amwating, uh, to kick off with an opening prayer. So, Mr. Daniel, a round of applause for him as he comes up, please. Hello. Uh, in reverence to God, can we be on our feet that we share a word of prayer? Father God, we thank you for today. It is you that have brought us together today. And so we want to thank you. We live in this day because it's not by accident. It is you that have ordained that this day will be celebrated like this. Thank you for AFTA, thank you for NFA, and thank you for all the persons that are here. That whatever we are doing today or whatever we started yesterday, it will be success. We commit every activity, including that of this evening, into your hands. And we ask that lead us, guide us, that at the end of it all, we shall give you all the praise and adoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Daniel. Uh, so just a quick overview of how the next few hours are going to go. Uh, like I said, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun, but we're going to have a serious tone as well to it. We have three major panel discussions uh, that will take you through and give you a good idea of what the film industry in like, is like in Ghana, you know, where it came from, where it's at now, and where we are going. Uh, the second part is we're going to be doing a lot of film shows. Now, all of these films are very short, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And hopefully that gives you something to look forward to. So during the film shows, the lights are going to go off and you'll get to enjoy a lot of the product, um, the talent uh, and the skill that Ghana's film industry has um, ready in store for the rest of the world. So we're going to start off um, with our you know, sort of like opening video, you know, which features the president of this country, His Excellency Nana Adodankwe Kufo Ado. And uh, this is just to make a statement and show just how much support we have um, from the government. So it's not only the private sector, but you have the government uh, solidly involved and solidly behind all the initiatives and the projects that the National Film Authority has embarked on. Uh, greetings to all those who are watching us via Zoom. Uh, do stay with us, share the link with you know, colleagues and friends. Uh, this is the beginning of the National Film Authority Showcase. And uh, if the video team is ready in the back, shall we have the video? Ghana is a beautiful country. There is so much of it you probably haven't seen haven't experienced, haven't touched, haven't felt, haven't eaten. Let's discover our land again with new eyes. Let's feel each other again. We are one people brought together by destiny. Let's make that count. Let's show love for each other and our environment. Let's tell our stories. And let's watch and listen to our stories. There will be so much to tell. At the center of the world is a country where the sun shines on all 365 days of the year. A country where gold moves beneath the ground, capturing the stories of our kings and queens above. A country with the best chocolate. Come experience castles and forts built on the dreams 
dreams, aspirations, and sweat of a people full of dignity. Beneath the deep blue skies, follow the stars and let them take you on a journey of our people to the ends of the world through our rich culture, through film. The Black Star is calling Aquaba. I am Nana Adudankwe Kufuadu, and I'm the humble but proud president of the country at the center of the world, Ghana. God bless a homeland, Ghana. Wonderful feature. Round of applause. So the National Film Authority does have the full backing of the presidency in a lot of our projects. Uh, the NFA is very inclusive at the head of the leadership. Um, we have some of our very own, you know, actors and actresses, you know, producers, writers who've been through, you know, the whole journey of, of, of you know, the whole journey that's involved in, in film in Ghana, you know, from the bottom to the top. And one of such actresses is the CEO of the National Film Authority herself. Uh, she's in Dubai right now, um, you know, representing Ghana at one of the film expos there. Um, so she couldn't be with us, but she did send a video. So we're going to hear from the CEO of the National Film Authority, Miss Juliet Ya Asantewa Asante. <laughs> Hello everyone, you're welcome to the Africa Globalized Investment Forum. The National Film Authority is proud and honored to be participating in this forum and we want to use the opportunity to say thank you to the organizers. We want to also take the opportunity to welcome all our guests to today's forum. We have a great panel session to tell you about everything we've been doing in the film sector. Film offers a great vehicle for a return on investment, for attracting investment into the country, as you know, foreign direct investment. But what is even more exciting is that film also offers a great vehicle for creating jobs. And for that reason, this is an exciting journey that we are on, especially in the country where we do need to create jobs. Also, film is a vehicle for a good return on investment. For that reason, we are excited to be here today to present to you the many programs that the National Film Authority has been working on together with the stakeholder community. Today you'll be hearing about the Presidential Film Pitch Series. The Presidential Film Pitch Series brings you the opportunity to invest in great projects, not only in film, but in the film ecosystem. We hope that one of these projects at least may appeal to you. You can learn about the Wiki Project. You can learn about the script bank. You can learn about mapping Ghana. And most importantly, we are here today to talk about the Presidential Film Pitch Series and what opportunities there are in there. Traditionally, we haven't seen film as an export, but film can be an export. Call it a non-traditional export if you may, but an export nonetheless. Film has the potential to create over 20 million jobs and bring to Africa over 20 billion. How are we taking advantage of this? As an investor, where is the opportunity for you? And how can you take part in this very lucrative opportunity and business? The National Film Authority is a government agency under the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture, set up to help streamline the sector to serve you better. We have stakeholders here today that you can speak to. We have people with great products that you can look at. We have people exhibiting products all over the summit this number of days. And we invite you to take advantage of the opportunity to learn more about the film sector and the great things that we are doing. The National Film Authority is working to situate Ghana as a film hub what this means that if anyone around the world wants to shoot a film or do a co-production, we do hope that they will take a flight to Ghana. The question to ask yourself is, what are the opportunities in the ecosystem? Is it infrastructure? Is it product? What is it that you like to do? Whatever you're interested in, this summit is here 
to present those to you. We thank you. We wish you a great summit and we hope that we'll get a mail from you. Send us a mail at info at nfa.gov.gh. Thank you. A round of applause for the CEO of the National Film Authority. That's Miss Juliet Yasanto Asante. She was very excited about this, would love to be here. But as I mentioned, there's another expo in Dubai. And who better to represent Ghana um, than, you know, Madam Juliet herself. So she's there. And she, she said what we're here for, just to ascertain the fact that if there's any tool um, that could be used and harnessed to push the vision and the goal of AFTA. It's definitely through film, it's through the potential of documentaries, telling our stories, inspiring the younger ones, telling our stories to the rest of the world. Uh, moving on, one of the key pillars of the projects that we've initiated in the last two years is the Presidential Film Pitch Series. The NFA is passionate about developing younger talents, offering them the opportunity to get investment they need to make their dreams come true, to tell the stories that need to be told, to create jobs, and you know, help propel the economy uh, to where it should be through the power of film. So, um, to moderate this panel, I'm going to call on a young filmmaker himself. He's also an actor. For those of you who've been watching Dede most recently, he's a prominent part of the Dede film series, which shows on Africa Magic. In the film, he's known as Patrick. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Godwin Nambo, who will then call the four participants of the National Film Pitch Series who are here with us today. Godwin, welcome. A round of applause as he comes up. Thank you very much, Antoine. When your boss introduces you like this, it's so much pressure. It's my boss at work. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think Antoine has said a lot already by way of introduction, so I wouldn't say much. Uh, but uh, that's you guys. Uh, thank you so much for making our time to join us here. It's an August occasion, and we'll jump straight into it. Like Antoine said, uh, one thing has brought us all together here, and it is creative arts, to be more specific, film. A beautiful art form that uh, employs millions of people worldwide with a total revenue globally of $41.7 billion. I want my share of that money. I'm sure you do too. Now, speaking of the presidential pitch series, um, some few months ago, the president to the Ministry of Tourism, Creative Arts and uh, Culture introduced or launched the presidential pitch series, which sought to uh, create a platform for Ghanaian filmmakers to engage with sponsors, uh, broadcasters, investors from all around the world for potential opportunities. And 25 participants uh, were shortlisted out of the 100 projects received by the National Film Authority, $25 million. Woof. So um, this afternoon, we are going to have just randomly selected people from the 25 to share with us their journey, their story, and show us snippets of what they've made. And without much I say or do, I'd like to invite the following people. Um, if you could join us here, please, and please do so with a round of applause when I mention your names. Thank you. Mysteries of the Golden Stool. Mysteries of the Golden Stool. There we go. Kofi Young. Kofi Young. If you could join us, just sit here for me. I'll call the rest of the people and then we'll come on stage. Then we have the Thousand Kilometer Per Love. I love this title. <laughs> thousand Kilometer Per Love, please. A round of applause. I'm excited to know what that means. <laughs> there is also Heroes of the Past. Heroes of the Past, please. A round of applause. And then you have I Have a Voice. I Have a Voice by Kofi Che. Gentlemen, thank you. So now I'll have all four gentlemen on stage, please. Please. Okay, so I'll be here. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you. This is going to be a panel discussion. And of course, 
as I mentioned, we'll start off with the mysteries of the golden stool. Mysteries of the golden stool. And I have Kofi Young. Kofi, I want to believe, is the director, producer, or writer? Yes. Um, I, I wrote the story. And um, originally, I started with the screenplay. Mm. After finishing the screenplay, I realized the budget was so heavy that I don't <laughs> think I can raise the money to do it. Ah. So I converted it into a book. Into a book. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. A round of applause for... So the book is available if you want to know the story. More often, we, we get books before the story, uh, mm. the, the movies. But I started with the movie before the, the, the book. book. But then, um, along the line, it's been very, very uh, um, challenging looking at the, the industry as it is. It's, I started my work with movies from the 80s. Wow. Started with uh, VHS videos. And fortunately, I got one of my movies I, I, I produced um, with Nana King in 1991. And I presented it at Fespaco. VHS movie. That was the first Ghanaian movie on VHS to be accepted at First Fest Fespaco. That's amazing. Please do well to clap your hands when you hear these things. Thank and in you. In fact, they did, they did not even accept movies on VHS from anywhere. Any other country. Unless it's on Betacam or, or um, Umatic or film. That is the minimum for television. Mm. But I was able to get my, my movie there. Fortunately, the few people who saw those clips uh, said the quality was, uh, was not uh, to the kind of that they were looking for, but that the story was very good and everybody was encouraging that we should shoot it in a better format. But looking at it, filmmaking has always been a problem with us. Film financing, as I always say, is a filmmaker's nightmare. To be able to raise minimum of uh, two million dollars to do a, a good production, you, 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 you can't easily get it. Interesting. And that's why we'll have a panel discussion later on, on exploring investment op opportunities in the film sector in Ghana. But for the sake of time, what we'll do is we're going to preview uh, the mysteries of the Golden Stool and we'll come back and have a quick conversation with you. Right. So if we may, please. Changing the paradigm, telling our story our own way. Mysteries of the Golden Stool. Fiction, fantasy, adventure, historic of the Ashanti Kingdom and the Golden Stool. It elucidates a cosmopolitan academic, Kofinsia, who finds love and turns an unwilling hero as he defends his heritage when a thief of ancient relics, Abdul Ali, whose decision to steal the Golden Stool of the Asantes sets into motion a thrilling fantasy battle with the departed kings of Asante in a tomb where the kings are buried and the Golden Stool is kept. This is a thriller, authentic Kenyan story, extensively covering the history and tradition and culture of the Ashanti people and the celebration of the Golden Stool in a festival they call Akwesida. Plot is full of suspense, action. Fist fights, gun fights, explosions, crash, aircraft crash, adventure, forest run, thrilling battle in the ancient tomb with the kings, drill of a tunnel, there's romance, there is humor, there's so much that you have to see. As a creative director of Mysteries of the Golden Stool, I am assisted by Abe Kwakwa, line production. Danny Dama, Art Direction, Michael Monkwafu, Cinematography, John Passa, and Kofi Asante, Production Secretary, Celestine Suma. These are the local professionals I am working with. This is an Ernest Nsien Youngman film, an adaptation from the published book, Mysteries of the Golden Stool. Spot on, spot on, Mr. Kofi Young. I mean, these are areas that usually filmmakers don't like to touch. Uh, we've always prayed that, you know, these 
Westerners who will not come and tell these stories for us. So it's exciting to know that you're exploring uh, stories like this. But what was the inspiration for you? Why touch such a story that has been handed over to us mainly by oral tradition? We don't do our own movies. We always try to copy what other people are, people are doing. And if we look at our stories, and we have such a rich history, tradition, culture, that we are not turning them into movies. We are interested in the, uh, Indian movies far back as the 50s when Indian movies had come to Ghana. People don't even understand the language, but they love them because they do them well. Why can't we do our movies the same way? We see Indiana Jones, uh, uh, James Bond movies. Why can't we do our movies on that level? That was the inspiration that hit me. Right. And I, 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 I picked the, the story from a simple idea. They came, planted our, our land for everything that we had. After taking everything, now our culture that we have here too, they want to come and take it away. Mm. And what do we do? <laughs> do we stop them? Mm. And how did we stop them? And we know we can write so much about it. The Ashanti history, the several wars that they fought, there are several stories that are written about them, our people, tradition, culture. We don't tell them ourselves. Why must we wait for a white man to come and tell our story for us? If you go back into history, the record of our history had always been written by uh, 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 Westerners who came here and saw what we did. Although we have our history, oral history, Unfortunately, we had not put them down for people to see. So this is a, an avenue for us now to see if we can tell the world our story. I read something just yesterday. Somebody in Belgium, in fact, I, it was a video I watched on, on, on uh, Facebook. A lady talking about what they did to, the Belgium did to Congo. If you go to the Belgium curriculum today, they don't teach that to the, the Belgian children. But that is the history that they created in Africa. Mm. If we wait for them, they won't tell the people what our story is. Absolutely. So we must tell the people what our story, our own way, with our writers and filmmakers. If you look at productions that they are doing, right now we're using cameras. If I look at them, I see, I see them as toys. But go to their studios and see the kind of productions that they are doing. When we make our films, they limit us to a particular range of distribution. We must move beyond that. Interesting. This is where I want film enthusiasts and film financiers to look at production at a level where the distribution should also look at production from uh, what, uh, Hollywood or anywhere else. Mm. So that we don't limit ourselves to the small camera productions just to entertain ourselves. Otherwise, we won't go anywhere. It's interesting that you say, there's a saying that, hopefully I quote it well, that until the lion learns to tell its story, the story always what glorify the hunter. Oh, Indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Kofi Young. And a round of applause for him, please. Mysteries of the Golden Stool. Uh, moving on, we have Thousand Kilometer Per Love, a title I'm very interested in. Uh, Kojo Kisi. Yes, sir. So uh, tell us briefly about yourself. Okay, so... Um, I, briefly. I, briefly. I'm just um, a filmmaker and um, communication specialist, basically. Um, that's why I would say I have so much love for film and media arts, and I find purpose, um, God-inspired purpose mm. in film and media arts. Awesome. Basically. So now let's take a quick look at 1,000 Kilometer Per Love, and then we'll come back and have this conversation. Thousands of people migrate to other neighboring countries to find temporary jobs. Most Ghanaians say the presence of these beggars is a nuisance. In an event of simultaneous terrorist attacks across all 15 West African capitals, the mission of justice of this young Nigerian refugee who is sent to attack Accra at a presidential event is about to hit the rocks. It's in jeopardy. Why? Because the only person who ever showed him love in the city, the teen daughter of the UK High Commissioner, out of nowhere, boom, 
appears on the stage in a ballet performance. It's a story about the Pan-Africanist and the challenges affecting African societies. I'm excited to be one of the team members of an African movie that includes a teamwork with a number of filmmakers from all Africa, which is one of my dreams. Would he follow his conviction and carry out his revenge on this society which scorned him and rejected him and his family? Or will love come in to save the day? Or actually, will love come in to make all things worse? Thousand kilometers per love. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm with which you are clapping. Um, thousand kilometers per love, I think I understand now. Yeah. Chance yeah. African movie, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. The thousand is because um, it's not the story of the Nigerian refugee. Um, one of these, you know the kids, the kids who beg on the streets, yeah. especially on Accra, more, we always kick them away. So one of them is radicalized to suicide bomb a presidential event in Accra. And a distance from Niamey, Niger, to Accra is just a little over a thousand kilometers. Mm. And then Love, which sets his mission of justice in jeopardy. So that's where the title kind of came from. Wow. A thousand kilometers per love, kind of. Interesting. Yeah. And this inspiration came from... Okay, so it came um, how many years ago? Uh, about seven years ago, in 2014, 2013, 2014, I was working the streets, going back and forth to work. And I was asking myself, these kids are on the streets. Who is taking care of them? Where's the social welfare? Where's the history of gender and social protection. Why do we allow the parents of these children to traffic them on the streets? Nobody's taking them to school. No, the government is not, we have basic, free basic education. Who is instilling that these children must go to school? Nobody is. So, and that That was around the time when terrorist attacks were being reported, especially across the sub-region. And I asked myself, what if one of these vulnerable children are radicalized? Their innocence is, is, is kind of taken advantage of, radicalized to hit back at us. Because when we fail our contract with our poor and our vulnerable, there's a price to pay. So that's where this idea came from, to tell the story of these people. A very good question you asked yourself, and very timely. And how did you um, collaborate with these? Because I saw an Egyptian producer, someone else from another country. How did you bring them together? OK, so um, these are friends. I'm asking this because, sorry to catch you, yeah. because Ghanaians are known not to, especially filmmakers, don't like to collaborate even among themselves. So to see you collaborating with other people, again, why didn't you collaborate with Ghanaian? Okay, so um, we're not done with building the entire team yet. Okay. Of course, these are, um, would I say, the core people that I had um, readily interested in the project to work with. Um, of course, there will be other Ghanaian collaborators. The main crew and other people would mainly be Ghanaians. But I'm Pan-Africanist to the core, maybe to a fault. Mm. And I believe that, you know, Piracy against the African is an entire global setup, which transcends, it goes beyond your being Ghanaian, it goes beyond my being Akan, it goes beyond your being Eve or Ga. It is a conspiracy against African people and all persons with color, economically, politically, socially. And until we rise up above our tribal and our national sentiment, we can't move far. And for me, so it's very important for me that in everything I do, especially in storytelling, I tell it from a Pan-African perspective and I collaborate with other Pan-Africans. So this particular, these people were folks that I met at um, a young African filmmaker's workshop in Egypt with Haile Garima. And so the network has been there. This was in 2017 and we've, we've kept in contact, we keep chatting, and we're always trying to find ways to collaborate on the African continent widely. Ladies and gentlemen, Kojo Kisi for president, please. <laughs> A round of applause for him, please. We'll quickly move on to Heroes of the Past. That is Jesse Sunkwa Mills, Heroes of the Past. Jesse? Hi, sir. Quick one about yourself, briefly, please. All right. So, yes, I'm Jesse Sunkwa Mills, CEO and creative director. Of Speak up for us, please. Sorry? Filmmaker. Speak up for us. 
I'm the creative director of Mills Media. We're a creative firm. Um, I'm a creative artist, an animator, and film enthusiast as well. And why did you decide to be part of, part of the presidential pitch series? I think when, when it came out. The out money, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Anyway, so let's check out your movie, it's Heroes of the Past, briefly, and come back. never leave this kingdom. Neither should anyone ever sit on it. Heed my warning and guard the stool with your life. Is it fun? <laughs> yes. Just super strong. Yes. I made it. I should make some good for you to see where you are going to. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Wow. <laughs> My goodness. Clearly, the government, together with the National Film Authority, are onto something 
with this film pitch series, and it's exciting. Now, um, Jesse Sunkwa Mills. Hi, sir. I'm getting this <laughs> transmedia storytelling vibe from you. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. I yeah. saw, if I'm right, yeah. aside the film, or aside the animation, yeah. I also saw a comic. It's a comic book, a video game, and an animated series. Ladies and gentlemen, please, one more time. <laughs> So since we didn't see you talk, tell us briefly about this project. Okay, so I was trying to do a little, just less talking, that's why the video had to do all that, but um, the whole inspiration behind A Heroes of the Past was the, 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 we, we were looking to sort of retell and to relive the stories of our past great men and women who we see to be our very own superheroes, just like you have in the Western world, like the Supermans and the Batman and all of that. But what makes our story unique is the fact that these people actually lived. They weren't, you know, created by someone else's imagination. And we felt that um, our people, especially the younger generation, were sort of losing touch of our own culture and our heritage as a people. Because um, it's unfortunate, but our culture seems to be seen as somewhat fetish mm -hmm. and outmoded and all of that. So we sought to use in art and technology that's through comics, animation, and video games to make our culture a lot more fun and exciting to sort of kind of repackage it and to make the younger generation a lot more interested in it and we want to associate with it, yeah. Wow, wonderful. And, and might I add that it is not fiction. These are real stories that we exactly, know about. Yes, yes. Unlike Superman that we know is fiction yes, and the rest. This, yes. These are true stories. Now how, I'm sure the Ashantis here are very proud of themselves. <laughs> Ashantis are very proud of these stories. <laughs> um, you know, how challenging has it been for you? Well, very challenging. And I'm sure when you hear the rest of my colleagues speak, you'd find that a common thing runs through, and that's, um, it has to do with funding. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, but the whole, just to put uh, this across, we're not just telling a Santua story, and that's it. So just as the, the, the captions suggest, heroes of the past, we're telling. We're, we're looking at, at a point, having like a pantheon of, you know, superheroes and gods, so from every region. So there's, from Ashanti, we're telling the story of Yas Antwa. We're going to the north, we're going to the west, everywhere. So at some point, you have all these heroes coming together, you know, to make everything great. But yes, back to the challenges. It mainly has to do with um, funding, because trust me, we have what it takes to put out great content, you know. so. I would say that's like the number one, you know, main challenge for us. Yeah. Indeed. And let me pick your mind quickly and ask you, do you think after years and years of consuming Western culture and Western products, would you say that the market is ready here for these content? Oh, yes, exactly. Um, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but even the Western world are now rushing down to Africa to pick our content. Yeah. And you would find that a lot more Africans are now interested in, you know, African content. You can go on people's YouTubes right now and you see that they have subscribed to lots of African channels and they are watching African content. So yes, exactly. We, they, they are welcome. They're ready for that. Yes. And when we're able to put out a lot more content, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll be where we have to be as, you know, a wonderful powerhouse. Thank you very much. Jesse Sunkwa Mills, ladies and gentlemen, one more time for him. And last but not the least, we have um, Kofi Che. Kofi Che, I know very well, with I Have a Voice. Che, briefly about yourself, and then we check out your project. Uh, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, obviously. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm also a nurse by profession. What? A nurse. A nurse by Wonderful. profession. Yeah, I, I didn't get the chance to attend film school, but I didn't want... Uh, I don't want to give up my dream of being a filmmaker, even without me having to attend film school. So I took other avenues, uh, random tutorials from the internet and other stuff. I just, I guess that's that got us That's here. it. Yeah. Okay, Kofi. Uh, can we check out I Have a Voice, please? Hi. The title of my film project is I Have a Voice. It is the story about a young teenage boy who is deaf and dumb but aspires to be a rapper. I am Kofi J, a self-taught filmmaker and a nurse by profession. I love film and art and something inside me just wouldn't allow me to give up my dream of being a filmmaker 
simply because I didn't attend film school. I taught myself filmmaking with random tutorials from the internet, practicing every chance I got and experimenting on new techniques and ideas for years. Aside the fact that I love film and art, I make movies to educate, entertain and possibly change the status quo of some health challenges we face in our society by filming stories about the silent minority. Although I have two successful feature films under my belt, I don't think I would have been able to make this film project just yet without the help of the National Film Authority's pitch series. I wouldn't have been able to get this opportunity and I'm really grateful for it. Medamasi. Once again, my story is about a young teenage boy who is deaf and dumb but aspires to be a rapper. I wanted to write a story about this minority where we can get to tell their story from their perspective. The diversity of this story is going to give everyone an insight into how life just might be for people who have this disability they did not choose to be born with. My vision for this project is to give a chance to people who are not always in the room when we have a conversation. Give them the platform to get their stories told. Give them the chance to show what life is on the other side. Give them a voice. I want this film to have a worldwide reach because not only does it depict the subject matter, but it will also give a little insight into aspects of our culture that the outside media does not show. And people can understand the world we live in. I have a voice by Kofi Che. Awesome. Now, Kofi, <laughs> telling a story of the minority, telling a story about persons living with disability has been a long time coming. And I want to say that we're all excited to know that you're doing this. What is your ultimate goal with this particular story? Um, my, my goal is to tell a story we are not actually used to because we have some of these people living amongst us and sometimes I try to put myself in some of uh, the shoes of some of them and how their life might be. I got this whole inspiration for this story through a random video on YouTube where there was uh, a, an actual a US rapper on stage and behind him or behind, yeah, next to him was uh, a deaf and dumb interpreter who was interpreting for the deaf audience. So it struck me, what if there was an actual deaf and dumb person in the crowd whose dream was to also be on that stage one day as a musician or as a performer? What kind of, what, what's, how would they live that dream? How would it come to pass? Mm. So that's how I got the inspiration and then I came up with, I have a voice. Interesting. Jet. Kofi, thank you very much. Uh, because of time, we're going to move very quickly now. Thank you all, gentlemen. But in wrapping this conversation, I just want to ask you guys briefly, one minute each, how you think your individual movies is going to impact us, uh, impact the country, impact anybody who sees it, briefly. Yeah, uh, I think this, this, pro this film project will have uh, a worldwide reach because it's quite relatable and it's not like the everyday story we get to see. And I think with the right funding and the right amount of publicity, we can get there because there are subpar films that have gotten up there. And I think we can raise the bar up a bit more. Thank you very much, Kofi Che. Um, yes, Jesse, quickly. Okay, all right. So just with our project, like you saw... Jesse, please speak out for us. Please. Sorry. <laughs> Our main focus has to do with the younger generation because we feel if they embrace our culture very well, then we have a brighter future as a country and as a continent. So, yeah, that's the sort of impact we are looking to, you know, create with this project. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Young. We have films that will change Africa mm. in terms of business, jobs, and uh, cultural identity. But if we don't get a supporting funding, we won't get anywhere. Take one D, one F program that the government of Ghana is doing. There are factories, if they had not gotten the funding, they would have not been on the scene. Interesting. 
every firm is like a project. It's like a factory. You can imagine the number of people who will be employed by the firm. The product, the sales, is a exportable product. So if every project is looked at from that perspective and given the necessary funding, you can imagine if all these 25 movies that have been listed in this presidential pitch have been given the money to produce, we will have 25 movies circulating in the world today. Mm. And this is the challenge that we want to put to the financiers, government and people of Africa who want to support filmmaking, that we should not just talk. There is money there, we know. If we don't get the money to make the movies, we can't get the money there. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Young. And lastly, you, could you? Um, okay, so I think Mr. Young has <laughs> said everything. I'm not sure what to say, but um, what I'll say is, particularly with, with this film, Thousand Kilometers Per Love, of course, the entire project, but the four quadrant approach, which Hollywood uses, is make um, films of, let's say, American set, American interest, but then it has interest, a, a global appeal. That is what this film seeks to do, and that is what I see in all the other projects selected by the NFA. And like he rightly said, when we're able to harness the right kind of funding, only God knows what the future holds. Some years back, we are here today complaining about the mistakes we made some years back, which has made our industry falling. If we are here today, we are only five years, ten years away from looking back and blaming ourselves. This is the time to do something, to put together resources, and this will create jobs for young folks. That's a national security threat, unemployment. Film will create jobs for young people. Let's do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And like the finance minister said, <laughs> like the finance minister said, Ken Ophirata said, uh, we need to create more entrepreneurs, and these young entrepreneurs are doing amazingly well. They need your help to employ people. They need your help to tell the Ghanaian story. Ladies and gentlemen, over to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. A round of applause for them as they go off stage. And I'd like to remind each and every one of you that they are, you know, their films are ready for your money. Your, their films are ready for investment. So in case you are interested in any of the movies, the films you just saw, you can approach the National Film Authority. We have a table behind there and start up a conversation with us. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Ivan Kwashiga. He's actually the chairperson of the committee that, you know, chaired and put together the, Nas the presidential pitch film series. So a round of applause. If you can please get up so they can all see you. Yes. And I did mention that there are 25 films. The four you, you just saw on stage are just four out of the 25. So we have a short video we're going to play to give you an idea of what the whole process was like, what these filmmakers had to go through uh, to come out successful as they are. So if the film is ready, let's uh, see it. pitch series selection committee are behind me and they are deliberating. They had about a hundred pitches from all over Ghana. Now I don't envy them, so I'm gonna leave them as they work. The National Film Authority uh, uh, pitch series, the whole idea is to provide filmmakers in Ghana the opportunity to present their ideas so that those ideas can be brought to people that have funding that can um, support them to, to achieve their dreams. And so I am expecting to see uh, entries that are of a certain quality, that presents the Ghanaian film story at a certain level, that um, will be very positive uh, not the usual cliché uh, stories of negative Af uh, I mean, uh, views of Africa, uh, uh, stories that would interest the rest of the world, that would draw people's attention to Ghana, and also to present the fact that we are of age, 
the Ghanaian filmmaker is ready and is able to produce content that would uh, marvel the rest of the world. I, I'm not even sure what to say because for me, um, this is instructive of where Ghana is going. The mere fact that there's been some partnership that has actually ignited a wave of interest to the extent that young people have been given the space and the stage to show their creativity. The rich Ghanaian arts and film industry once again comes into the spotlight as the NFA and partners create an enabling environment for investors to access content from Ghana. As a business, our focus is to bring the best mix of local and international content to the homes and hands of our customers. There's a widely held belief that all human beings are born entrepreneurs because the will to create is in our blood, our very DNA. Today, a group of entrepreneurs in the film industry will get to showcase their ingenuity and business acumen to the world. This is exciting for me because this is a project that is so close to my heart and the heart of the entire team. Why do I say this? Um, I mean, as filmmakers, we are very good with imagination. So as far as I'm concerned, everyone who is sitting in this room today, you have a project that is likely or has possibilities of taking Ghana to the next stage. So if I close my mind's eye, all 25 of the projects that we have equal potential. Now, equal potential uh, to do what? Equal potential to get sponsors, to get investors, to get distribution, to get everything, and to go out there and to tell the Ghanaian story. Um, I think I'm a bit pleased because for some time you've been worried about the direction of development of the film industry in Ghana. Other African countries are not waiting for us. And now we have to get on our game, seriously. But with what the NFA is doing in terms of training, uh, in terms of pitching sessions, uh, to look for funding for projects that are happening and so on, uh, in terms of the way people are receiving what is going on. I think I'm beginning to realize that there's a certain vibe, a certain chemistry that's beginning to develop that says, hey, we have to take our industry seriously. Maybe we need to learn a bit more. This, we're about to announce 25 um, projects that have made it to this stage of our, our pitch series. Where is your money going to go in this pitch series? Me, I, I should direct. <laughs> I'm waiting to see the winners, you know? Uh, so first of all, this is an honor to follow my brother, Honorable Yofi Grant. I've known him for many, many decades. And uh, we both are big photographers and lovers of the arts and supporters of culture. I think without a story, people, you know, we don't understand who we are, or where we're going. There is nothing more important than telling our own stories. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to cross uh, and, and invite five of our special guests here to actually announce the 25 projects. And uh, I think we'll start off with the chairman himself of the selection committee, Mr. Ivan Kwashiga. The first five of the 25 are going straight. Um, the first of the 25 um, is a project called Baba Bongo. Bukum, Choices, the Republic versus a woman's instinct. A dream to die for. Heroes of the past. And then the next one is Casting Africa. Thousand kilometers slash love. Tutu. I'm becoming. Whitefish. Film tourism. Destination Ghana. Equaba. We too. She. Private eye. Bosom Pim. Adam the first. I grow. Agriculture documentary. Missing. My Cape Coast love. Mofa Channel, Sally Fudagati, I have a voice. It's mysteries of the Golden Stew. 
Ladies and gentlemen, that's the 25 selected for the next stage. Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, round of applause for the team and the National Film Authority. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following uh, person. International, our international guest, Mr. Keith Clinton of the KCA, KCI and Group USA. Mr. Keith Clinton, uh, if you're here, uh, just a, a wave so everyone can see you. And uh, hopefully we will hear from him uh, real soon. Uh, we're getting ready to go to the next panel session. But before that, like we said, today is also a movie night for you all because we want to show you the quality of Ghanaian movies we have. So uh, right now, we're going to show one of the short films. It's only five minutes. It's called Enim Gwase by uh, Kobna de Graaf. Uh, Enim Gwase, uh, in English translation, is basically shame. So right after this, we'll continue with the next panel discussion. Well, video team, if you're ready, ladies and gentlemen, our short film, the very first one for this evening. Pull us all together. A bit a woe, not still a school. I mean, ye name them from Donawaba. When ye say we ain't a bed and a big home, anything is fucking easy. What me again, and you remember it, Fidel? Ganning. What if a cold school never got you to cream? I can't have a cup of baby. Ganning in his tragedy. Gana food in K and to the moon, she'll be today, yes, and to Gana miss your food, your what's a ma, your stress, and your walk who could do at it. And your major on air, and to see a bed, and every year, and I bought a baby. Me to me, you go with me to me, go with me. Demi, 
No one can say decide it because I don't know. A friend of mine went to. How do I make my money yet? How do I make my money yet? So I need to go and see how I get it. My baby, I will have this baby. Yes, I want to have. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Covenant the Craft. Yes, Inimguase, and you can actually find that short film on, on YouTube, a uh, movie about inspiring oneself, being in a position of a dilemma, what do I do, brilliantly told. Uh, we're going to move on, this is the NFA showcase, we're showing you the potential of Ghana's film industry through the eyes of the National Film Authority, that's the NFA. Our next panel discussion is on the exploration of investment opportunities in the film sector here in Ghana. So if you're an investor, this is for you. We just saw the presidential film pitch series, which was the opportunity, the platform for Ghanaian filmmakers to sell themselves and their films to the rest of the world. This is the part where we talk about the money that needs to go into financing these productions. Uh, to moderate this panel, we have a, a film critique. He's you know, a big supporter of Ghana's film industry as well. Ladies and and gentlemen, please a round of applause for Tony Asankoma as he comes up to moderate this panel. Good evening. Right, so um, we are here to have this um, panel discussion on the subject matter investment. Uh, I'd like to call a panel guest on stage. I'm going to start with Mr. Danny Dama. Okay. Also joining us. Mr. Ivan Kwashiga. Thank you. And Finally, uh, she's not here in person, but she's agreed to join the panel via Zoom. It's Miss Roberta Annan. Okay. Okay, she's going to join us via Zoom. Um, we are going to um, start the conversation uh, whilst she gets connected. Um, the conversation we are having is exploring investment opportunities in the film sector in Ghana. I believe the reason why we are all seated here is because um, investment is key in everything that we do. And especially for the film industry, the conversation has been going on for years that there's the need for more investment to help grow the industry. And it's important that we have conversations like this so that even the young filmmakers can understand what they need to do to prepare themselves to attract invest investors. 
So let's just dive into the conversation immediately. I'm going to start uh, by asking our panel members to uh, introduce themselves. So Mr. Danny Dama. Hi, my name is Danny Dama. Um, I'm a filmmaker. Um, I ha also have a production services company um, here in Ghana. Um, and we have an office in Ghana. We have an office in London. Uh, we have a presence in South Africa and a presence in, South in Nigeria. Uh, we predominantly co-produce films, um, mainly with uh, foreign partners. Um, we've done some good movies here in Ghana and TV series. We worked on uh, um, Beast of No Nation. We did um, Black Earth Rising, um, Borga, um, Joseph, um, to name a few. And we have um, a few productions um, coming up uh, towards the end of this year and a few in the next three years. That's what I do. Awesome, awesome. Give him a, a round of applause. Okay, uh, Mr. Ivan. Yeah, um, my name is Ivan Kwashiga. I'm a filmmaker, and um, I've been in the industry for a while. Yeah. Uh, so basically, I worked in advertising for a very long time, and uh, recently decided to go into production of films, which is uh, which has been my first love. So ever since uh, I've produced um, a couple of corporate films and also uh, recently YOLO and then also a series that is on our very own app, Farmhouse Movies app called Strike, uh, which is doing very well in the industry. So um, I will be going more a, li a little more into uh, your um, streaming platform as well, how you're able to gather investment for that, how it's doing so far, if you've been able to recruit your investment. But uh, before we go any further, I'd like to ask the two of you, as, if, as creatives who have worked... Um, oh, okay, so um, I've just been alerted that we have Miss uh, Roberta Anand joining us now. Madam, if you can hear us, say hi. Okay, I, it seems uh, uh, there's some um, challenges with the sound. Okay, oh, madam, it seems you've muted yourself, so if you could kindly uh, unmute yourself so we could hear you. Awesome, awesome, it's better now. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh my God, I'm so challenged when it comes to technology. But hello, my name is Roberta Annan. I'm the managing partner for the Impact Fund for African Creatives, um, a long term investment holdings company that is investing in the um, creative industries of Africa. So when I talk about creativity, we're looking at the entire gamut of um, the creative economy, which goes from music, film, fashion architecture, interior design, just to name a few. I believe the United Nations Convention on Trade and Development has termed 16 subsectors of the creative and cultural industries. And our platform is to bring the much needed capital um, and infrastructure that the industry needs to um, support the growth and development of the African continent. I'm really honored and privileged to be on this platform. Thanks. Right. Thank you also for joining us, uh, even via Zoom. Okay, so uh, let's just dive into the conversation. I'd like to ask the two of you, uh, since you've worked in capacities as producers, directors, how, should I say, have you been able to um, attract any form of invest investors? How did that go? Were there any challenges? And uh, basically, what would you say is uh, the landscape for investment in the Ghanaian film industry? Um, I can go first. Um, for me, because we, what we do is traditionally co-production, right? Um, with co-production, it's a little more challenging than traditional production where you might have a commissioner or a fund manager or a um, studio just giving you uh, money. With co-production, you sort of split the responsibilities of being able to attract um, the funding. So one party that has experience in development might work on development. Another party that has experience in maybe packaging 
um, getting actors attached, we'll work on that, and then all together um, that is presented and funds are raised. Um, obviously, there's not one single way for any one production that we have done where there is a, um, there's a unique form of, of funding. It varies for every single production. Um, for TV series, obviously, it's always commissioned. Um, and the, and the, the first film we actually um, did was um, Beast of Donation. Um, that took, I mean, before it even came to us, it took seven and a half years to try to raise funding. Uh, when we started actually producing in Ghana um, for a six million budget, we only had $750,000. Uh, um, so obviously we were, we were sh um, short of um, funding. Uh, we did have pre-sales contracts with, uh, across Europe and some parts of America, so that helped bring in other um, funders to be able to raise the rest of the money. By, by the time we were done principal photography, we had about maybe 50 to 50 percent, 50 to 55 percent, and then when we went to the post, we had some money. So there's no one traditional way of raising money. Uh, for the last question, in terms of investment opportunity in Ghana, um, just by listening to the um, four gentlemen who were here at, um, before um, and looking at the, the value proposition they have in the shows that they all have, um, you can tell that they are going somewhere. And when you have the government of a country behind you um, in, at, at, at this early stage, um, there's a lot of potential and a lot of upside for whatever investment is made into them. Awesome. Well... <laughs> That's interesting. All, all I, 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 my experience is that it's been very difficult for the Ghanaian filmmaker to raise funds, and I think that is one of the reasons why uh, the first thing that the National Film Authority is doing is to set up the film, uh, presidential films pitch series, so as to find ways to bring investors to the table. Uh, we have loads and loads of ideas, and I saw them. Uh, working on the, the pitch series, I saw lots of ideas, but we do not have the funds to match those ideas. And so um, we are still in the, the beginning stages of um, the process where we find, we, 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 we beginning to think of investing into film. We do not have banks that have invest uh, uh, desks for film investments. Uh, there are banks in Ghana, loads of them, but they do not have specialists that understand how to fund these projects. There are very, very few people that really know what uh, this industry can offer in terms of employment, in terms of uh, uh, return on investment and all that. There are very, very few people that know that. And then also, we do not have um, distribution channels that um, uh, filmmakers can use. And for me, um, if you do not have the end, which is the distribution stage of it, it's very difficult to have the beginning, which is the, the funding stage of it. And since we are not able to really give out the, the figures from distribution experience on other films, we are not able to really convince investors to, to, to come on board. So for me, this whole exercise, uh, the National Film Authority has um, embarked on is going to change the landscape because we are now going to be talking the language of uh, investors. When we had the first, in, um, uh, the first um, entries into the film pitch series, you realize that all the entries were just looking for funds. And there had to be a training for them to understand how to, to talk investment language, how their film can make money for the filmmakers and also make money for those that are going to be investing in it. And so after that workshop, we saw a change in the way the participants were talking. So we, we have a long way to go, and I know with the NFA, we are on the right track. Awesome. Um, for, for Madam, I would like to ask you, or uh, like to know from you, um, being someone who is the CEO for an institution that is in the position to invest in film, what would you say is um, the general overview of the film industry in Ghana and Africa as a whole. 
Okay, so just from uh, my perspective, I would um, just dovetail off the comments that Daniel made earlier. Um, you know, the, the major issue for investors or positioning any of the sub sectors of the um, creative economy as an investable asset class to investors is difficult because, um, again, if you look at it from the end point to the beginning, there's no distribution. So most investors don't see how they're going to make money if they put money in. And it's a very similar thing if you're looking at other subsectors of the creative economy, such as fashion and, and art you know, and music. There isn't a link to understanding the infrastructure that is needed for investors to actually put money. Because if you look at things like real estate, right? If somebody puts money into real estate, they see houses, right? And some, there, there is a market for houses, you know, whether it's low, um, um, affordable, whether it's high end, you know, there's already like a, um, a pool of potential end buyers. So if they're putting the investment into it, they, they can realize um, an ROI. It's often very difficult and very speculative for film because, you know, most people don't understand, you know, how a film is going to perform on the market number one it may be that the creativity is is there uh, but you know what is the end goal will the production be up to par with maybe certain standards you know depending on whether even that product can even transport to other markets you know these are all things that investors will think about so if i can put my money into and then we also look at the market we're in which is the african market it's you know it's quite fragmented in itself. We have very, very premature capital markets. So a lot of investors that are coming outside, they don't see the ROI. That being said, the reason why we are in this industry is because if you look at Nigeria, for instance, with Nollywood, Nollywood has been a contributor to the GDP of Nigeria for many years. It's been the highest employer of, of, of women and of young people. So creating employment, the film industry itself has the potential, the propensity to create a lot of jobs on the African continent. And so that's why I like the theme at National Film Authority, Films for Jobs, right? Because if we are, we have all these young people out there who don't have, they've been educated, um, because we talked about education being important. They are, uh, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to technology, they, you know, they understand how to use technology, but where are the jobs? Government alone cannot provide the jobs for them. So for me, film industry and the creative industry is the tool for us to, you know, create jobs to by supporting creative entrepreneurs. And if we want to tackle it also from the women's empowerment angle, it's actually the quickest way to get women empowered economically, right? Because if you talk about empowerment, the economical empower, economic empowerment is key in everything. And then also like to deal with issues of youth that could, you know, pose problems for migration and other things that are hurdles for, for um, you know, sovereign um, bodies. For me, the creative economy is a tool. So it's a tool for inclusive growth and development. And that is the angle at which I come at it because my background is development. And I always look at things in which you could, you know, what we have here, you know, the creativity is an abundance. We have a very thriving youth population, 65% out of the age of 25. We can harness that creative and innovative potential to drive Africa's growth and prosperity. And we don't need, you know, yes, we do need external partners and funding, but everything that we have, we need is already here. It already exists here. It's just a matter of positioning the infrastructure and to create success stories and cases. Like, you know, I see a lot of films going on Netflix and YouTube and you know other channels like Amazon. And these are great success stories that we can hone in and polish up to really attract more investment. But I've committed myself for the past decade in really creating, making creative economy an investable asset class to investors. Because oftentimes when I go with pitches, you know, they, <laughs> the investors just look at me and they're like, Roberta, you're not serious. Is this a charity? Am I supposed to give a grant? You know, but, you know, the approach to it has been for us that we had a blended approach. We had the technical assistance, which was the grant. We put our own money. So we actually created a proof of concept. And now we've gone outside and we are raising, we've raised some money and we're still raising more capital 
and we have a very robust system with you know selecting um, um, you know initiatives and companies to back through a really established investment committee with financial experience who can actually look at the needy degree and make sure that the investors that are putting their money behind us will make a return so yes the opportunity exists there are a few players like myself in the market i think they need we need more money you know we what we have is not going to be enough to to match the talent that we have here but i love what you guys are doing at the national film authority at anand capital partners we are a huge advocate and supporter of what you're doing we've made an investment into one of the projects um, that you launched under the pre presidential pitch project and we're really really excited to see you know this partnership flourish into bigger things and for us to be a conduit to to bring more funding to to your platform all right thank you very much right i i think uh, we all have identified uh, certain problems or certain issues that are making it almost impossible for us to attract investment um example the lack of uh, proper distribution channels so there's no guarantee on return on investment i would like to ask and i'm sure everyone in the auditorium is also interested what would have to change what would have to make that uh, difference for for our film industry to look more <laughs> attractive uh, for for investors <laughs> That's a long question and a, with a <laughs> long answer. So, um, so I can I can use myself as an example. Um, when we started in this space in Ghana, we 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 had long discussions. My part, business partner Tony Tego and I, um, we see problems as opportunity, um, and we came from the actual industry. So I came, I came from LA, he came from the UK, New York um, space. Um, and because we saw an early mover advantage in coming to this market, um, when we came in, there was obviously nothing in terms of the services space. There were some companies doing fixer jobs, but there was nothing in terms of the services space um, and the co-production space for film. So we actually saw an opportunity, even though the industry is fractured and or lack, or lack thereof of an industry. Um, from that perspective, there is a demand. Once there is a demand for something, there is space to invest in it and space to, um, to profit from it. Um, every aspect of the film industry or the, the entire industry from funding, from distribution, production, post-production, um, marketing, sales, insurance, um, you name it. I'm just you're talking about the big ticket items. Every part of that is an investment opportunity, right? Um, in 2013, when we started, there were no Netflixes on the continent. As a matter of fact, there was Netflix in America, but Netflix didn't really have its own content. Um, we pushed. Net, I mean, Beast of No Nation as a film was actually Netflix's first film they ever purchased in the world, right? Um, so, in 2018, fast forward in 2018, 2019, we produced another film, we co-produced another film with a Jamaican um, government, Barbados government, and filmmakers from those countries. And when we looked at the type of film it was, it was a very small, very, very small film, but it was very heartfelt. And we realized that it wouldn't be able to go through the traditional channels of distribution. So again, we looked at going direct to market uh, or direct to, direct to um, uh, consumer market without um, having a distributor. We approached um, the biggest film chain in the world, which is AMC. Um, and we happened on them, and AMC at a certain point said, you know what, we'll give you any screens you want in America, any part of America. You just have to pay for the promotion and the prints, the PNAs for distribution. And they gave us America, they were happy with America, they gave us the United Kingdom as well. And luckily for us, COVID hits around the time we started a rollout. Um, so that is still ongoing. So. There is no hurdle, really, 
there is just not the infrastructure, right? So for every part of the infrastructure that you have to cross, you either have to build it yourself, which takes a lot of capital, um, or you have to knock on doors to get some kind of um, handout, in a sense, to be able to move forward. And that's what we've done. Not, not, that's not answering the question, <coughs> right? I'm just saying, that's not answering the question. I'm just saying the opportunity is there for investments, is what I'm trying to say, in a sense. I agree. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts on that as well, Ivan. Yeah, so what has ahead. to change? What has to change? Okay. Um, I think that um, most of the times we think that once we are making films, it is to get onto this. Uh, Western platforms like the Netflix and all that. And we tend to forget about ourselves. And I've been thinking, we have 1.3 billion people in Africa. We have internet penetration, our mobile technology, it's about half a billion. And then the internet penetration is about 39%. We in Ghana have more mobile phones than people. In, in that we have about 40 million mobile lines and we have only 31 mil, uh, million people. So if we look inward, if we look at what we have in our hands, we should be able to do much better than we're doing now because most of the times we want to match up to what is happening elsewhere and we forget about what we have and so that is my crusade that we should look at what we have we should make films for ourselves find ways for our people to watch these films raise money from ourselves make the films cheap enough so they can watch many people can watch can you imagine if you make a film and uh, out of the 1.3 billion people, even 10 million people watch your film. From Ghana. From, that will be huge for filmmakers. The filmmakers that, uh, the films that are produced here, less than 5,000 people watch these films. And that is why we are not making enough money to go back to make more films. And I think that we should find a way to reach out to these people. So we should first start thinking about ourselves, who we are, the numbers that we have. We have huge numbers that, and these people are ready and they are willing to watch themselves, okay? Um, if you look at some of our stars, the Jackie Appiahs and the rest, going around Africa, you would see how people love to see them. And so they want to see them on their screens. And then we have over 140 million people in the diaspora, even maybe more than that, in the Caribbean, in all parts of the world, they are all blacks and they want to watch things from Africa. So that is a huge opportunity for us. And I think that we must start thinking about how to, we can tap into that resource before we start thinking about other people outside of Africa, like watching our, our, our stuff. When Nollywood started, there are films, we all complained about the sound quality, the content, the pictures were not nice, but they kept going and they kept going. And as their people kept watching, they made enough money to be able to reinvest into their industry. So now we see quality productions coming out of Nollywood and we are all proud of that. And I think that is what must change. And the other thing too I'm thinking about is that government must start looking at the film industry as a means to solving the huge problem that we are about to face in terms of youth unemployment. We have a serious problem coming up. About 60% of the population is below 25. Recently we heard our minister say their public um, sector is choked in that they, they will not be able to employ a lot of, lot of people. But this is an industry that employs so many people through the value chain, from writing, acting, directing, all the aspects of uh, filmmaking employs lots and lots and lots of people. So that is one thing. So here we have a situation where we want to tell our story, send it out there for people 
to, to see. We have the opportunity to do that. But then we also have the opportunity to solve a problem that we have that could become a major problem if we do not solve, start solving it now. So for me, that is what I think. The other thing too is that in order to achieve this, government must start looking at creative ways of creating the enabling environment for filmmakers to thrive. What, what do I mean by that? When we import film equipment, we don't have a film gear house in Ghana where a filmmaker can go and hire equipment. And these equipment are very expensive. Very, very expensive. Now, you go bring this equipment in and you pay almost half of what you've bought the equipment with in terms of taxes. If the government can look at ways of waiving the taxes on this equipment, it will make it possible for us to bring in more equipment in order for us to do our work far easier. And that way we can employ more people. You know, so that is, these are things that must change immediately. There should also be some way of waiving of taxes on certain products, uh, in fact, on productions, like production houses that have started maybe in the first five years should be able to work tax-free. That way, they can expand, they can grow their muscles to be able to do big stuff. These are things that I think must change uh, for us to thrive. Uh, um. Right, so uh, f for Madam, uh, be before I come to you with your question, I'd like to commend you for uh, your partnership on the I Grow Africa uh, project. Um, out of the 25 films that were selected for the presidential pitch series, uh, that is the first that has been greenlit. So they've already signed everything that needs to be signed, and it's, it's something that we should, I mean, put our hands together for. Thank you. <laughs> So my question Thank for you, you, yeah, my question yeah. for you is, um, I would like to find out from you, how do you want to be approached as, um, as an in, um, investor? What do you expect filmmakers to come to you with? First of all, I think the most important thing is um, just educating um, you know, people about the film industry. And I, I'd like to touch on some of the important points I'm definitely not an expert in film. I believe uh, my um, other the pa other panelists, sixteen panelists, are more knowledgeable about the film industry than I am. But from a pure economic standpoint, because of course my my business is in investment advisory and now fund management. Um, so the the what I would say is that we should look at educate people about the core industry. Because I think sometimes, and this happens a lot in fashion, where I have a lot of experience, people think the fashion designer is the only, um, I'll say, uh, you know, kind of the job description for it, anyone in the fashion industry. It's the same with film. So I think we need to educate people to know that there are different facets of the film industry. So when you're looking at the job creation, we need to find a way to build the capacity of the industry as a whole, right? So they are the people that are the directors, they are the producers, they are the, the writers, they are the actors. There are several facets of the industry and each part needs to work together in tandem with the other, right? So that you can have a unit and you can build that economies of scale that investors need to see to be able to have a return. So for the first important fact is education, right? And building capacity of the industry. And I also agree that, you know, this, we cannot do the job alone, okay? So for instance, there were 25 um, uh, uh, films that were shortlisted in this um, uh, presidential pitch series, but we're only able to select one. I mean, we wanted to do more, and I think in the future we'll have the opportunity and platform to do more, but we'll be we'll able to support with one. But I think the interesting thing is, you know, we have to find a way to market the opportunity so that everybody works together, both public sector, private sector, to really, really just build the, um, the film industry. So one of the key things is, you know, if we're looking at it from a, a technical assistant, there should be grants 
right, that, uh, you know, we can, you know, like a grant scheme that can help support and build the capacity and educate people in the industry. So technical assistance is one of them. It's, it's, a, it's a huge, because technical assistance, what that does too is, let's say if I'm investing in a venture in film, and there's a grant piece, and normally technical assistance comes in from governments, right, or civil society organization or foundations. If that comes in, it kind of de-risks the investment that I'll be making into that film, right? So if I'm coming in for purely a profit share, and somebody has come in with technical assistance, it's a way to de-risk my investment. Then there's also another facet, which is you know looking at it more on the on the on the debt side and the trade finance side and the distribution and how to look at the numbers. But I know that there's a thriving industry that needs a lot of support, and for us to be able to match capital with opportunity, um, we need to also address the little things that we are lacking in terms of the fragmented nature and the little vulnerabilities and loopholes that we have in the industry, which is lack of education, you know, even intellectual property is an issue that we have to talk about. How do we protect our IP? Because as an investor, if I'm coming in and there's no IP protection, I will not invest, right? Because if there's no copyrights, and when I talk about intellectual property, it's copyrights, we need to ensure that these things are not just on paper, as you know, we have the copyrights, but they're actually enforced, right? So within the industry, are the intellectual property rights enforced? You know, if somebody infringes on those rights, what is the penalty? You know, and are we practicing and enforcing that? And these are the areas that I think government can step in to ensure that there's a robust model in place so that the industry can thrive. So funding is great we're talking about funding. But the problem that's not just is not limited to funding alone. It's a huge infrastructural and educational issue that needs to be addressed, you know. And coupled with funding, I think we can really grow this industry. I'm a huge optimist because when it comes to the creative industries, like I said to you, I look at it from a purely economic development standpoint. And when I look at African creatives, you know, compared to even the creatives in the diaspora, I think this is how we can actually be. Because if you look at all the major players in the um, um, in the diaspora community who are doing well, you know, from music to your Beyonce's, your Jay Z, and all of that. I think we have a unique ability to really lead and thrive in this industry. So it's something that we've been blessed with, but we need to harness that and create economic value in it as the diaspora communities have done. And this is where I think the education now piece comes in and the capacity building piece comes in and, you know, support with the needed infrastructure and the funding to grow the industry. So how do I want to be approached? When I'm being approached as an investor, I want to make sure that, you know, they've done the reason why I like the IGR project is I saw great longevity in the project, you know, even outside of a presidential pitch because it's also linking industries, right? So it's linking creative to agri, to tech. Um, and so such a project, you know, will outlive, you know, the creatives. You have to think about things like that. When you think about your favorite music and, and movies, like a sound of music and all of those, people that were creating it thought that, you know, they weren't just thinking about their time. You know, sound of music is something that was created well, in the 70s and 60s, but we're still watching sound of music. So you need to start from, you know, what problem am I solving? Um, and how is my creativity, how is it going to leave a legacy, a long lasting legacy, you know, for those that are, are to come after me, you know? So these are the type of things that I look out for as an investor, because we all need to come together as a unit to really promote our culture and our heritage and our identity and really capture it and transport it globally. And also, while doing that, we're also making an impact on the society. So all of these things are things that I look out for as an investor. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've far spent our time for this panel discussion, and the uh, conversation is even get, getting more interesting. Uh, I'd like to take your final words um, concerning investment in the Ghanaian film industry as a whole, so we can wrap this up. <laughs> Any of you can go first, please. Well, um, I'd just say, like to say that this is the time that um, investors must start looking at the film industry as an option to invest in. Why am I saying this? 
this is, I mean, you heard people say content is now king. Now, people have kept what, uh, to watching content everywhere, even whilst they are on the go. They are, there's content on the mobiles, there's content on, on TV everywhere. So this is a time. It's not like before when you actually literally have to go out to look for content to watch. But now the content is following you everywhere. And so this is an area that you cannot go wrong if you get into it with your mind, your eyes wide open. So I am looking forward to um, investors looking in our direction. The other thing too I'd like to say is that uh, filmmakers must also start thinking commercially. You must start thinking about the interest of the investors. There was a time that we were making art films where we thought create all the creative things that we wanted to do and just make the films to impress ourselves and our friends. But now the film, the film industry is a business, it's a commercial entity. And so when we're thinking about making a film, we should try to think about films that can bring return on investment. And these are things that would uh, engage the in investors and get them to, to jump on board and make our, our films come into reality. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dandidan. Final words. Um, but resting on what Ivan just said, um, this is, I would say this is the best time ever for film in Ghana and for the greater part um, Africa um, for two reasons. Almost every studio, every distributor in the world, every platform, every exhibition space is looking at Africa. Um, for those who are in the um, subscription services industry, your Netflixes, your Amazons, your HBOs, etc., they've grown um, and they can't really grow anymore in their, um, their pr primary markets and are expanding into other markets. Um, this is the reason why they are all opening offices um, for Africa. The offices might not be in Africa yet, but they are all opening offices for Africa. They're mostly EMEA um, offices. Um, so for film investors or for um, people who want to invest in film, um, there is a demand. There are off-takers. Um, whilst there may not be that many distributors on the ground, there are international distributors that will um, fill the space of distribution if we don't create any distributors on the ground um, to off-take the content and that would be made. The 25 films that um, are in the pitch series, at a certain point, those films are going to be produced. Um, whether it's your money or somebody else's money, there is going to be a service industry to service those 25 films because all of those filmmakers are going to get money to make their films. They're not going to get money to buy any equipment. They are going to rent equipment to make their films. They're going to um, get... Hello? I thought, I thought they were cutting me off. They're going to get services from multiple vendors. Um, locally to service um, their films, from, from catering to transportation, to hotels, to um, lights, sound, post-production, etc. Um, they're going to they're get um, um, labor services as well. Insurance, legal, um, you name it. All of these things are areas where investors can invest. So your money doesn't have to be the largest amount of money in terms of investments. You don't have to be investing in terms of millions you can invest in um, categories or segments of the industry that will service all of these films. If $25 million is going into films, somebody is going to... All right. Okay, so um, let's right. take the f uh, final word from... Thank you very much. Uh, let's take the final word from uh, Madam as well. Okay. Okay, so um, I... I we you seem to have lost her. Um, so can you that, hear me? Oh, okay, she's here. Yes, we oh, can hear you yeah. now. So, so, so just to sum up, the Ghana film industry is a contributor to national development. It creates jobs for locals, from actors to production crew and publishers. 
it has created opportunities and different exposure from those actors and filmmakers internationally. Hence, foreign income for the country. An example is Uncle Ebo White Stage Play, which has about 30% of its audience coming from abroad. You know, Ghana is a safe and political, politically stable as run by the World Economic Forum's Global Competitive Report. So definitely investors can leverage on this as well as this distinctive tourist assets and infrastructure to produce great films to generate, to generate returns on their investment. And as my co-panelist said, this is a time for Africa. I mean, we have a t-shirt that says, Africa, your time is now. If we don't harness this opportunity, you know, especially when African diasporans have also connected with the continent and we are building those economies of scale and the huge opportunity, if we don't harness it and we don't bring the right investments to the talent, especially taking advantage of the young, you know, population of the African continent, we will miss the boat. We missed out on the industrial revolution, on the digital boom. I think the creative economy serves as an, an opportunity for us to really, really lead when it comes to re leading a sector as Africans. So let's not miss that opportunity. Thank you. Let's not miss that opportunity. And that would be the final word for our panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
some of these to be able to put us on track. Whenever I say us, um, sometimes my boss, Dr. Awa, asks uh, if I am still with the creative space or I am with the government. I say us as Ghanaians. And so I bring you greetings from Dr. Mohamed Awa, who is the Tourism, Arts and Culture Minister. He's the one who was supposed to be here, but he said that I cannot like this space. And because of my experience, anything to do with creatives, he would love me to come and replace him. Not all the time, though. One, I hear a lot of funding, funding, funding. And so let me say thank you to the sponsors. We often do not acknowledge these people, but I'm sure we wouldn't have been here without these sponsors. And so let's put our hands together for them. I am honored to be part of this. APN, After Policy Network, and NFA, thank you for doing this. I'm sure you're all aware, you know where I come from. Those of you who do not know my background, from DJ to radio presenter, presenter to um, music production, I did executive production for Ephira, and then, um, which one? I came on TV for Mentor, and then, um, which one? Okay. <laughs> and so, I am part, was part of this fraternity for some number of years. And so, I remember my first meeting with President Akufado, when he wanted me to take a position. You know, often you are called by the president and he will ask you if you would want to take his offer. I remember what he said. He said that he does not need to reinvent the wheel. He doesn't need any research to tell him that this industry is a good one because there are so many examples around the world that shows. And so, he believes that this industry can be a good one. And that is why he's selecting people with business background to go and man the Ministry of Tourism, Art and Culture. And so, Dr. Mohamed Awa has a marketing background, and so I also have a business background. Those of you who do not know, we think I'm only creatives. I, I, I did more of a business side of the creatives than the front. And so we should team up, or I should go support this minister so we get the results he's looking for. I give him my word that, yes, I was ready for it, and we're going to make a change. And so it tells you that this president believes that this creative industry is a multi-billion one and I believe in the present vision as well. Thanks to African continental free trade area, today it's a big market. It is only in quotes, the unwise who will not take advantage of this market. Especially when our cultures are similar. We are likely to do a film or, or create something in, Af in Ghana and most people in Africa will connect easily because our cultures are similar. And so it is only prudent that we take advantage of this new market that our leaders have created for us. I'm sure you all know the number, so I do not need to touch on the number. At the moment, the Ministry of Tourism, Art and Culture, with support from key stakeholders in the film industry, are developing a local content policy that will influence the patronage of Ghanaian movies to boost the film industry. <laughs> this will also enable the industry to contribute significantly to national development. To add to what my big brother Ivan Kwashiga said, I see a lot of people 
have interest in international, international. But the books and experience will tell us that if you have not built your domestic market, you have no business looking for international markets. And so it is imperative that everyone in this room looks at Ghana first. I see most of the time say, oh, we are, what's the name they use? Glamour. Uh, we are international. But every investor, proper investor, every proper businessman in the West, when they want to give you business or identify you as somebody they will want to work with, the first question is your strength in your local market. Whether your local market alone can let them pay for their investment before they... Hello? Because... Hello? Okay. Because you do not know what is happening. You don't know the social culture. Hey, sound man. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we can only know our culture more than someone's culture. And in selling, you must acknowledge culture. And so, please, uh, I, I, Ivan, uh, my big brother, it's a good advice you gave to them, and I hope it is well noted, because it is the only way that you can get some capital to aid you export to the unknown markets. I agree with, um, again, Mr. Kwashiga, that this industry can create a lot of work or jobs for people. And for every government, I'm sure you all know that one of the things people look out for is the jobs you were able to create at the end of four years. It will definitely come at play. It will haunt you. And we, as governments, President Kufado's government acknowledges that this industry creates jobs. It does because the value chain is that long, especially film. He mentioned just a writer and then a producer or something. But those of us who are novice, relatively, in the space, even if I do not know how many it employs, when the film ends, I see the end credits. It gives me a clue of how many people who were involved in that kind of job. And so I know that there are a lot of people that this industry can employ. The entrepreneurs or the businessmen in the ecosystem I think one challenge that someone like me, I have noticed is that we are working in silos. Instead of working together, as I mentioned that if you watch, the ones that the end credits is long is not actually made in Ghana. <laughs> Mr. Kajiga, hello. <laughs> you know, in the West, specialization is a big deal. In a part of the world, somebody wants to say, I did it. I, I, I. It's about time we changed to we. We work together. <laughs> Our capital. Let's face facts. We are a developing country. And so the capital that uh, an Ejaku movie would take, a Shalim Fon Manso movie, can you imagine if five businesses decide that they will form a consortium and work together? Then we can begin to think of middle budget, high budget movies. And so, 
we have seen some of the examples. We know that film is a tool to sell a country. It is a subtle product that you can use to attract people to want to see your country. I had the perception that every Chinese, do we have any Chinese in this room, was strong enough to beat the whole of Ghana. Little did I know that uh, they, they, they weren't that strong. But growing up, I watched too many or too much karate movies. And so it sold a picture. It gave me a mental picture about Chinese. Until recently that I got to know that some of them come here for mining and all of that. I thought all of them were kar karateists. You see every young man in this country says, I want to go to New York because they want to be like Jay-Z. Where did you meet Jay-Z? <laughs> Beyonce, where? Where do you know Beyonce from? Is she your auntie? It's the music video. It's the music video that has given you a mental picture about some of these people. And for all you know, it is not real. I'm sure you've seen that video um, from Akon saying that the Nigerians drive their own cars to shoot their music videos. Unfortunately, those in the West, the, the cars that they use in the music videos are not even real. They hire them or rent for, for, for just the shoot. You call them props. But we are made to believe that every performer in the West is rich because of what we see on TV. And so people in the creative space, especially film, I would plead with you that consider your culture when you are shooting. Consider Ghana when you are shooting. Lately, a lot of people are shooting their music videos in different countries. And sometimes you see their hair is blonde and the person's skin is black. And I wonder the kind of person they are trying to create. Because we all know that black people cannot be blonde. It can only be gray. And so, the leaders of the film industry, please consider selling our culture. It's a big deal so that the ecosystem, that is the arts, our culture, which will end up selling our tourism. And when the tourists come to Ghana, it's the same creative people who benefit because they go to watch the movies. They go to hotels and they dance to our music. They are the same people who buy our food, our fashion. When they are going back, everybody wants to buy your fashion. And so we'll, we'll be the end beneficiaries. Somebody again touched on the funding. President Kufado and his wisdom knows that funding is a problem. And so the Creative Arts Agency will soon launch the Creative Arts Fund. The fund, the fund is to subsidize, is to support this industry propel to the next level. And all these, we must be ready to innovate. We must be ready to compete. Money, if it is given to you in all you want, but you, if you lack innovation and you do not know what is happening in the today's world, technology especially, and you just take the money, you just shoot, and then you keep doing the same old things. We've tried the old things. We are still struggling. In my visit to Dubai recently, a young man made a statement. He's actually Ghanaian. He said that we have done enough of the best practices. Let's change to new practices. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable. The Deputy Minister of Tourism, Arts and Culture, Mr. Marco Kriku Mante. A round of applause for him one more time. We'll also like to hear from the Executive Director of AFSA, the Policy Network Group, Mr. Luis Yao Afo. If you're here, if we can have you up as well. Mr. Luis? Oh, 
Okay, so I think we're going to move on and uh, speak to one of our guests of honor um, with us here today. Um, also a potential investor. Ladies and gentlemen, please, with a round of applause, let us welcome uh, Mr. Clinton. Mr. Clinton, if you could join us up here. Mr. Clinton is our international guest. He's with the KCI and Group USA. One more time, a round of applause for him. Thank you. One more time. Another round of applause. Thank you. Let me tell you, this, this is uh, a little unfair because uh, I've been eating very well all day. So it's like you're feeding me good food, I'm full, then you send me in here to put a mask on and dim the light. So I'm trying to wake up, uh, but I've heard a lot of great things. Um, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I, I thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I've heard a lot of great things. And um, I would say this, my Ghanaian brothers and sisters, you have everything that you need in-house to do a great work in the television and film and art industry. And you ought to applaud for that. And I do mean that. Again, my name is Keith Clinton. I am the uh, founder and owner of KC Productions. We are a multimedia production company, but also I'm representing several other individuals in multiple uh, industries. I'm representing uh, noted music producers, uh, a, uh, professional uh, athletes, and a live show producer out of Las Vegas. So uh, I'm here with a uh, sole purpose is to inspire you and to partner with you on a vision that we have is to build the best and the biggest uh, film studio here in Ghana. We, we want to partner with you because we see the value, we see the talent, we see all of that. We, you have everything that you need. So I'm here representing uh, several groups again, and I believe that if you can partner with us, all of the uh, authority figures and all of the artists, we recognize you and we thank you um, for the organizers of this, uh, this forum. I want to say this. I've, I've heard some of my filmmakers, and I would say this. I know what it feels like. I spent many years as a young filmmaker coming out of college and I thought I had these great ideas to make films, and I used to go to the studios and pitch films to the, uh, the investors and to the studios. And how many of you know it's, it does, it's not a good feeling to get rejected with, about something that you have passion for? But this is what I want to advise you. It's okay to have love and passion for your art, but yet, I've heard this before, that you have to begin to be a businessman, okay? Is your project going to uh, make money, okay? Are you gonna make a profit? That's vitally important. Um, I've heard someone say that, you know, the production quality has increased, and it has. But now, it's important that you tell not good stories, but great stories. Do y'all agree with that? So, in presenting to uh, investors, again, it is important that you be passionate about what you have. You have to believe that your project is worthy for distribution. Three, three points I want to make. First of all, I, I am so happy to be in for the first time in Ghana. This is my first time. And on top of that, it was a big to collaborate. So do not allow me to leave this country and we have not connected. There are a lot of great stories that need to come out of Africa and specifically Ghana. What I would like to do personally is to build 
that ecosystem that will solve many of the problems that was mentioned today. For an example, someone said, well, we don't have insurance. Well, if you had a studio and a back studio lot that had all of the elements that you needed, and anyone who shot on that uh, studio lot was automatically covered, all right? The equipment, we talked about the equipment, we talked about the talent, but if we provide that, okay, there shouldn't be any excuse that we should not be able to turn out great quality uh, work that could also be distributed not only on this continent but around the world. Again, I am committed to doing business in this great country, but I want to challenge you to build those relationships because, again, there are people who want to come back. There are people that do want to invest. And I want you to do this with me, and hopefully this can wake us up and inspire all of us. Because when I go back to the US, I'm committed. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to try to rally as many of my friends and investors and business owners and lay people to come here and to explore the vast opportunities that lie in this country. And we will see a significant difference in the short period of time if we just begin to act in the now. I don't know how long the door of opportunity is going to be open, but I am a person who is ready to act in the now. I would like for you to do this for me. Extend your hands out like this. Come on, everybody. Extend your hand out like this. And repeat after me. My future. Oh, no, that's a little. Come on, bring it up a little loud. My future. My future. Your, future. Your future. Africa future. Africa's future. Ghana's, future Ghana's future. Is in, is in our, hands. our hands. Let's say it again. My future. My future. Your, future. Your future. Ghana's future. Ghana's future. Africa's future. Africa's future. Is, in is in our hands. Our and hands. if you believe that, put your hands together. In the, words, in the words of a Bishop Paul S. Martin and a songwriter, he said, I see you in the future, and your future looks much brighter. But I'm going to rearrange those words and say, our future looks better. Ghana's future looks better. Why? Because it's in? Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. Let's make something happen. This is a perfect time for the artists to rise up and business owners to come together, investors to come together, the private sector and government to make something happen in the now. Thank you and may God bless you all. Thank you so much. Very Mr. Yeah. Uh, before I leave, this is what I want to leave with. Uh, I want to leave a taste of St. Louis in Ghana. How about that? Ah, uh, nice. Mr. Lewis, food, thank you for this opportunity. This is what I want to give you to remember St. Louis. Our eyes is on Ghana, and we're looking forward to returning soon. Wonderful. Uh, Louis, if you are ready for you know, your address, you can kindly go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Mr. Lewis himself. Thank you very much, Keith. Very brief. Uh, we have one uh, speaker on the line from Avery Exim Bank. He has been waiting for far too long. I remember that when this idea of organizing the Africa Globalized Investment Summit, I shared with uh, David, I remember. David, you remember last year, we were supposed to have this summit, but COVID really could not allow us. I feel very passionate about the fact that the stories that we hear about our 
um, movie industry players, by the time they go to retirement, are issues that we have to support them. Accommodation, health, about 70% of the stories are not the one that we always want to hear. Why? In the words of Ali Mazuri, Africa is the richest, yet the poorest. We have all that it takes for us to be the best, yet our industries are not compared to anything. We can do it. So what we want to do is that this, under the continental free trade, our summit is going to be done in every country, and Ghana is a maiden one. And we are building it around the creative art industry and tourism. I said it the first day, I have so many invitations to Dubai for the Expo, but I turn it down. Not because I don't want to go there, but I felt bad that one country can organize this for many countries and the whole continent. We've not been able to brand it. We are living movie stars. Kate talked about Professor um, um, Thomas Mensah. If, uh, if uh, what do you call it, this, um, if an inventor from the US should step in his room, the whole crowd will mop him. Dr. Thomas is the inventor of fiber optic. He has been moving in this afternoon. I don't know many of you have identified him. He's the first black or Ghanaian to be patent in the US Academy of Sciences. He's doing so much on speed train, fiber optics, drones. Currently, he's working on drones that will take care of our bodies. He walks in here, we don't even mop him. Some do, but that is a culture we have to stop. If we have to value our culture, then we have to add investment to our culture. Our desire is to bring investors like his Bill Studios, and that's Professor Thompson, uh, Professor uh, uh, Joe. Tomorrow, you can't miss tomorrow's session, because tomorrow is packed with SMEs, innovations, and inventions. I just wanted to show one. This is tourism. I keep saying, this is a young man. Most of you have call cards here. If someone should come from outside and tell you that this call card is a digital call card, you don't need to share cards, but you swipe it on your scan code and all your content is in. You don't need to distribute card. You will patronize it. Take interest. Tomorrow he's going to launch it here. So we are going to support the film industry, music industry, so that one single song that a musician can produce can bring him royalties throughout his life. When I started this project, I wanted to connect it to intellectual property rights. The African continental free trade is looking at intellectual property rights. So I, I called some of the, and I said it with passion, I called most of the celebrities here. I shared that, only a few responded. I said, look, you've produced, you've done several productions yet, how many times do you receive royalties? Let us take the intellectual property right that the continental free trade is going to bring to have it embedded in our system here. And that is why we are focused on this investment summit. So that by the end of next year, if you produce even one song or any movie, whatever it is, and you don't produce again, it should earn new royalties till you die. This is very important. During the year of return, finally, Samuel Jackson was shooting at Cape Coast. If you care to know, majority of the revenue that came during the year of return did not come to Ghanaian companies. Most were American companies. I was involved with, I knew most of the American companies that organized this. Why should it be so? So I challenge you, those in the industry, this is the time to set up a business. And I'm happy that the producer of YOLO is here. I met your young man, Aaron. I said, Aaron, I see you are good. Add investment to what you are doing. I met him at Moving Pig. I said, young man, I want you to register a company. He said, yeah, challenges. I personally guaranteed him to a registrar general department. After some months, he registered it. And I introduced him personally to Keith. This is what we need to do in investment. If you don't have anything to show, no one can partner you. You need to have streams of income beyond what we are doing. I want to thank you, and we want to see you 
if we are organizing this investment in another country next year, we will go with our team and say, look, this is a story. Have a fruitful time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very charismatic. His name is Mr. Luis Yao Afo. He's the executive director of After the Policy Network Group. One more time, let's hear for him. And thank you so much for allowing the NFA to, to partner. He did mention someone who's very important here, Dr. Thomas Mensah. Someone said we don't know him. So please, Dr. Thomas Mensah, if you could please uh, be upstanding so everyone could see you. The inventor of fiber optics himself. Yes. Dr. Thomas Mensah. 100% Ghanaian as well. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And as Mr. Lewis was saying that, I just thought, you know, a, a documentary on your life wouldn't be bad at all. We should, we should get started on it. Yeah, we should. Um, thank you so much for your patience. There's a lot more. There's a whole part of, you know, short films. We have movie festival, Ghanaian festival operators here. If you're here and you run one of the Ghanaian festivals, please just raise your hand. Accra Indie Film Fest is here. We'll be showing three of their short films you need to be here to see those short films. So despite, you know, the drag in this, please wait till the end. You need to see these movies. I guarantee you, you will not regret it. Uh, do we still have the representative from African Bank on our Zoom call? Do we? No, he's not on? All right. So we're going to take a short break before we get to the next session, which focuses on music. Here is one of the short films we want to show you. I think it's about five minutes long or less. It's, uh, it's an animation um, to do. Ladies and gentlemen, let's dim the lights and let's watch this. Most recently, Brightburn and Spider-Man Homecoming. I wanted to take a minute to talk about Tutu, upcoming project from Animax FYD Studios, directed by Francis Brown. I got a chance to see a sneak peek of this a couple weeks ago, and I have to say I was really impressed. The animation is excellent, the style is very cool, and the story is quite compelling. I think it's going to be something special. Francis and his team have worked as ambassadors for the animation community uh, in Africa and Ghana specifically. And I think with this new project, the international community is going to really take note. Francis reached out to me a couple years ago uh, looking for a little bit of advice in post-production on a commercial that he was directing. Since that time, I've seen his studio really work hard to develop and improve their skills. And really now, now the production quality is excellent and more importantly, the energy is big. It's very powerful and quite impressive, and I expect to see big things in the future from them. So, I would say, with this project, definitely check it out. It's going to be something really cool.
Ladies and gentlemen, Tutu. made right here in Ghana. Um, incredible. And I will say the yeah, executive produced by Francis Y. Brown. And there's, there's a whole department under the National Film Authority um, that is working to promote um, animation and gaming. It's called Anigame. And the vision, the long-term vision, is to actually have an Anigame hub where young animators and game, game developers uh, can come through. People like Francis Brown develop their animations, develop their games. So again, a round of applause. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, moving on, we're going into our third panel. Um, this one will be quite short, but it's very, very important. I don't know how many of you have watched movies. You hear the, the, the music in the movie. You hear the soundtrack. Um, you, you hear the film scoring. And then you, you put on your Shazam or you start looking for that particular song. That's the power of music in film. And that is the next panel. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be moderating this panel. I'd like to invite uh, two very, very incredible uh, personalities. They've contributed so much to the music industry in Ghana. Uh, so first off, he goes by the name Nanayao, actually Enoch. Um, but everybody knows him as Trigmatic, so make some noise for Trigmatic as he joins us. Trig, please come up here. Yeah. Nobody knows tomorrow. You guys know that song, right? Let me not sing it and spoil it, but Trigmatic, make some noise. Uh, the other personality is someone who's been with us for quite some time. He's a lot of times credited for his contributions to early Ghanaian music, the sounds of hip life. And even beyond that, he was very instrumental in unveiling and developing the talent of King Ayusuba, who now tours all around the world, year in, year out. Please make some noise for the Godfather himself, Panji Anof. <laughs> One love, the Kubola, Mensan, the FOKN boys, um, so many other artists, Yapuno, uh, uh, what's, oh my goodness, Lady J, the list is endless. Panjianov is also us with us here. Please make some noise for, for both of them. Uh, also, also uh, we have another very, very important figure amongst us. He's contributed so much to Ghana's uh, music industry as well, especially in the commercial space. Recently kicked off the three music awards and he's had three consecutive, or is it four, successful editions. He's developed so many young talents, has helped in pointing them out, grooming them, and developing the business side of Ghana's music industry, opening the eyes of corporate Ghana to the potential uh, revenue that can come through from music. Please make some noise for the man Sadiq, he is the CEO of Three Music Awards and Three TV. Sadiq, if you're here, well, he's not in here yet. Well, all the fans I give him, I think he's now walking in, but yes, please make some noise for him. Right here. Yes, 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 yes. This man has done so much. TV presenting, started off with 30 minutes, built Muse Africa. And then he's here today, and the Three Music Awards brand is such uh, a pivotal brand when it comes to Ghanaian music now. Uh, someone else who uh, unfortunately couldn't be with us here today, but will um, join us via video. He did record a video. We're actually going to start off with his video just to set the tone for this conversation. Mr. Peter Sedufia, his movie actually features one of the songs that... Uh, he did with Wallasi, so that video is coming on right now. As a filmmaker, I place utmost importance uh, to music in film. Uh, why? Because uh, it helps progress the narrative or the story and also it uh, complements the story as a whole. Uh, 
why am I saying this? I mean, there are times that you just want a certain uh, music to be in the background to just add to the mood of, of, of whatever situation is happening in the film at the moment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't, I, I have made it a conscious effort that uh, when I want to just enhance mood, I don't want people, I don't want music that has, has a lot of lyrics. Sometimes I just want the musician to be humming or saying some words that not he himself, even himself does not understand that because a lot of people spending their time trying to understand what he's saying. I remember doing uh, some of uh, setting in KTK a lot where I had Wallace being the uh, composer and the musician for for KTK and I had to specifically tell him that for this part don't don't say don't use any word just use words that you don't understand no one can place meaning to harm or just make some noise and you did it so well that it's complimentary so you don't even ask yourself what does it say what like, but you like it so much that you don't even want to know the meaning and there are, so that's one I call it a very uh, complimentary uh, uh, music you see you have disgraced me which musicians have I used in my films? I mean, my first film on my debut, uh, I used Wallace because the kind of narrative I was putting across is very historic. I needed something that is not too modern, something that can uh, complement the, the era I was setting the, the film. And so I brought him on board to, to do that. Of course, the sound designer also did some piano works and things like that. That's uh, Mr. Crenzel. Kwame Crenzel. But largely, so that's the composition, the writing and composition of the, of the music and even the singing. And uh, with Sachi Gang, Sachi Gang, I use multiple artists. Uh, uh, David Adojan, uh, who understands spoken words. He's a poet, he's a musician who understands poetry. So his songs are very poetic. And I needed something like that to to tell the love story in such a gang better. And so I employed his services. And of course, I had someone who, David Adujan, who also has an understanding of the instrumentation. So he also had his own way of adding some theme music to, to, to the film that also uh, moved it forward and complemented it at the same time. And so with, and of course, I had a chance to also use third party songs. That's one from uh, Manifest and and uh, one from JW uh, Amboli. Are you not the one that put it on? I would say that it's very essential to use the right kind of music for the right mood because, uh, and not just any music because they all hit differently or they all come across differently with different interpretations. And that is why you need to settle for what best suits the scene or the mood you're trying to convey to your audience. I'll be. We will bring you down If you are an artist, a filmmaker, and you are considering using music in film, you should be mindful of what kind of music you, you put in there because people come to the
from many Ghanaians, which is that, yes, this is the kind of life that we knew growing up in, in, in our childhood, but yeah. we've never seen it on television or we've never seen it in a film. Um, also made me realize how important it is to try and represent what you know best. I think somebody earlier said that, you know, you must represent what you know best because nobody knows your experience better than you. And if you express something through your own experience, you are likely to get it right. Mm, well said. Uh, if you haven't seen it, Cause of Money should, is definitely something that should be on, on your list. Uh, Trigmatic, what about you? Earliest memories of music and film, film coming together, and how that possibly transformed your approach to doing music? Because we've all seen the growth and the difference. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I was introduced to it um, quite early as well. Maybe not as early as uh, Panji because, I mean, obviously, <laughs> you know, but um, I mean, the first time I heard uh, Nanam Pedu's Obra um, was when I was constantly watching the Obra series on GTV. Mm. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad uh, Mr. Panji mentioned uh, movies like Love, Beauty, and African Ports. There's also uh, I Told You So which had um, lots of songs in there, and then uh, movies of Akata and Akacha, where you know they had their own, I mean, you, you can call those ones cantatas, but then uh, sort of merging, so that, that merge, merge between music and film has always you know, been there. We'd have times where people could sing songs from commercials even more than mm. uh, you know, uh, the producers themselves. Um, but what I think that hasn't probably happened um, successfully is um, really amplifying the effect and highlighting the importance of music's role. You know, so I was equally introduced to it um, very early. At the time, I didn't understand. At the time, I thought it was fun. It's part of putting it together. I mean, it makes the movie nice and, and all of that. But now I understand and also understand the economic value of it. Mm. Um, and then the beneficiaries that, that must um, benefit from the use of music um, as well. And now we listen to the music that you did back then. It was very hip hop oriented, very hip life oriented. And now it's more, when you listen to Trigmatic's music, it's like you're listening to soundtracks of movies and it reflects in the music videos. What informed that change? And do you do your music now with that focus in mind? Syncing, lighting, sync? Yes, thank you. Um, you've, I think you've answered, you, you have your answer to the question here. <laughs> yeah. Some of the songs that I write, I mean, if you look at my latest album, there are certain songs that were intentional. Uh, I, I did them intentionally so as to be pitched or picked by movie producers. If you look at um, songs like my song with Wiyala, um, Jane Chakimo, it, it was actually made for hoping to have a film pick it up. If you look at Better Man, I produce these songs based off that. And if, even if you look at how I do my music videos, um, I, have, I have the mindset of you know, creating some kind of story. For every song I write, I have a story in mind. And I, well, I grew up from that background. Mm. Um, I worked with a few creatives in the past. I understudied some of them, so that informed my growth. Initially, I mean, we we're all swayed away by the Western culture and Chinese everybody wanted to be hip you know and then I found myself you know and finding myself I didn't want to keep it I wanted to also share with my brothers and sisters you know the pride of Africa um, the telling of our stories and 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 how important it is to like Mr. Panji said tell your story the best way you know how to so yeah that's mm. that's what informs the creation thank you so much uh, let me come to, to Sadiq uh, Sadiq you've worked with quite a number of artists you know in Ghana we like to group the artists who have potential, the, the music potential to be in film as alternative, and then you, you, you've got commercial. Do we have enough of these songs, the quality enough to feed the music industry, feel the, sorry, the, the movie industry in general? Do you Rather, interestingly, uh, myself and Trigmatic was just talking about how uh, filmmakers generally like to use the alternative talents, and yes. we're talking about how uh, when you observe, the alternative talents are the ones that like to go the extra mile because of how they, they've got this emotive connect to the, the proper, proper way of doing the music mm. and not necessarily having to dump it down because of the money. You know? And I think that we've got a number of, we've got a critical mass of alternative talents in the country that have what it takes to feed the film industry with the, the necessary music to aid it. Um, and of course, I mean, with films, 
I don't think that a lot of filmmakers are just only waiting for or waiting for songs to be released before they can latch on it. I know some of them, in terms of the processes, they they do go that route. But I mean, generally, in the way it should work, they should be able to sit and work with some of these uh, musicians to create the right music mm. for the moods that they want to express in their movies. Mm. And technically speaking, I mean, for, for a better understanding of this, because I know some of the young filmmakers are here, how does a filmmaker approach an artist? Like, I'm a filmmaker, I want Trick's song um, as a soundtrack to my film. Like, not originally scoring the music, but I've done the film and I thought, oh, this song would, would be a great soundtrack for my movie. And I think maybe all of you can add to this. How does one go about that? It should work in the same ways licensing for... Um, um, audiovisual works um, in the ways that it should work often when you approach the, the talent or the label he's on um, there's a process for licensing music for audiovisual um, either you pay a certain set fee sign on the requisites um, often for movies as well you should have a split sheet on the sound and then detail exactly what you intend to use it for and then you know apart from the minimal amount of money that you give to the person the person can assign the rights that he's giving to you for the movie to also the collective management society he's on or his publishers and they can chase the residual revenues that it comes on. But it definitely works the ways that licensing for audiovisuals um, should work. Mm. Trig, what's the potential right. revenue that an action can make from you know, these type of deals? Um, I mean, uh, depending on the market, I mean, we, I wouldn't want to say a figure, but I can say so much. Um, sometimes we sort of limit ourselves to the scope of our business, and uh, this is a call to all other musicians. There are musicians who, who decide, like uh, a musician like Fryer, who, who I've worked with, um, she just does music for film and television, and mm. she'll tell you, I just create for television. Um, her songs are in uh, Netflix movies all, all over. She, she's, she makes so much, but she's not your regular stage performing type of um, artist. Um, mm. Even in Ghana here, you know, before Bisa became very commercial, yes. he did a lot of songs for uh, certain movies. And then there's so many other musicians um, like that. Uh, I think we should see that as multiple streams of income for musicians, even if it's an advertising company manager, should start um, sitting on tables with uh, such producers to have such conversations. Um, you can actually create the song and we're also understanding you know the the the, the publishing um that must come through work mm. with the right publishers like for instance every now and then centric is sending out um you know emails to to uh, music producers who want to whose songs could be pitched for movies so if you are registered to some of these people register with the right cmos that can fight uh for your money and if you have a good publisher he's um sitting on the table trying to get your songs out there for you uh, uh, then again, filmmakers uh, could also have an intentional attempt when putting down your budget, have a music, mu a budget for music, mm. film, mm. Uh, film, uh, sorry, uh, sound scoring, um, whether it's a, it's a film scoring or it's a, it's, a, it's a soundtrack, you know, because that's the difference. Uh, if it's that guy who plays just some sounds, or even, even, even in advanced countries where orchestras are used, here in Ghana, I think one of the films I, I had there, Nyumkro, people. If the film producer is intentional, there should be that kind of licensing agreements between the Nyumkro group and then, and then the film producer so that all parties are, are having some of the cake. But in most cases, you have a song, probably uh, maybe a soundtrack already done, and then the producer uses it, and then there's this conflict. If we have this basic understanding that all rules must be respected, and each one of us have a benefit to have in, in that cake, we would have um, a very beautiful ecosystem, and each one of us would benefit from each other. Wonderfully said. And, and wrapping this up, Panji, uh, any other challenges you, you've seen, you know, in the process of working with, you know, people like King Aisoba, uh, One Love, what are some of the challenges that you identified from an administrative point of view that could help increase the rate of, of songs we see in movies in general? Um, I, I think it's important that film producers just simply understand you must contact the artist or whoever, rep or the label, whoever represents them. You cannot get the rights to music from anyone else. Um, I think though, you know, regardless of what the problems are, if we look at the history of 
black cinema or African cinema or African American cinema or Caribbean cinema, you will find that music has always been important not only to the marketing strategy mm. um, but also to the success of the film. Uh, Melvin Van, Van Peebles, I think, is the sort of seen as the grandfather of black cinema in America. And for his film, Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song, I think it was either the OJs or the stylistics or, you know, it was, he had an amazing soundtrack which people were enjoying and it helped to promote the film even before the film came, came out. And it's because he didn't have the resources to market his films in other ways. Mm. So he relied on the music to help him to get awareness of the film out and about. So, especially in environments where sometimes there are constraints, I think it's all the more reason why music um, gives you advantages. You know, we think about um, the importance of music and I think we have to look at what is inevitable. You know, it's difficult to predict what is going to happen tomorrow in five years' time, but certain things are inevitable. Mm. Whether we like it or not, America has been selling African culture through African-American culture for the last 70 years. Cuba has been selling African culture to the world through salsa and merengue, pachanga, all these, you know, all these forms of creativity, whether it's in music or it's in film language, I mean, look at Spike Lee and Public Enemy, and you know, it's, it's, it's very, very close to it. But whilst we might think of hip hop as being American music, everybody in the world sees it as African American music. Mm. It's African music. So the last 60, 70 years, the entire world has been preparing the rest of the world for our form of art mm. or our form of music, our form of narrative. You know, so it's it's inevitable that the doors are going to open because America has been cracking open the doors for the last 60 or 70 years. So it's, you know, um, I look at it as, uh, you know, Ray Charles opened the doors for Wizkid. Mm. You know, Ray Charles might be 50 or Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke is singing in a way that is kind of, dis it's, it it's similar to what Wizkid is doing or what somebody else is doing 50, 60 years later. But we didn't realize the world was priming uh, the commercial market for Africa. They were just trying to sell what they could sell and they were trying to promote what they could promote, but it happened to be us indirectly. Mm. So now we have the greatest opportunity I have ever seen in my lifetime. You know, music is the thinnest edge of the cultural wedge. Music will push the door open, but everything else will follow. Fashion and uh, lifestyle, you know, and, and hairstyles. And you, you might not think of them as... Uh, you know, as products, but they are. So if somebody likes your music, they like your artwork. You know, graffiti would not have come to the world's attention without hip hop. You know, baggy jeans, skinny jeans, you know, they are all driven by, uh, uh, let's say, musical tastes and, and musical influences. So we have got to the point where the music is going to open the door, but music is going to open the door for film, and music is going to open the door for fashion, and music is going to open the door for other aspects of culture. and. So it's the fact that African music is probably the most important new music in the world right now mm. tells you that it is inevitable that African film will be the most important new film force in five or seven or 10 or 15 or 20 years time. Nice. It takes a while, it doesn't happen overnight, but fashion, everything else is going to follow. So music opens the door, you know, it's like a wedge. The music is at the front but everything else is behind it. And the, the back of the wedge can be huge. It, I mean, it includes other things, you know, but music is going to open the door. So the fact that music has opened the door now should prepare everybody else for the fact that, look, this market is going to be yours very soon. Let's prepare content for it. Mm. Thank you. And wrapping up, Sadiq, you're taking advantage of that market, that music market, three music, three TV. So in wrapping up, I just want each of you to spotlight the projects that you are currently on, uh, especially because it's music related. I think they're currently with the team. We're working on a festival called the Wilderland Festival, uh, which essentially it's, uh, highlights African music in, I mean, Ghana and Africa. 
But essentially, like Panji mentioned, the vehicle, as much as, much as the vehicle is music, um, there are other things on the back of it, tourism and all that, because it's happening at the Shai Forest Reserve in the heart of the forest, mm. you know? And so, and if anybody has gone to the Shai Forest Reserve, you'll recognize that it's one of the best kept secrets in the country. Um, it's one of the places that should be highlighted again and again and again. And so, yes, music is a driver, music is the lead, uh, but we're building all these experiences in and around the music that would ultimately help to um, uh, asset Ghana's new positioning as mm. the holiday makers uh, destination in December, mm. you know. So, yes, I mean, music will open the doors for all of these things. And we know we'll be the nexus to be able to drive tourism, film, lifestyle, and all of those. So for us at Three Music, the work that we're focusing on now is producing the Wild Alarm Festival, which will be a two-day uh, music and lifestyle festival in the heart of the Shai Forest Reserve between 26th and 27th December. Wonderful. A round of applause for Sadiq. I think one thing that filmmakers will appreciate of Sadiq and Three Music is we saw during the Three Music Awards, you took filming music videos to a whole nother level with the quality that you put in. Do you want to speak to that real quickly, just very briefly? Um, yes, I mean, uh, at, so at Three Music, and personally for me, the, the point is always to elevate uh, the music and production, also knowing that our channel is coming. It's for this reason that our 24 7 music channel doesn't charge money to play, and I was just telling Trigmatic, to play videos like it's done here. Because uh, we recognize that the moment you begin to charge, you drop the quality. Our focus has been for them to elevate the production. So when even people come to us and we're offering money for promotions, we tell them to go back and invest in it. But knowing where we're going, knowing that we're going to launch a channel in August, we started the process with the awards by ensuring that even the performances was going to be, the productions of it was going to be top notch as much as possible. We spent a lot of money ensuring that every performance was well done. In fact, talking about music and even the production, we had to re-record all, all the music and went through the same licensing processes that ordinary filmmakers should go through. So we recorded the sound, we did the whole licensing document, and as it sits right now, we're having conversations with all the talents involved in the project so we can release the new recorded material as an um, album on Boom Play that would give them, I mean, extra revenues, additional revenues for whatever they got from performing on the Three Music Awards. And so in thinking around these things, it's, it's long-term thinking, but we begin to activate it bit by bit, knowing fully well where we are headed. But the idea is that we're looking to cost correct industry in a way. So we started with that particular experience, elevating it. We launched the channel now. Now we are here telling all of them that if you've got any money to give me for promotions, no. Go and put it back into your craft and I'll chase you for it. Mm. That way as well, we are trying to emphasize on top-notch quality uh, with both I mean, productions and even from the music part. Also as a way of ensuring that the likes of Babs and all these young filmmakers that are coming that are shooting music videos mm. and have put in a lot of investment in, I mean, elevating it would have a very good market and they will be there to complement it and be that 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 platform that places much channel. emphasis on it wonderful right thank you very much trig yourself um i i would just uh, say that let's respect the synergy that's always been between music and film um let's not downplay it it's very very important let's not downplay any of the partners roles um there's so much that could be that could be done i mean not too long ago we've seen an influx of um artists coming into the country from different um different other countries and even even african countries it can uh, be a filmmaker's uh, part to to film all of that or document that um let's also know that i mean uh, a filmmaker is also uh, one that can, can document the stories of, of Ghana and beyond. We are in the times where we cannot limit our creativity to you know, just ourselves and to keep it for ourselves, but also uh, for economic gain, um, number one. Number two, um, also, also for, 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 the, for the country beyond the economics, to tell the story as we want it uh, to be told, telling it by ourselves. And both of us respecting each other's role can make this um, happen. If I'm shooting a music video, obviously I use a local um, 
stylist, I use a local mm. uh, designer, um, I, I'm, I'm getting a, a director uh, or a filmmaker to, to shoot it. My shoes is done by a shoemaker here. That's all of us in the ecosystem benefiting from one music video. And then I get to play it on Sadiq's uh, channel. And then, and then Sadiq's uh, channel gets a lot of good content. And then out of that, an investor comes in and, and, and recognizes what is happening within the circle. Mind you, before the music was recorded, like the likes of Panji and Cole put in stuff like the production, the keyboards, the other musicians, the session players who came together to create it. And then also the filmmakers has a crew of light, lighting and a few other people all together. So we all have a great harmony that if we will respect, nobody is going to lose. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Trick. Thank you. And I will say this, uh, something that's really amazing is storytelling in your music videos. So whenever you guys are free, look for, I think Sophia is another one of those. Yes. It's, a, it's a movie in the music. Yes. So Sophia, yes. that beautiful story as well. Yes. Uh, Panji, yourself, and, and when we'll wrap it up. Um, well, first of all, I would like to congratulate Sadiq because I thought the three music awards were, it looked different and it appeared that he had set a goal for himself which was not based on previous uh, um, circumstances. However, I want to remind him that taking the live performance, you know, if you watch, there are many music awards, it's a live performance. Because the music is being played live on stage whilst you're recording, it changes your licensing and your... So, you know, by going that way, you solve half of your problems. And I think uh, what you did is the perfect second step. But the third step must be that the artist's performances are live when they are being recorded, not pre-recorded. Mm -hmm. So congratulations for step two. We are waiting for step three. <laughs> we'll give you five years to reach there <laughs> because it's not easy. <clears throat> um, myself, what am I doing? I'm working on Cause of Money 3, which is oh, called wow. Lost in Lagos. Wow. Um, it's just the beginning because it starts with Mensa and One Love writing the songs and involving the other artists whilst they are doing that. So, and you know, the plan for Cause of Money was always Accra, then we go to Lagos, from Lagos we go to Atlanta or New York or Japan, you know, so it's, it's an ongoing journey. Mm. So, but involving Lagos and Nigeria who, however we look at it, that's our big brother, our big sister, our big mother, our big father, and they are 300 million population. Mm. Don't believe the population census. When they count people in Nigeria, nobody, nobody agrees to be counted. So I know there are more than 300 million Nigerians. Mm. Uh, population census doesn't say so, but the Nigerians themselves know there are more than 300 million. <laughs> so I want that market. And uh, the momentum and the inertia that the Nigerian artists have also achieved is incredible. The other thing that I'm doing, like Trigmatic said, I've been working with my friend Dwayne Wiggins, who is the founder of Tony, 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 to get a soundtrack onto the Wakanda film, the, wow. the second round. So wow. as for that one, this, what I'm saying is a manifestation or a prayer that we get there. Mm. But if we manage to get a song on the Wakanda soundtrack, Charlie, it is money, it is everything. Mm. You know, so music is, and if the film is big enough, the song becomes big by default. The song can help the film come big, but like Drake said, it's, it's, a mut it's mutually beneficial. You know, so it's, uh, so yes, I am, uh, I am committed very much myself to uh, this creating music for film, um, as well as creating a film for music and vice versa. I mean, I think it's, I, to me, I think it's two sides of the same coin. Um, I remember when I was growing up, if you went to watch a movie in Palladium, just before the film starts, you see these people coming in, they are carrying gumi and pan logo drums on their head bells, and they come and set up on the side of the stage, and they play jama throughout the whole movie. <laughs> but because they've watched the film, they know when the action goes slow, they know when a fight is coming, so the music is going kudum, ah, that means you know Kela is coming, you know. <clears throat> so there were times, and these were some of the Indian films and Chinese films, because we didn't understand the dialogue, ah. and the music didn't connect with us. 
So we might as well be listening to Jama, which is giving us the mood of the music. Wow. And those people, they came inside the cinema free every single day. I mean, it's, they were part of the performance, you know, and it's so, and we think of silent films. With some of the early silent films, there was somebody in the theater playing an organ or a piano, you know, so moving images without sound, to me, is, is, is it can never be complete. The two belong together. And we need to work and help each other to reach the goals that I think, you know, it's about time we reach. Wonderful. And that note, we wrap up this session. A round of applause for Panjianov, Trigmatic, and Sadiq. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this panel, Music and Synergy. Uh, we'll wrap up with one of the movies. I thought we'd show The Traveler. The Traveler, it's a short film. Um by Peter Sedufia as well. Love is a long journey. You determine your own speed. Overtaking is permitted. staring at me and strangely too you can call me a traveler okay I am the traveler this is my living I meet same people same lifestyle every day I am a busy guy I've given up many unsuccessful relationships for a passion I play good music to entertain the affluent far and near. I swore never to fall in love again, but with my music. Wait a minute. Well, that's what I thought until this moment. A moment that I see someone I'd love to spend the rest of my life with. Happily ever after. Okay, maybe not this way. I like you. 
I want us to be friends. I want us to test how far we can go together. You know, I want us to travel into the future as far as we can go. Finally, I have a reason to smile after a long wait in fear. So, the wait began. I waited. And I waited. Unweighted. Unweighted. And weighted. told me it is a bad idea to wait for mystery girls. It is like waiting for a ship at the airport. They will never show up. Today I remember him. He said they always want to remain an imagination. I guess he was right.
<laughs> Moral of the story, be more specific. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. That was a beautiful one by Peter Ogna. A round of applause for him, please. And just like the traveler, we're on a journey, and that journey is getting closer to its destination. At this point, um, we're going to have a discussion, our last panel discussion with the men and women who tirelessly and work effortlessly to bring us some of the big projects we see on our screens and how COVID-19 has impacted their lives. But before that, of course, um, we would like to invite the CEO of one of the best production TV movie production houses that my nation was introduced to. Mr. Ivan Kwashiga for a presentation, a quick presentation, please. A round of applause. Perhaps as you're coming, sir, I can pitch my reason to be in your next movie. I think I should be pitching to you <laughs> so you come into my movies, awesome. Awesome. right? Okay. Well, um, I'm just here to share a little experience I, I made during the time of the COVID, and then it came out into something, and I wanted to share with you quickly. Um, maybe the next slide. Have a pointer, so I'll, I'll have to be okay. So, the I mean, we are all conversant with this uh, African proverb until the lion tells his story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter, and then we also understand. So, I will just go quickly to the next one. Well, the question has always been we are looking for funding, and I think that um, the deputy minister also mentioned some funds that was going to be put aside for us. And I've always been look, saying that what we need is an enabling environment. Because when you have a situation of some fund uh, uh, somewhere, then the Ghanaian or these uh, negative things start happening, whom you know, how you can access the fund, and then the films that must access the funds don't get to access the funds. And then in a short while, then the funds collapse. And then that's the end of the story. But when we have an environment that can enable every filmmaker who is determined to make it, get into it and do something with the environment that has been created for them, we will be able to do a lot more with, with, with that than just uh, money into our pocket. So I've been looking at a situation where we have been talking about funding. And I was thinking that if we start looking at, so from funding to distribution, but it should rather be from distribution to funding. That if you know where you are going to distribute your film, how you will distribute it, what you envisage to get, it should be able to get you the funding that you need in order to make your film. And so I've been looking at, I mentioned it earlier on, we had about uh, 1.3 million Ghanaians, 1.3 billion Africans, 20, uh, and 60% of them are below 25 years. Let's go on. And in, in the diaspora, we have about 140 million people of African descent who are interested in uh, seeing what we do. Next. And then also mobile penetration is about 495 million in Africa. That is 46% of the population. And it's growing fast. It's gone. And then there are 39% of the population, roughly 4 in 10, have internet access. Okay, let's go on. The next slide. Well, so... Some years ago, I produced um, a youth series that was for the National Population Council. And uh, fortunately, we managed to produce five seasons. That is about uh, 65 episodes. And we were putting it on TV. The first 
stations that we placed it on, they took 20,000 CDs from us per week to, for airtime. And that was so much that we, we, we didn't really make anything. So it's like you go, you look for funding to make the film, and then you go and give whatever you have on it to the TV stations. And then you come home and watch it on TV and forget, uh, <laughs> forget about everything. You do understand? But then we made, it was, we made sure that the film was well done. So in the second season, the TV station was looking for us. So they, they slashed it to 10,000 per week, but still was still too much for us. Then by the third, fourth, and fifth uh, season, they started taking it for free. But that wasn't the story for every other filmmaker. Those of us here who try to produce TV series know what you go through, we go through when you produce, and then you want to put it on TV. You literally would have to pay them. And even if they want to commission you to produce for them, what they would give you cannot even pay a, a production assistant that is working on a, a good production. You know, so TV is not the area to go. But let's go on to the next slide. But what we noticed from that was that we now have the YouTube and we could place our content on YouTube and reach the young people that we were targeting. So we noticed during the COVID, when all our corporate works, all our corporate productions uh, ceased, we started looking at what we should do. And then we realized that each of our episodes on YouTube has been watched over a million times. A million times. So you can imagine if we put the 65 together, that would have given us about 65 million Ghana cities if each person was paying even one CD or two CDs to watch our episodes. That would have been huge for us to be able to produce more and more and more content. Okay, so we started looking at, but then YouTube, YouTube also gave us the, what they call the analytics. And we knew the age groups of the people that were watching from it. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. We also noticed, we also got to know the devices that those people were using to watch. So we knew who was what, uh, what they were watching, the age groups of the people. We knew that they were watching with mobile phones, this percentage, and a high percentage of them were watching on their mobile phones. Okay. And then let's go on. Then we also noticed where they were watching from, that the countries that they were watching. Even though Ghana, if you look at it, this is quite bled, but if you look at it closely, you see that Ghana is tops, but it's watched even as far as to Kazakhstan. Every part of the world is watching YOLO. Okay, and I think season three of YOLO was watched like 32 million times. So with all this uh, information, we realized that if we can find a way that for people to pay us to watch our content, we should be able to produce more, more films. That the problem we have is not that we cannot produce. It's not that we cannot write the scripts. It's not that we do not have the cameraman or the sound man. Or, it's not that we, we don't have anything. I remember those days I, I was doing some work in the north, and I heard of um, these tomato sellers who um, go for loans from some loan sharks. They, they go and farm. It's not that they are lazy. They farm. They had their, their harvest but they couldn't take their tomatoes to the market. So because of the loan sharks and the way they were threatening them, they just commit suicide. And this is what we have. It's not that we are lazy, but it's just that we do not have access to the distribution channels to enable us to make money from our sweat 
make money from the content that we will produce. So can we produce, can we develop something that can give us that connection to the end user so, and so the money can get to us? You send your film to the cinema houses, you literally would have to stand at the gates to count the number of people that would go in because at the end of the day, what they will show you would not uh, be commensurate with the number of people you would see in the hall. So there's a, a, a huge problem there. Okay, so the next, the, the next slide quickly, so I'll finish. So we, decide, we, we started looking at ourselves, Ghana. We have 40 million mobile phones. You see people walking around with two phones, three phones, and all of them are just sharing content, WhatsApp, online, you know, all these things. How can we harness this? But I, uh, as a company, Farmhouse Productions, we do quite a bit of corporate work. So for some years now, we've been producing the MTN uh, Apps Challenge. So we deal with app developers. And most of these guys are like 21 year old, 22 year old, 25 year old, in KNUSD, you know, some of them just lent it by themselves. But they were producing amazing stuff. So we have started approaching some of them. Can we do something that we can put our content on it and for people to pay? Apparently, there are even payment platforms in Ghana whereby uh, people can, you can open an account with them and then people can make payment to you on all by through all the mobile money channels like Momo, like Vodafone, like Airtel, all of them are harmonized on one platform. So we realized that we can do something. So we have uh, the population, we have mobile technology, we have internet access, and then we have young people, and these young people are eager to watch YOLO. And what we notice is that every time they were calling for YOLO season six. And being creative people, we can always create. Whilst we wait for USAID to give us funding to do the new YOLO, we can create another youth, youthful story that would engage them. So we wanted to test it. So we created something called Strike. Let's go on. So we created a Farmhouse Movies. And the Farmhouse Movies is just an app we created, which you can download right now on your iOS or uh, um, Google Play, uh, Play Store. Let's, let's go on. So when you download it, this is what you would see. You would see our uh, uh, first page. Then when you click on what you want to watch, it will ask you to pay to watch this episode. You pay via Momo or card. So if you are living outside Ghana, you can pay with a MasterCard or Visa card. And then the payment platforms will, will come. You can also pay with PayPal. Let's go on. But having done that, when we did it, the first, we launched it um, December 24th, 2020. And without any TV commercials, without any radio commercials, uh, billboards or anything, all we did was social media. Some of our cast members who were on YOLO, you know, almost all the cast members that worked on YOLO have huge followings on Instagram. So there are some with a million, some three million people and all that. So all they did was to carry our promos on these platforms for us. And I tell you, by the 30th of January, we had crossed, and at the, at the, at the time we launched, we were only on um, Android. We didn't get uh, permit, the permission to be on iOS. So we're only dealing with Android, but we had over 25,000 people within a month. And by that 31st of January, when we got the permission to be on iOS, it, it exploded by April to about 75,000. And then by the time we're, no, by February to about 75,000. By the time we're ending the season um, in March, we were going past 100,000 downloads, which showed to us quickly that we could, uh, we have a channel that we can reach our audiences and we can make money from it, you, you, you get it. Now, we felt that, okay, 
we cannot just put farmhouse uh, productions strike and that's it on on our app so is there a way that we can open it up for other filmmakers so that they can bring their content on monetize it and make money but the question has always been trust if i don't tell you how much if i don't make you see how much you are making you will not believe it when i tell you that this is how much your film is making so the next thing we did is to create a, a dashboard which when you bring your content to us we give to you as uh, you, we give you an access to so you are able to see on at every second every minute how much money your film is making you can even uh, pay yourself and immediately you see it register over there that you have paid and this is or you can ask your friends to do it so you can see and you put on the dashboard and you'll be looking and you see it register so even before you come to us you know how much you're making before you 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 if you want to be paid every two days you you get it if it's every one week you get it if it's a month you can be you can receive your money but the main thing is that you know how much you are making now i started with the numbers that we have 1.3 billion people in africa we have 30 million people in ghana 31 million now if we are able to come together as filmmakers and we use a platform like this and um, if you look at it your earnings today this week this month this year and the charges that are, you are supposed to pay and your earnings that you are accruing all that is clearly done to you given to you and you are using this we use a platform like this what will happen is that they say we cannot uh, develop uh, that it will take us in africa 200 years to match the rest of the world but i believe that with technology we can leapfrog and get to a, our destination within a very short time and i think in for us in the film industry this could be the platform i see tv uh, tv sets are now smart tv sets so people are able to hook their internet to their tv sets the next step for farmhouse movies is that we are going to and that is like in a month you would be able to see, watch our movies on your laptop and also on your tv sets so next slide so we end it quickly so this is what next slide please so this is the news that i wanted to share that we are not let's go to the next the next next slide okay ne okay so what i said is that also part of the dashboard you see the subscriptions up there so you have the name of the people that have paid their id payment id they are the film they've watched how many they've watched and all the details are there so once you pay immediately it generates over there and you can see it and you the content owner who has placed it on the platform can also immediately see because you have your password and you have the access to your dashboard. Next slide, please. So the way forward now is that we update the app with new features. It was just a rudimentary app we created with lots of problems and we were solving as we were going on because we were just trying something out. COVID had struck, we didn't know when it was going to end but we needed to make a living and we said why don't we try with technology and we did this now the next thing is to have a download in app please go back to that slide download in app to cut down the data usage these are feedback that we got from our people so once you download in app it you will be able to watch it anytime without having to use your data then we also want to enhance the uh, interface to enhance user experience then we also want to add more payment options so there are other banks like the echo bank which is a pan-african bank that is across other african countries want to see if they can aggregate payments from their countries like somebody can pay in naira and it can be accessed in cd in ghana 
and then somebody can pay in kwacha and you have it from zambia and it's in uh, cities in ghana if we can do that a film that is made and released today at silver beds and on the app can be watched across the world at the same time do you, you get what i mean uh -huh. so we want to have more payment and then also we want to add a subscription option the reason why we do not have a subscription option now is that if third parties bring their films there should be a, we should be able to give them part of their the subscription that will be accrued and we are finding a way around how we can do uh, do that in percentage terms so that you you we can know the number of people that have watched the film at a particular time let's say at the end of the month 100 people have watched and out of five films only three have been watched and we can generate this information for content owners so that they will trust the system and so that is why we, we what we are doing and then um, we, the last thing we want to do is to commission productions. There are lots of young people with fantastic stories that are out there. I saw it in the uh, presidential pitch series, and I know there are a lot more out there. The few that have come in the presidential series, about 100 of them, but there are thousands there wanting to work, wanting to find a way to put their craft to use. And I believe that if we give them the opportunity, they will be able to uh, make a great impact in our industry and i think this we created it for ourselves but i believe that it is something that the, the, the industry can can use to to change our story thank you very much thank you very much mr Kwashiga. amazing such a wonderful success story thank you mr Kwashiga. also moving on i would like to call on one of the groundbreaking channels that is making waves in Ghana, uh, the only channel de dedicated to Ghanaian content on DSTV, I'd like to invite Ken from Aquaba Magic. Please, a round of applause for him as he joins us. Aquaba Magic is mafia in me, but Vim Day. Aquaba Magic, welcome home. Stay out of my business. Oh, wow! Aquaba Magic is a DSTV owned local channel providing 100% Ghanaian content to Ghana and the rest of Africa. The channel sits on DSTV Channel 150 on the Compact Bouquet and it's soon to be launched on GoTV. Since its inception eight months ago, the channel has provided livelihoods for over 300 filmmakers, cast and crew combined in Ghana. Aquaba Magic is the only channel procuring solely Ghanaian content, creating jobs for the film industry in Ghana. Currently, our content mix includes Ghanaian series, Ghanaian feature films, Ghanaian music, Ghanaian talk shows, and Ghanaian documentaries. Here is a quick catch up of some of our content. Hello, good people. It's great to have you join us once again on the show. So if you're ready, join me. Let me do what I do best. It got to a time when you have to keep her boyfriend company till she comes. Yes, no. Let me just... Then everything unfolded and it made sense why she was willing to walk away. So you sense danger. Yes, sir. Why didn't you flee? He takes a loan without paying and then she's on me with another woman. And that is it. Stop. What are you doing here? Let me have my money, that's what I want! I get my money! A hint of drama to move you. I've come to take my family home. You want to keep going? <laughs> A scoop of laughter to soothe you. I'm Add some red hot reality to the list. It's my baby. He's just having fun. And you've got the perfect entertainment mix. I want that. I saw him with my own eyes. Oh, no, no. Whichever stars, genres, or sings stay your soul. 
We've got them all and so much more in our sizzling lineup of unmissable series on Aquaba Magic. Channel 150 on DSTV. And there is more that are currently in the works. Aquaba Magic is for us. It's our content. Together, let us support the channel and build our industry. When you get home today, upgrade your DSTV package to Compact. Tune in to Channel 150 and enjoy 100% Ghanaian content. Na ifi nifi. Thank you to the organizers, um, the NFA, which we are very supportive of. And then, um, before I begin, I want to say to our friends from the other side of the world, what it means is welcome home. Um, I'm going to be very brief, very, very brief. Um, I think the opportunity is just to share with you what Aquaba Magic is about and the offering and then what is coming up. So when we started, um, the channel launched in March. Um, so we are not even a year old. But what we realized is the demographics that watch TV is what is exhibited on screen. So we realized that between the ages of 21 to 46, based on research, consume the most content. So that is our prime target. And then we realized that most of, um, in fact, females are the content drivers. So we say we pay the bills, they determine what we watch. Agree? Good. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, lifestyle is very important factor when you are determining what content to produce, especially when you're in the business of film. So we realize that, look, our target customer is more careful with money. They like to be updated. And it's important that we show them what represents us as Ghanaians. And their media habits is what is exhibited on screen. 77% of them has access to internet every day. And this is to collaborate what my senior Uncle said, Uncle Ivan. And then 88% of them watch TV a week or more. So what are Ghanaians watching? Ghanaians are watching movies, realities, telenovelas, and drama series. Um, currently, I can proudly say Aquaba Magic is the only platform that shows 100% Ghanaian content. And, and I know there has been um, discussions on radio, continuous fights about bringing Indian telenovelas and Spanish telenovelas and translating them into a local language. So we want to change that narrative. So 100% Ghanaian content, and we launched the first Ghanaian telenovela, which shows every day. Our host is part of it. <laughs> And we are bringing up more. For us, it's very important. And it is going to lead into what I will leave you with. So this is Aquaba Magic's brand map. For us, the key driver is the mid to upper Ghanaian market. And our brand attributes are very authentically Ghanaian, vibrant, aspirational. And our content makes, as I did say earlier, is telenovela series, movies, lifestyle, music, and reality. And we are positioned to be the home of entertaining Ghanaian content. And obviously, DSTV is a pay TV company. But our unique selling point is tune in daily to watch the best of Ghanaian entertainment. And I'm going to leave you 
by this message. Very, very simple. Aquaba Magic represents a very unique opportunity for Ghanaian producers. I'm here to see a platform in Ghana which gives money out to producers. I'm here to see a platform, and I'll repeat, I'm here to see a platform that call producers and say, okay, come, let's have a discussion. What do you have? And then we will support you with the resources to produce content for us. So earlier on presentations stated how the Nigeria movie industry is supporting the GDP of Nigeria. I also want to add to that, that Nigeria's movie industry, Nollywood, is Nollywood because of our sister channel, African Magic. African Magic has been with us for almost 15 years. They have over seven platforms. We started with one. But it is very, very important that we make Aquaba Magic strong, push, and we patronize it so that the business can invest more, and then we can have our several channels. Already starts next month, we are dropping Aquaba Magic onto Go TV. So there's going to be a new Go TV package coming, and Aquaba Magic is going to sit on there. For us as industry players, I leave you with this simple message that we know, and I see some of the talent that has worked on African Mag uh, Aquaba Magic being cast and being crew. Our uncle Ivan is producing one of the series for us, and there is more that he's doing for us. There are several filmmakers that we've changed, and we want to change more and bring everybody on board. There are two ways that we do receive content, through commissioning and licensing. I'll talk about licensing. Licensing is where you have your content. It's for you. You bring it to us. We agree a few with you, and then we use it for a, a period of time. When we commission, we own. So usually a commission will give you resources. We pay for everything, and then you produce for us. Typical example is to having to hold and the day that we have on our screens. So my message is very simple. Aquaba Magic is for us. So please, let's leave here and all subscribe to Aquaba Magic, channel 150 on DSTV. Thank you. Thank you very much, my boss, Ken. <laughs> Ken from Aquaba Magic, everybody, one more time, please, as he takes his seat. We are going to try to move very quickly now. Also, um, one of the biggest production houses, again, in this country. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please, Sparrow Productions, Shelley from Paul Manser, and they have a video to show us. They're not here, they're not present, so we'll just watch this video quickly. Sparrow Station was literally a scramble for survival. Uh, let me explain. Between 2008 um, and 2014, we, we, we produced films and, and distributed them on DVDs and, and VCDs. Now, around the, around the, getting to the end of 2014, 2015, we noticed that there was, um, there was a tumble. The first experience was when I visited a shop in, in New York and realized that um, you know, most of the shops around you know, in that area were literally shutting down. Um, VCDs or DVDs were literally dwindling. People were not patronizing them as much as they used to. Um, this was when you know alarm bells started popping, and, and we, we realized that there was a complete shift in the way people were consuming, especially you know in the West. The DVDs were out, and the new king on the block was uh, was streaming. It was at the time that people began to recognize Netflix and and, and Iroko TV. We literally had to scramble to figure out a way to begin to distribute our our content. 
or else um, it was gonna die. <laughs> yeah, so that's 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 that was the inception for it. Plus, the idea of being able to to create you know content and, and and make it available for for people you know all over the world because the VCDs were not going everywhere around the world, um, and people kept asking to be able to see to see to see our content. So Sparrow Station came out of out of uh, of that problem. Sparrow Station's target market is the the discerning Ghanaian, the discerning African from from all across the world, who who is interested in watching good quality African storytelling. Um, it, it 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 was it was designed to be able to reach pretty much all these types of people from from all corners of the world, and and, and I must say it's it's doing exactly that. Um, our audience, interestingly, uh, a majority of our audience is based in the US, Canada, um, the UK, followed by Ghana, um, Nigeria, and then scattered around, you know, all other parts of, of Africa and, and the world. Ah, I must, I must mention also the, um, the Caribbean. These are where our core audience um, exists. Um, and the kinds of feedback we get from them, this literally indicates that we're, we are communicating or we are targeting the exact type of people that um, we, 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 we create our content for. People who, um, people who want a beautifully well-packaged um, African story. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we've, we've, we've had this question asked severally. Sparrow Station is definitely opened for other filmmakers, other content um, producers. However, um, to be able to maintain the to maintain our brand and to be able to maintain the quality of content that we, that exists on our platform, we we plan on collaborating with other filmmakers, other directors, other producers to create content for the platform. Um, we're not opening it up in a manner where um, we're licensing content. No, we are we're going to collaborate with other filmmakers to produce content for the platform. Um, it's it's tricky, you know, because if 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 you look at the model of um, some of the, the 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 big streaming platforms like uh, like Disney Plus, Apple. Amazon, Netflix, they all have different models. And, and what we are going with is more of a collaborative model um, rather than a licensing model. So everything that you see on the platform is a Sparrow original. Um, and that could literally mean we're working with another director to produce a Sparrow, a Sparrow original. So that's that's where we're going, and that's been the plan. And um, we're actually looking forward to to launching this as soon as as soon as possible. We've spoken with a couple of directors that we'll be we'll be working with, and once that happens, we'll be able to to unearth new 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 talent and new directors um, um, through this platform. So we're we're pretty excited about it. But yeah, it is it is open in this in this format. So how, how do we feel the Sparrow Station is going to impact the Ghanaian industry at large? Well, let me start by saying that um, the Sparrow brand is all about good quality. It's all about premium storytelling. It's all about taking Ghana um, and um, the Ghanaian story, African story, and packaging it well and presenting it. Now, we, we feel that if we're able to get things right with Sparrow Station, then we'll literally be opening the doors to, to, to new filmmakers, to up and coming filmmakers, who we can groom um, and work with to create content that the world can see. And um, once this continues to happen, we literally will be impacting our, our industry. In fact, we'll probably set the tone for, for others to follow in terms of of, of you know of raising the bar and um, and creating good quality you know premium content that's where it needs to go we're, we're not about um, 
you know, about creating anything mediocre. We're about telling, you know, the right kind of stories. If we're telling a, a story about people in, um, and let's just take a story about people in the rural areas, right, for instance, it doesn't have to look low quality. It has to look premium. It has to be packaged well. It has to look good. Um, and the story has to be relevant. So, uh, this, 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 this is the opportunity that Spiral Station is literally uh, providing for us. And, and, and sooner or later, I believe that it will, together, it will impact, it will impact the industry. If once all the pieces come together, yeah. A round of applause, please. Ken Ato, uh, one of the executives and creative lead at Spiral. Uh, productions. So please do well to download the Sparrow Station app and enjoy good Ghanaian content. Uh, moving on quickly, uh, we are going to fly at this point in time and I'd like to invite for our very, very final panel discussion, I'd like to invite a man that I'm not fit to call my colleague um, to join me here. Growing up, we, called him, we call him the Ghana man, David Donto. Mr. David Donto, please. A round of applause for Mr. David Donto. A veteran actor and still going. <laughs> Mr. Donto, good evening, sir. Welcome. Uh, i also like to take this opportunity to invite a fine actress all the way from South Africa, also joining us from the, this discussion, uh, Angel Poe. Please, Angel Poe. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, James Abwaji, who is president of the Film Producers Association of Ghana, Five pack, please, for James Abwaje. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to take only 15 minutes of your time. 15, we are going to go as fast as possible. And gentlemen, uh, gentlemen and lady, welcome. We are basically going to talk about how COVID-19 has impacted us as creatives, um, how we manage to stay afloat and... Um, what best we can do to overcome it uh, moving forward. So <laughs> they say ladies first. Well, yes, definitely ladies first. So okay. I'll start with you, Angel Poe, all the way from South Africa, Aquaba. Thank you. It means Even, welcome, right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Even though this is your home too, yeah, I must great. say. Uh, all the way from South Africa, how would you say COVID-19 has affected you, impacted you, uh, you know, during the lockdown in South Africa and all that? All right, thank you. Well, you know, with regards to COVID-19, as an actress, um, on set, it takes longer to shoot different scenes uh, because we can't have too many people on set, and so that takes a long time. Um, with regards to work, there is so much competition now mm. because um, it's unfortunate that most of the production houses uh, well, that's what I've seen on, on, on our side of South Africa. You have to have a certain number of followers and all of that. Um, however, it's, it's, you know, if you balance your, your acting with a job or something else on the side, it, 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 helps, it helps a lot. So, yeah. And you were able to do that successfully? Absolutely. Absolutely. I know you're into banking and all that too. So, uh, and you, Uncle David, um, how has this, how's Corona, sorry. <clears throat> How has COVID-19 affected you? A lot. COVID has been devastating. People have died. But uh, I would be surprised if we, as people in the creative domain, are not able to go around COVID and put something out there to defeat it. Mm. Because um, this is not the first time we are seeing a flu um, I came to meet people without noses. And uh, that was after the Second World War when, you know, those uh, things happened. You hold your nose to blow your nose, and when you do this, your nose comes with it. And so I came to see those people, and we have passed through that era. So COVID, yes, is killing people. All flus kill people. Mm -hmm. But as creative people, we are always those who create new ways around the problems mm. that comes the way of human beings. So for me, yes, 
COVID has been quite devastating, but I know that give the next three, five years, it will be behind us. And we as leaders in the creative domain should be able to um, do things that will let people quickly forget COVID and even add on, because yes, it's been devastating. That is the bad side of COVID, but we should always look at the bright side of life. Absolutely. COVID has actually brought us a certain level of scope, as in how people can access material, how people can access content, as we say. Now, that is where the problem lies for us you know, creatives, mm. creating the content. Mm. Now, what is the content? The content is material that you have created out of your creative mind. There is the science of creativity that tells us that whatever you want to create, it should not be limited because it comes as an idea and you have to capture it as a script. So everything starts from the script and the script is coming from someone's mind. So we should be able to use this you know, advantage that we have as human beings to be able to create things around the COVID such that there will come a time we would say that, oh, COVID came, but even with COVID, we had A, B, C, D in addition to Absolutely. people watching whatever we, we, we will produce. Absolutely. So for me, I think, um, yes, COVID has been devastating, but we have been able to, or we will be able to go around it. Absolutely. That's great. Wonderful. And still staying on the actors, before I come to you, Mr. Baje, mm -hmm. um, uh, everybody has a lockdown story. I say <laughs> mine is a love story. I'm not sure everybody can say that for themselves. <laughs> but um, a, a, a very influential woman told me, a true artist, uh, love to be in solitary confinement. And so perhaps as actors, during this lockdown period, during the lockdown period, perhaps uh, you had a chance to brood, like you were saying, to create stuff. So COVID may not necessarily have impacted us all negatively. There are positive sides, and if you could share briefly what the positive sides uh, are for you, um, Angel. Oh, okay. Um, you know, um, I'll take it to the digital platform. Great. Right? Um, it doesn't take a lot for you to put your content out there. Um, for you to be a creative, you just need your phone and the internet, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to showcase your work. Like we do, um, uh, for an example, uh, short films you, that you, like, your, like how he said, you can be able to create something and put it on different platforms. You know, so if you don't, if you're not hired to do something, you can do something else while you, and that thing can help you to build yourself more. To, be for, to enable yourself to be ready for the next job that you get. Yeah. Thank you. And let me come to you now, Mr. Abwaji. I think one of the calls by the Film Producers Association of Ghana has been uh, distribution. It's one of the channels uh, we've been talking about all this while. We've seen Aquaba Magic make a presentation, Farmhouse, Sparrow Station. Would you say streaming giant, Netflix and the rest, or bringing it home, Sparrow Station, Farmhouse, Aquaba Magic are here to stay? Yeah, I think so, because the new challenge has brought new solutions. Mm. And uh, before I go on, let me say this. Looking into the future and what is happening, it is only the creative industry that can survive the test that technology is putting across. Mm. Because right now, there is artificial intelligence. Mm. If you're an accountant, your job is under threat. If you are a driver, your job is under threat. But it is only within the creative sector that can still secure the job that we create. Because I can't imagine any machine or software that can create content for human beings to watch, at least not in the next 20 years. So our jobs are secured. So we have to be serious and take our job uh, critically. Wonderful, wow. And, and perhaps my last question to all of you would be that given the effects of COVID-19, um, there's the need for us to constantly stay afloat and be a step ahead. What do you foresee as the next innovation in film? 
You see, uh, it has brought a challenge because the way we used to work has changed. Mm. And the only thing under the sun that is constant is change. So if you don't change, technology will change you. So now the te technology has come. As movie makers, do we stick to the traditional ways of distributing films? Do we stick to the traditional ways of doing our things? And the under answer is no. So we are changing now. The streaming platforms are here. Mm. Just like Ivan lamented, you take your content to TV, they charge you. Instead of paying you, they charge you. That is our situation here. But fortunately, the technology has made distribution very, very easier for us. We can join the farmhouse, we can join Sparrow. All what we have to do is to create the content and it will be there. And advertising on the social media doesn't take much. If you go to the traditional media to advertise, it's very expensive. Uh, advertising on the uh, uh, social media is tell a friend to tell a friend mm. and it will be there. Very soon, you realize you've reached over a million people. So I think the industry has to take advantage of the technology now. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mr. Baji. And You're perhaps welcome. your final words as well, um, Mr. David Donto and Angel. I'll start with you, Uncle David. Okay, thank um, you. I will still come back to content. We always say that you move from the known to the unknown. And that is where we have to start from. Ghana has a serious, large folklore diversity that is just lying there untouched. That we should use to tell stories, to do so many things. From the literary arts through the visual arts to the performing arts. Everything is there, is available for us, but we don't use. And that is where I would want us to look at. So that our stories that we write, our writers, maybe we have to build their capacities, but it has been seen across the world that all the places where film industry has grown, their storytelling tradition or the script writing tradition is very strong. Wonderful. India, China, Nigeria, US, Brazil, their storytelling tradition, the script writing tradition is very strong. You can't put a piece of Kobe on pizza. You must always make sure that whatever you're doing is coming from the background that you know, yes. so that you don't tell things. Of course, we imagine, but imagine the reality, okay? Ours is the imagined reality. So if you don't do that, I'm, I'm afraid whatever you put out there would not, would not last. And that is where I will still come back to, that is content. And the content must come from what we know into what we don't know. And once we do that, we will defeat anything that comes our way because you stand before you take a step that goes into the thousand mile journey. And where you are standing, that's where you know. Indeed. That's it. Indeed. Of <laughs> Thank Mr. You. And lastly, from you, Angel. Um, thanks to AFTA, or in the spirit of AFTA, now there's free trade, our borders are open. Perhaps a message from, for, for the young South Africans to come to Ghana and come and join us here to, you know, <laughs> collaborate and work together. Well, absolutely. I am availing myself to any project that, um, that is available. Um, South Africa is just next door, mm. it's, you know. And uh, my last words is, as, uh, as actors uh, or upcoming actors, is we need to always sharpen our, our, our swords, you know. We need to always make sure that we learn. You, cannot, you can never stop learning, you know, and engaging with the right people and knowing that you're in the industry for the right reasons and making sure that you protect your reputation wherever you go. Um, I mean, COVID-19 has, um, has changed a lot of things. Um, and right now, it's, it's about what is it that you want? Am I, am I ready for the next step? Am I ready for the next role? You know, um, with that being said, thank you very much. Am I ready for the next up? Are you ready for the next up? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you so much. Please, round of applause to my panel. Yes, Mr. David Donto, Angel Poe, and Mr. James Abwaji, the film, uh, president of the film, Produ yes. Producers Association of Ghana. Now, we will quickly, quickly call on Prop Haven. Prop Haven for a quick presentation. Prop Haven, are you here? 
Yeah, there they are. Please, a round of applause for Prop Haven. <laughs> Casting Africa, please be on standby. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, fantastic moderation to the moderators. I didn't get your name, but I know Antoine then. Um, all protocols respectfully observe. I'd like to say a big thank you first to the organizers for inviting Prop Haven to this wonderful forum. I've actually um, learned a lot. If you would permit me to say, just through all these discussions and all that, I think it's about time um, brands and market applications also do have a seat at Because indeed, if we're going to promote Ghana content, we do need a strong marketing strategy and plan as well. I bring you greetings all the way from um, our founder, the award-winning production designer and art director, um, Anthony Prince Thomas. He would have loved to be here, but he's out of the country at the moment on some business trips as well. My name is Selassie Tete. I'm the brand and marketing communications consultant for Prop Haven. I wear many hats, but in another world, I'm also the head of marketing for a famous um, petroleum company as well. And like I said, our founder um, found a problem in the creative industry where there was an issue of props and all that. So come 2018, he actually established um, Prop Haven, which caters to the creative industry, film, TV, and television as well to provide props for, for this industry. And then when you take a quick look at it, you see that our vision is to be the market industry um, leaders, to provide competitive pricing and also to sell the customers with great um, quality. I'm going to keep this very short and sweet because I know that we spent a lot of time. In the same way, when you come to Prophet Haven, in terms of what you would access, you would access, I don't know if you all have this. Do you all have this? Yes, I see that you all have this. So you would access a dynamic space, and we actually have a floor size of thousand square feet um, in terms of the floor space which is 16 feet in height when it comes to our control room our control room is about two, 216 square feet um, in terms of our green room we have a space of 96 um, square feet makeup is 16 it's eight square feet our changing room is um, 16 square feet you know during some of the presentations they said that the nigerians actually use um, their own cars we actually have driving access in these are studios which is for live events tv shows um, film productions as well and what are we here to solve we are here to solve the depth that we want to reduce the depth that is actually created in the art um, department when it comes to production and I, and i'm very excited to tell you that what we watch i was excited to see our guitar from the prop haven in the video as well i think we should give prop haven a round of applause and the, um, you know, during the discussions, they spoke about collaboration. They spoke about doing things together. I'm also very excited to say that we've done collaborations when it comes to music videos with Camido, Sako Dear, Kwame Eugene, even Tiwa Savage, um, Bernard Boy, and some others. When it comes to TV shows, we have the Vodafone um, Lifeline. Healthline, I see that Vodafone Business is one of the sponsors as well. We are also happy to have collaborated with FN Beam Bank on their show that says how to, how to help, how do we help you. And then with Chatterhouse Productions, we actually support Miss Malaika. We support Ghana Music Awards as well. In terms of Sadiq and his team, we also support the three music awards and then the three women's um, 
branch, awards um, women's branch as well. So I'm happy to say that we are in this industry to stay. We are the first of its kind. We are a Ghanaian-owned company. When it comes to challenges, some of our challenges has to do with, I mean, we are Spintex. That is not our facility, but we do have very high rents, although we are in a very good space, but it could be better if the government could actually give us like some tax breaks to allow the, the business, like starting business like ours, to grow and to also solve um, a part of the issue that has to do with unemployment so that we can actually bring in other hands as well. And um, one of the things that we also want to say as Prop um, Haven is that at Prop Haven, we have loyalty cards, so which will allow you discounts on as you keep coming to us to rent our props. Another thing that you must also know is that we are competitive when it comes to pricing and we don't only just think about props or do props we actually have solution oriented um, props for this industry which is a creative industry be it tv live events and um, television we have over 4,000 unique props we still have more that are still incoming so this is basically Prop Haven. We have a video and we would like to show you because videos indeed tell pictures. So our parting words as Prop Haven will be that we want you to just look behind you. You see our presidential setup. I'm excited to say that we did that. If you want to contact us, kindly call us on 055-833-1433. So that's 055-833-1433. Also have a website, um, it's www.prophaven. I'm going to mention the number again. So the number is 055-833-1433. Uh, our website is www.prophavengh.com. On, inst on Instagram, we are prophaven. GH. On Facebook, we are Prop Haven Ghana. On Twitter, we are Prop Haven underscore GH. And we will say that we are the one stop shop for all your props. And this is who we are as Prop Haven. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Prop Haven. A round of applause, beautiful as you're doing it. Thank you so much. Prop Haven, I watched a popular Hollywood movie and you could see that the actor was drinking from an empty cup. Clearly, it was an empty, there was nothing in it, and she was improvising. So thank you very much, Bob Haven. We look forward to working with you in the future. We're moving quickly now. Uh, Casting Africa. Casting Africa. Kwesi Bwesi Akwenchi, also solving a major problem in the sector. And here he comes for a brief presentation. Kwesi, a round of applause, please. I need to be on your website. I need to be there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, good evening. So, um, interesting forum today, and I want to say thank you to everyone and the NFA and the organizers of this fantastic forum. Uh, for me, it's very important that we keep deepening the conversation of how all of us as practitioners in the industry are going to help restructure, help... Um, repackage 
and represent the Ghana films to the world. So my name is Kwesibu Siakun Enchi. I am the CEO and co-founder at Casting Africa. So basically there are over four million on-screen talent in Africa. And 92% of this talent are going to give up on their dream of having a fulfilling, creative career in Africa. Now, we all know that it's true. Having a creative career or pursuing a creative career in the world is hard. We all know, we all agree, worldwide. However, pursuing a creative career in Africa is a nightmare. It's crazy. I once said that it would take not less than 10 years for a talent to really be seen and come to the limelight in Africa. That is how hard it is for talent, especially on-screen talent. And I know this because it was my story. Uh, back in 2008, I tried acting, you know, like my senior brother. Fast forward four years down the line, I gave up quickly. And <laughs> I joined the off-screen talent because it was not looking good. Because back in 2008, if you were, if you were not John Dumelo or Jackie, nobody saw you, right? And that is why if you look at the current crop of celebrities or stars as we call them, and the burden stars who are coming up like my, my, my brother and Anthony and co, the gap is so wide because there was no intentional plan to develop our talent sector of the industry. And hence why we see that. So for us, we want to work with people like Quinn, who is a burden actress looking for more opportunities to showcase what she is made of. And also people like Joel, who is a casting director, who is looking for talent or new faces for their project. So for us, at Casting Africa, we are focused on helping newbies and rising talent, connecting them to content creators. We saw this as a challenge because we realized content creators wasted a lot of time and energy in finding new faces. I'm a casting director. I've been in the industry for the past 13 years. I've done producing, writing, acting, everything. For the last three years, I have worked as a casting director connecting African talent to both local and global uh, content, content creators. And this is, this is one of their biggest challenge. It's so much time wasting. As a casting director, sometimes I sit down for maybe three days, four days, running a, a auditions. And the people who will come to my office, 90% of them have no business being there and waste my time, my energy, and my resources. And in that way, most of the talent that come through are very green. They are underdeveloped. And content creators, let's, let's all agree, it is one, one of the greatest nightmare to have a, an actor on set who doesn't know jack about what he's doing. No content creator wants to waste their time with undeveloped talent. And so they won't even do it at all. And by so doing, we are creating a, a huge lack of equal job opportunities in the ecosystem, and we are not building uh, the, the talent sector. And so for us, we are using technology to pioneer the new age of creative recruitment in um, the African industry. And our goal is to create equal job opportunities for these talent and also grant content creators a diverse pool of talent which they can simply sit in the comfort of their offices and with just a click and scroll, they can find the perfect cast for their film project. For us as a company, we are focused on talent discovery, talent development, and talent delivery. So we have created our platform, which is Casting Africa, www.casting.africa, which is enabled, and this allows talent to create professional profiles which would have their photos, videos, filmography, biography, and content creators can easily sit at the comfort of their offices and just browse this talent. Now, we are looking to provide access, access for the talent to get job opportunities, access for the content creator to get a wider pool of um, talent, and for us, we want to
be a key part of the growth development of the next batch of stars for the African film industry. We want to help develop and grow the talent market. Now, our product is very simple to use. For a talent like Queen, she just needs to go onto our website and just sign up, create her profile, upload it with her headshots, fill, you know, all the information she needs to fill, attach her resume and all of that. She can browse jobs on the platform and also apply for jobs. Content creators, content creators can simply also post their, their jobs on our platform. Actors, models, dancers, and influencers can apply for these jobs, and then they can sit at the comfort of their um, offices and just select any of the actors or the application that they have received. Next slide. So, we recently launched our launch board, which is doing fantastic. Our actors can ap apply for jobs directly. Um, then we are going to be launching our um, Android and iOS version early January, and we are so excited about the new functionalities that we are, we are bringing up. Um, and we can't wait to the world. Next slide. Now, we are a team of very young, passionate, pioneer, mind, minded guys. We, we, we are a set of amazing team members. I am the lead creative. These two, two, two of my co-founders are all tech guys who are spending day and night trying to build Africa's largest casting uh, portal, which en would enable the content creator find talent easily going forward. For us at Casting Africa, all we want to do is just create that access and make sure that we don't see that gap that has been created so far in our industry. And the only way we can do that is by simply creating that platform that allows the content creator and the talent to meet. And that is what Casting Africa stands to do. We say that pursuing a creative career in Africa is a nightmare, but with Casting Africa, it doesn't have to be. It is possible for the talent or for the on-screen talent to pursue a fulfilling creative career in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Casting Africa. Kwesi Boisiakwentri, thank you so much for that presentation. We don't have to wait 10 years again. Thank you so much, Kwesi. Um, and one of those uh, doing well in contributing to this sector are uh, the film festivals. And then briefly, we're going to have a quick presentation from the Accra Indie Film Festival guys. Evan Egan, please join us here. A round of applause for him. Briefly, Evan Egan. And then finally, we'll have the Black Star International Film Festival guys wrapping everything up for us. Thank you. And it is my time. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to be pretty quick. My name is Evan, and I'm the executive director for Accra Indie Film Fest. Um, Accra Indie Film Fest is an annual international short film fest here in Ghana. And um, we can proudly say that we're one of the top film festivals in the world, pioneering the uh, short, short film. Um, part of the filmmaking process, we uh, we established to reiterate the need for for short film, especially in the growth of the Ghana film industry. As part of the festival, we do have an award scheme that celebrates young, amazing uh, short film makers. Um, we we'll go to the next one. Okay, so um, our vision statement is to be the leading festival starting from Africa and hopefully we will take over the world. Uh, we'll go to the next one. Uh, we plan to do this through, through I'm waiting. Okay, so we, we do that by encouraging the production of short films. We look forward to creating funding opportunities for outstanding filmmakers. Um, we still keep on with the conversation of, 
of um, um, letting the Ghana film industry understand that at this point in time, uh, the major focus we need for the growth of the Ghana film industry is concentration on the production of short films. Um, also, we award, um, like I said earlier, let's move on to the next one. So someone will ask why do we concentrate on, on or what is a short film or what qualifies a film to be a short film. According to AIF and Oscars, a short film uh, is any film that has 40 minutes. So for you to qualify to be part of AIF, your film should be 40 minutes and below. Um, the, another reason why we feel it's so important for us to concentrate on the production of short film is that short film in, in somewhere around 2000, we had about um, th thousand production of short films globally, and it keeps growing that in 2021, we are gearing towards um, 10,000 plus production of short films globally. And then the reason why we all need part of the short film production is because Hello, can we go to the next one? It's because it's a great starting point for feature films. We're here complaining about the fact that we are unable to produce a lot of, uh, of feature films. But then, for, um, as a young filmmaker, we believe that if you do not have the funding to be able to produce um, a feature film, you can go by producing a short film. And a typical example is Whiplash by Damien Chazelle in 2013, where uh, he developed Whiplash, the full feature. He couldn't produce it. I think he took about 15 pages, made about 18 minutes short film out of the Whiplash, and then he was able to get funding to produce the feature film that won about three awards at the Oscars, and then in the following two years, went ahead to uh, produce La La Land, that was also um, a, a global hit. Again, another reason why we need to concentrate on the production of short film is because it gives enough space for young filmmakers to thrive. Also, um, it's, it's very cheap to produce. I can barely, or I can, I can actually use my phone or like some DSLR to just produce a short film of, of a great quality and storytelling, and you don't have to bring the whole world down to be able to make the film possible. It also provides an avenue where um, emerging filmmakers can explore to find the identity and the kind of stories that it would be great for them to tell. Um, maybe it's, 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 it will be too much of money for you to spend to say, okay, you want to test yourself on the genre that you feel is better for you to do. So with short films, you have that avenue to be able to uh, explore all of these avenues and be, be aware you are good at comedy, or you were good at drama, or you were good at horror films, and all of that. Um, I think it was left for one more. Can we go back? Sorry. Yes. Okay, and also, it's easy for you to manage the people technically, because um, the cast and crew is minimal, and then it, it gives you that enough space for you to just maneuver your way throughout. Um, so, so far, Accra in Different Fest has been in this space for the past uh, three years since our maiden edition in 2019. Uh, we've run three editions, 2019, 2020, which COVID was everywhere, but we still managed to be one of the film festivals in the world that COVID-19 could not stop us. Um, Hello, let's move on, let's move on, let's move on. So we can finish quicker. Okay, so out of the, uh, for the past three editions, we've been able to select, we've, we have received um, 5,061 short films from 168 countries. We've selected 145 short films representing 76 countries. Out of the 145 selected films, we have 38 of them to be Ghanaian short films. So we can tell um, the kind of opportunity or the platform we've created for young filmmakers in Ghana to thrive. Um, some of the countries that have been part of the um, Accra Indie Film Fest, 
for the past three years is Ghana, US, France, Germany, um, Canada, Nigeria, uh, Uganda, South Africa, a lot of countries that have been part of uh, the festival, even for the third. Um, uh, um, one of the amazing things we did as part of this year's edition was for us to create um, a special category or a special honorary award for some of our legend filmmakers. And um, this year, Mr. Kwao Ansa was the honoree uh, for AIF, and we're looking forward to be doing more for the subsequent years. Um, let's move on. Um, we've had about eight sessions for industry conversations, like this and more. Uh, th as part of this year's edition, we had a, an open air cinema experience where everything was put outside. Um, we had a lot of young um, music, mu musical perf uh, performers performing as part of the festival. And so far in our third uh, editions, we have awarded 27 young filmmakers as part of the festival. Um, we did something special this year that we have not done before as part of the festival, and it is called AIF Film Art. AIF, AIF Film Art is an incubation program uh, that trains young filmmakers and then challenge them to make a film within a specific period of time. What happened this year uh, was that we selected five young filmmakers. We took them through um, five days of rigorous training facilitated by amazing filmmakers in Ghana, including Mr. Kwabena uh, Mr. Kwabena Jansan, um, Amaki Abibrese, Jay Wales, um, William Agbiti, a whole lot of them. And then we ended the um, incubation program with uh, a production of short film within 48 hours. So they went through the process within the five days, and after the five days, they were given 48 hours to write, shoot, edit, and deliver within 48 hours. And they made an awesome film. Um, uh, next one. Um, so we're looking at how uh, AIF is going to be in the next edition, of which we have already opened uh, for films to be submitted to the festival. Uh, it's open on the, on the 4th of October last month, and films are still coming through. We have special discount, as always, for Ghanaian filmmakers to submit for free. So if you are a Ghanaian filmmaker here and you want to submit to AIF um, 2022 for free, uh, you can call the office line that I'll make it, uh, I'll make it available uh, to request for your waiver code so that you can submit to be part of the next edition of the festival. It's not automatic though. Um, uh, next year is going to be uh, another next level of the incubation program where we're looking at selecting 10 young filmmakers. Uh, there's something special hidden beneath it that we cannot mention now promise you that it's going to be more exciting. Um, we're going to have uh, film workshops, open air cinema experience again, uh, AIF awards, and so much more. Next, next. Okay, so we're still going to maintain our honorary award uh, celebration, but this time with a special touch of mini docu. So, um, yeah, we should look forward to that as well. Uh, we're going to have more of industry conversations, musical performances, parties all over uh, for, for the next edition of the festival. Um, next, next, next. Yeah, okay, so um, just a few things that I've mentioned already is just a tip of what we look forward uh, to doing. So we're looking forward to uh, sponsorship, partnership, opportunities, and every, uh, every way possible to uh, make the festival look as awesome as it could. So our office is, is always opened uh, for further conversations regarding partnership and sponsorship. And uh, we look forward to um, being able to create the impact that we look forward to creating for the young, imaging, um, and independent film, filmmakers in Ghana especially, and beyond as well. Um, so yes, uh, this brings us to the end of the presentation, but we also do have a video that I would like to share uh, with you guys. So if it is ready,
can we have the video play? Don't tell me you can't find it. It's a short video about the Akwaini Film Festival. Very short. You can find it. You can find it. The Akwaini Film Fest started with a small yet important dream, which was to provide support for independent filmmakers in Ghana, West Africa, and beyond. We felt that independents who produced short films were often overlooked and not given so that our people will be educated as to what we can do with a tool called the audiovisual media to emancipate our minds and move us out of the gutters because Africa deserves better. We've played such an important role in the making of this world. And I want to believe that we're going to rise again, if only we take the audiovisual media very seriously. It is important. So soon the festival has come to a closing, and I want to say congratulations to all the award-winning filmmakers and also the, um, all the filmmakers that submitted their films to be part of the festival. It's been an incredible five days and I have been excited throughout the process and I want to say a very big thank you once again. Uh, we'll be here to celebrate your films and your project too. I would like you to, to just go on the set, go and tell your stories, create all the magic that you want to create and we'll be here again next year to celebrate you. On that note, thank you. Thank you, Accra in the Film Festival. Thank you so much, Evan Egan. And the last presentation definitely will come from the Black Star International Film Festival. Black Star International Film Festival. B-S-I-F-F. -F. Well, very well then. Well, all too soon, Antoine. We've come to the end of the Accra Global Accra Africa Globalized Investment <laughs> Summit, the Ghana Film Industry Showcase. Thank you, thank you so much. It's exciting to see some few people still seated beautifully. Thank you so much for coming. On behalf of the entire team at the National Film Authority, um, from AFTA, we'd like to say a big thank you. Thank you for your time. To all the guests who were here, our panel, thank you so much. We appreciate your coming. And we look forward, after all these presentations, we look forward to an exciting time. In the next 12 months, we see the film industry taking another step as we all envisage. Thank you so much. There's coffee. I understand there's coffee at the back. So if you'd like to take some coffee, it's late. So just have some coffee and then go home. Have a good night. We love you. Thank you.
We are leaving you with some of the films from the Accra Indie Film Festival and some of the shortlisted films from the Presidential Pitch series. So if you're interested, you can stay behind to enjoy some of these short films as well. Thank you. What from a magic book? The whole second day of the day. I'm not going to be able to Not because I'm going to be able But because I am damn good at receiving good bitches. I have vowed to protect my family. And preserve its legacy. At all costs. On any more good and one way to do that is to first bring down the most ruthless wanted man in my town. The plan is to shake off his tree, his business. So, okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah. 